Yo Atlas speaking and welcome to part 4 of what if I was reincarnated in Mashoka Tensei as Rudius Grey Rat. As always the playlist of the story is above and with that being said let the tale begin. Chapter 76 Ticking Clock Big Bro! Up! Up! Aisha giggled and then held out her hands to me. I smiled and lifted her up in my arms. You really like being carried, don't you Aisha? Aren't you scared that I'll drop you? Big bro, strong. Not scared. That's quite a bit of faith. It's hard to live up to such high expectations, you know? Is K. I trust. Aisha giggled and then nuzzled against my chest. I smiled wider. And then I realized someone was staring at me. My dad, giving me a blank stare. I shifted Aisha around to make her more comfortable and said, What, Dad? Jealous that Aisha likes me more? No. He slowly shook his head and said, I'm just still surprised at how many genius kids I have. Hmm. I nodded and looked at Aisha before bopping her nose. Little Aisha really is a smart little bean. Are you Aisha? No. Aisha squirmed and said, No poke nose. Bad big bro. I laughed and then took a look around. A bright and sunny morning, with clear blue skies and fluffy white clouds drifting past. Because of me using magic to have fun with Norn the other day, I was grounded even longer. Meaning that I had to find other ways to preoccupy myself. At first, I started delving into magic circle designs and potentially working out synergies between spells and seeing if I could make essentially a magic computer that powered itself with ambient mana. But that led to a dead end real quick since I didn't have any material that could draw mana into use for itself. And I couldn't manipulate it without using my own mana. Nobody would notice if I did. And it technically wasn't using my mana since I was just moving stuff by using mana resonance or whatever was letting me move external mana. Still needed to research that too and why it was a thing. But anyway, I would know. And considering how easily I was slipping up these days, I decided it was better not to risk it. Anyway, magic research was no good and I didn't feel like doing it anyway if I couldn't apply it right away. And since I passed off some ideas to Master Roxy the other day, she was out of the house all of the time and lost in her own magical research. Like that cute floating blob of steel following her around that she summoned while patrolling in the forest. Totally wasn't jealous at all. So, I thought about training with Dad. But that guy got a jump in abilities since he picked up Mage Sight and was busy experimenting on his own now that he could see his own mana. That, and Mama Lily was hogging Dad's time by insisting that she got training as well. By the time they finished, Dad was tired and just wanted to play with my cute sisters like we were doing right now. Pretty much everyone else was out of the house on various errands. Mom had her work at the clinic that she had been putting off for a while, Mama Lily needed to pick up groceries, and Master Roxy was playing around with the spirit that she had summoned the other day. Sylphie wasn't here today because her grandmother apparently showed up to visit and they were going to spend a few days to reconnect. I was pretty curious about it, actually. Since Sylphie was a half-elf and that good at magic, I wondered if it was genetic, or if my whole hypothesis about mana radiation was a thing and resulted in her being able to use magic like that. Still hoping mana radiation wasn't a thing, because that was a giant can of worms and a massive headache I didn't want to think about. But anyway, it was just me, Dad, and my baby sisters back at home. And since it was nice out, we were playing by Mom's tree instead of cooping ourselves up inside. Norn tugged Dad's shirt and then pointed at me. Papa. Up. Dad let out a bright smile and then swooped Norn up in the air. There you go, Norn Dash. Kaya. Norn screamed and then started squirming. No! Down! Down! Dad froze. Aisha giggled and said, Big sis scared. Norn quickly nodded her head and said, Scared down. With a stiff smile, Dad set Norn down. The moment he did, Norn dashed over to me and hugged my leg. Dad sighed and said, seems like my genius son is more interesting than this old man. 
I set Aisha down and then pulled Norn into a one-armed hug. After that, I looked at my dad and said, while that's probably true, it's more like you don't know how to be careful around children. But Aisha likes it when I spin her around. Dad looked at Aisha and said, don't you, Aisha? Aisha giggled and then ran over to him, holding out her arms. Spin! Duh, spin! Dad grinned and scooped her up, twirling her around. Aisha giggled even harder and let out happy screams. Norn trembled and hugged me tighter. Rue. No spin? I patted her head and said, Don't worry, Norn. I'll keep you safe from the spin monster too. Norn giggled and then looked up at me. Smiling shyly, she held out her arms and said, Rue hug? Of course. I smiled and then gently lifted her up, making sure to hold onto her carefully. Norn smiled and then turned around to look at Dad and Aisha, who were still spinning. I frowned and said, Dad, you do know that Mama Lily is going to be mad at you later, right? Dad slowly came to a stop, hugging Aisha to his chest. My youngest sister kept giggling, her cute crimson eyes moving from side to side, still stuck in spinning mode. Spin! Hee hee! She giggled again and then started swaying back and forth, almost like she was drunk. I sighed. Dad put on a proud smile and said, It's fine. As long as my cute daughter's happy, I can take any punishment. Right, Aisha? Yeah. Happy. See? I shook my head and then sat down, shifting Norn to sit on my lap. Seeing that, Dad walked over to sit beside me and set Aisha down on his lap too. And then she promptly started to tilt, her eyes still spinning. Whoops! Dad quickly caught her and leaned back. Just close your eyes and relax until things stop spinning, Aisha. K. Aisha closed her eyes and then leaned back against my dad, her body still subtly swaying. Dad made sure to keep a firm hold of her though so she didn't tip over. Seeing that, Norn's eyes widened and she looked up towards me. I patted her head and said, Relax. Your big brother's here to protect you from our reckless father. Dad pouted and said, I'm not that reckless. Besides, kids are tough, you know? A little spinning around along with scrapes and bruises won't do any harm. Well, I can see where Aisha gets her mischief from. Dad stuck out his tongue. I rolled my eyes and said, aren't you supposed to set a proper role model, Dad? Man. He started tidying Aisha's hair and said, it's fine. Both your moms are strict enough. I figured that I might as well be the cool and fun parent. He tickled Aisha and said, it's no good to be serious all the time. Right, Aishipu? Hee hee. Aisha giggled and then started squirming. Stop! No tickle. Dad laughed and then stopped, carefully hugging Aisha against him. After that, he put on a serious face and then looked at me. I'm surprised though. I didn't think that you and Norn would be so close. Hmm? I frowned and looked down at Norn. I don't think I'm particularly close with her though. Not more than Aisha, anyway. Right, Norn? Norn blinked and tilted her head, confused. Never mind. I smiled and patted her head. Don't worry about it, Norn. K. Rue. Dad pointed at me and said, See. That. You're really protective with Norn and not Aisha. Could it be, is my responsible son playing favorites? I rolled my eyes. I'm not playing favorites. It's just that Aisha can take care of herself. Right, Aisha? Aisha gave me a wide smile and nodded. Aisha smart. Big bro, trust me. See? Dad gave me a blank stare and said, Weren't you the one who got upset at getting expectations put on you for being a genius? Yep. And you're saying you don't need to worry about your smart baby sister because she's a genius? Hey now, I'm not like you. I'm not having unreasonable expectations that Aisha is a genius. She's just smarter than your average two-year-old and knows how to not get hurt. 
Dad nodded and said, That's true. When you were around her age, you somehow broke your leg and arm, after all. I felt my face heat up and said, That was an accident. I overestimated myself. Norn tugged on my shirt and said, Rui, hurt? It's fine, Norn. Nothing a little magic couldn't fix. Norn frowned but then nodded. Dad chuckled and said, Well, it's good that we have so many magic users around now, don't we? He ruffled Aisha's hair and said, A little gremlin like you's going to need it. Aren't you, Aisha? No! Bad duh. No mess hair. I laughed, watching Dad and Aisha mess around. The lazy and happy days continued to pass. Maybe since I had gone through a lot recently, my parents and Master Roxy left me alone while they went about their own things. They still kept me informed, of course. Being W didn't just disappear, even if he was being quiet. But for the most part, it settled into a routine where I spent my days like a kid would and just play games or read stories to my cute baby sisters. Master Roxy joined us every now and then to show off some new magic and her new spirit friend, who she still hadn't named yet. She also used the time to not so discreetly check to make sure I was letting my mana and body rest properly. Other than that though, she was cooped up in her room or roaming around doing research into summoning magic. Maybe I shouldn't have casually mentioned how space and time were interconnected and that you could probably use mana as a marker to bridge the gaps. Still, the fact that I wasn't seeing Master Roxy as often was helping me to pull my act together regarding my feelings towards her. Sylphie too. Since she was busy showing her grandmother around, she hadn't been around recently. Because of that distance, I was able to get a handle on sorting all of my emotions towards her. Which meant I needed to talk with her about it soon. That would be a conversation. But it would be fine. Right, Rudy? Right, me. Anyway, about a week passed. We were in the middle of spring, with blooming flowers and budding tree leaves. My mana was fully topped up. The minor aches and pains that I didn't even realize I had from straining my body fighting against Orsted were completely gone. As a result, I felt stronger than ever. Top of the world. Of course, I was still grounded from using mana or magic. But that was fine. To be fair, I had been on full tilt grind mode since I was born, so taking it easy for a while was good. It also meant that I was ready to tackle whatever curveball life or being W threw at me. It was morning, with a beautiful day outside. Birds were singing, flowers were blooming. On a day like this, I threw off my blanket and hopped out of bed. After that, I clapped my hands on my cheek and nodded. All right. No more procrastinating. I'd had my fun playing with Norn and Aisha. I was healed up. My mana was topped off. And I felt the best I'd ever felt. So there weren't any excuses anymore. Grabbing the gray scarf Mama Lily made for me and the one Master Roxy made for me, I walked out of my room. The house was quiet. My parents were still fast asleep, and it was too early for Norn and Aisha to be awake yet. Even so, I could hear the faint sounds of pages turning and a quill scratching across parchment. Master Roxy, taking meticulous notes as always. Hearing that, I walked over to her room and said, Master Roxy. I'm heading out to visit Sylphie. Silence. And then Master Roxy's groggy voice called out. Be careful. If something happens, send out a fireball. Master will come running right away. I'll be fine, master. But I'll be careful. Let my parents and my sisters know, okay? I'll be back by noon. Don't pull a Paul, Rudy. Master Roxy yawned and then said, Love you and stay safe. I felt a sharp barb in my heart at the casual way she said that. The way that a sister would say to her kid brother heading out for the day. I laughed to clear up that pain and then said, I will. Love you too. Master Roxy. See you later. With those words, I quickly ran out of the house. Gah. Stupid. Can't even blame hormones or anything since you're not in puberty. Nope, just you. 
saying I love you so easily back to Master Roxy. What are you going to say if she brings it up later to tease you, huh? I sighed and pulled my scarf up to hide my face. After that, I started my trek to Sylphie's house. She actually lived pretty far away from us on foot. We usually flew back super fast so it only took a few minutes, but it was still a decent chunk of time to walk over. Which meant it was just me, myself, and I. I wrapped my hands around the back of my head and looked up at the sky. Seven, no, almost eight years, huh? My birthday should be coming up soon in the summer. That meant it had been eight years since I was reborn in this world as Rudius Grey Rat. Eight years since I got my second chance at life. I haven't thought about it much, but I've changed quite a bit, haven't I? I had made peace with my past life. While I didn't know the exact circumstances of how I saw it, I knew that my parents and siblings in my former life would be fine. The regrets I had from then were cleared up too. Mostly. Making my parents proud. Taking care of my siblings. While I didn't have any older siblings in this life, I could at least make sure to not let down my cute baby sisters. Not only that, I felt like I had accomplished things. All the research into magic, making friends with Sylphie, keeping my family together through all the rough times. Even dealing with being W. There were still a lot of things up ahead, but like this. Yeah. I'm pretty satisfied. A sense of fulfillment I never experienced in my past life. Unconditional love from everyone around. A strong support network I could lean on and trust to have my back. And maybe even. I shook my head, ignoring the heat in my face from thinking of two girls. Gah. This is the problem with too much spare time. I needed to get busy again soon. Relaxing was good, but at this rate I'd turn into an old man who would just sit contentedly and watch life pass. That wasn't good. There were still dangers out there. The sense of urgency was gone since nothing had happened, but that made it more dangerous. I couldn't slack. While I had others I could depend on, if I wasn't careful, I would slide back to my old habits and leech off of them. No good definitely no good. I slapped my cheeks and then nodded. All right. Let's hurry up and go talk to Sylphie. After that conversation. Well, I didn't know how it would end up. But life should get a lot more fun. Maybe? Hopefully? Either way, things were going to change around here, and I couldn't wait. W.L., I could since I didn't know what to do really, but... Arg. Whatever. Let's just get this over with. I shook my head and then started sprinting. Maybe that would get rid of some of this nervous energy. A horse-drawn carriage, making its way from Roa to Bina village. Inside of it, Eris crossed her arms, scowling as she stared at the grassy plains passing by. I still don't understand it. That guy doesn't like me anyway, and he definitely doesn't like me after I hurt that elf girl, right? Why does Dad still want to send me to him? Dyslane shrugged and leaned against the side of the carriage. Whatever the case, on paper you are still engaged to Paul's kid. I've heard that those sorts of noble engagements are pretty important, so Master Philip might just be worried about how it will look for you if you aren't with him. <laughs> Eris uncrossed her arm and started fiddling with her sword. Well, I guess it's fine. You're sure that he's strong, Dyslane? With a sword. Decent. With magic, a monster. Dyslane frowned and rubbed the eye patch over her right eye. At that time, a good hearted laugh echoed from the front of the carriage. After that, the carriage driver turned back to look inside at Eris and Dyslane. He was a man with a monkey like face, wearing a fur vest and black trouser outfit that made him look more like a bandit than an adventurer. The appearance of someone who couldn't be trusted but the warm and amiable smile on his face softened that appearance. Careful now, Geislane. You don't want to cause a jinx. Geislane shook her head and said, You're still on about that sort of stuff, Jisu? The man, Jisu, laughed and said, A jinx is a jinx. You shouldn't take them lightly, you know? Like how everything always went right when you made decisions and wrong when you didn't. 
Dyslane's ear twitched and she said, Then are you saying this is going to end poorly because I would have chosen to stay in Roa with Eris? Jisoo turned back to look at the front and shrugged. Maybe, maybe not. He chuckled and said, If you're lucky, there might be some divine intervention to make things work, you know? Eris huffed and said, Stop talking about weird stuff I don't understand, monkey man. Jisoo laughed. Whatever you say, Red. My name is Eris. Jisoo paused and then turned around to look at Eris. Eris glared at him. What? Something funny? No. But talk about a major jinx. He shook his head and turned back to face the front. Having a name that means strife is about the worst jinx you could get. Eris started gnashing her teeth and reached for her sword. Eris. She paused and looked over at Geislane. Geislane shook her head and said, Do you remember what you promised? Eris leaned back in the carriage and crossed her arms. No violence. But he started it. She pointed at Jisoo and said, What am I supposed to do about idiots who run their mouths like that? Jisoo chuckled. An idiot, huh? Well, I suppose that's kind of true. Geislane shook her head and then looked at Eris. Listen closely, Eris. As an adventurer, you'll end up meeting all sorts of people. Like this gambler who likes swindling people of their money. She pointed at Jisoo. Rude! I always made more money than I took from you guys, you know? Eris frowned, but she focused on Geislane. So? So you'll need to learn to tolerate them. Especially people like Paul. You see, when I was your age. Chapter 77 What is Love? I came to a stop, slowly catching my breath. A simple log cabin house. Since it was early, Mr. Laws should be home. Or so I thought. But the usual bow that he kept by the window was gone, so it seemed like he left out for patrol early today. Maybe he wanted some time to think for himself before dealing with Dad? The few times I had seen Mr. Laws recently, he had looked pretty haggard. Almost like he had his world shattered. Well, not that serious. But it was the expression that was kind of like seeing your favorite anime get a live-action Netflow asterisk X adaptation and then ruining your childhood memories. Or something. It looked like Miss Rose was up, though. I could hear pots clattering, and there was the yummy scent of cooking stew in the air. Or maybe it was just meat. I wasn't too sure about these sorts of things. And I was procrastinating again. I adjusted my scarf and then closed my eyes to take a deep breath and calm down. This was important, Rudy. You can't just go and rush in. Don't be like Dad. Make sure to be calm and collected and... The front door slammed open and then a happy squeal echoed. Shortly after, a mature female voice spoke up, saying, Oh my lord. You are cute. Eh? Before I could process what was going on, someone ran forward and swept me in a tight hug, pressing my face against something soft. A familiar experience. It happened whenever mom got too excited and hugged me. Of course, it also meant that I was being smothered and couldn't breathe. Um, um, ph. Um, um. I tried squirming to get out of the woman's grasp. But as expected of someone who gave a hug to rival my mom's, she was surprisingly strong. Fortunately, it seemed like she didn't have as big of a chest as mom so I could manage to get a few breaths in by turning to the side instead of getting a face full of squishiness. But seriously, who was this? She seemed vaguely familiar for some reason, but... Grandma! No! Let go of Rudy! Sylphie's voice called out, and then I heard light footsteps rush over. At the same time, a gust of wind formed between me and the oppressive deadly assets, giving me some air. Light peals of laughter echoed, and then the tight grasp around me suddenly vanished, sending me flying back. I quickly righted myself, trying to steady my body. But feeling the wind pull me away, I decided to just go with the flow. Sure enough, I was swept away to gently land beside Sylphie who had come outside sometime between me getting smothered by the mysterious overly affectionate elf woman. I blinked and stared at the person who had been hugging me. 
She was pretty. Light blonde hair, crimson eyes, and cherry lips. Her skin was completely pristine too, without a single blemish or wrinkle. Paired with her revealing outfit, a light green blouse and two short skirt, she gave off lewd when each on vibes. Wait. This was Sylphie's grandma? I blinked again and tilted my head, still trying to come to terms with that fact. I mean, I got the fact that this was a fantasy JRPG type world a long time ago. Kind of hard not to what with magic and dad being able to do stupidly superhuman feats with just a stick. But this beautiful lady who could walk down the street and pick up literally any guy, was Sylphie's grandma? Wasn't Mr. Laws around dad's age? That would make him. 25 or something, right? Lowballing it. Oh. The lady was probably only around 40, so that made sense. I felt a sharp jab in my side. I blinked and turned to see Sylphie looking away, pouting. The elf woman. Sylphie's grandma raised her hand up to her mouth and laughed. She smirked and then said, My, my, Sylphie. Are you jealous that your grandma is going to steal your Rudy away from you? And no. Sylphie quickly shook her head and looked at me. When she did, her face turned red and she looked back at her grandma. But. You're being too clingy. Maybe you're trying to corrupt him with that demon god mana. I blinked and then said, I feel like I'm missing a lot of context here, Sylphie. Sylphie's grandma laughed and said, Don't mind her, sweetie. I think I've just been teasing her a bit too much these past few days. A deep sigh echoed from inside the house, shortly followed by Miss Rose's voice. Between you and what Paul has said, I would be surprised if Sylphie wasn't feeling a bit insecure. Honestly, trying to teach about that to a girl this young. Miss Rose stepped out of the house and then looked at me, smiling. It's nice to see you again, Rudy. How are Norn and Aisha? I smiled back and waved. They're doing fine, Miss Rose. Norn's actually been asking about you a bit. It seems like she misses you. Miss Rose smiled and said, Well then. I'll have to come visit soon. You should. But, um. I looked towards Sylphie's grandma and said, Who are you again? I'm Rudy, but I don't think we've met. She laughed and said, You look a lot like him, but you're pretty different, aren't you? But I suppose you haven't had as many life experiences, so it makes sense. And you're only half of him too. Miss Rose snorted and said, Thank Mealy's for that. If Rudy was anything more like his father, I'd be worried. Sylphie's grandma smiled and then walked over to me, stooping down to eye level. Smiling, she patted my head and said, My name's Rostalina, Rudy. But you can call me Mommy if you want. What? Miss Rose glared at Sylphie's grandma and said, No flirting with children. I'm not flirting, dear. But fine. I'll tone it down a bit. Rostalina laughed and then stood back up. After that, she smiled and said, Just call me Lena, Rudy. That's what your father and mother called me anyway. Huh? Mom and Dad know you? Rostalina laughed and said, Well now. It seems like Paul's number two, as always. But he did seem to like being on the bottom more than Dash. Ahem. Miss Rose cleared her throat and glared at Rostalina. Rostalina pouted and said, Fine, fine. Geez. No wonder Lazi is so uptight. And no wonder Sylphie's an only child. You seriously need to loosen up a bit more, Rosie. And mother-in-law needs to be more proper. Miss Rose sighed and then looked at me. In any case. She smiled and said, Are you here to take Luffy out to play, Rudy? She looked over at Sylphie and said, Luffy has been a bit lonely without you around, so that would cheer her up. Sylphie pouted just like Rostalina did and said, I haven't. Miss Rose gave Sylphie a blank stare and then turned to look at me. Her grandmother has also been a bad influence, so I would greatly appreciate you taking her away from here. Rostalina rolled her eyes. Come now, Rosie. We both know girls mature sooner than boys. Not to mention that having so much mana can speed up the process and dash. 
and I would greatly appreciate mother-in-law helping me cook this lovely meat pie so that we can have dinner together with the gray rats this evening. Fine, fine. Jeez. Rosalina shook her head and walked back inside the house. Making these old bones move around like this. Some daughter-in-law you are. If a beautiful woman like you can be considered a bag of bones, then every woman in the world has no meaning, mother-in-law. Rose sighed and followed Rostelina back into the house. Rostelina's laughter echoed from inside the house. Shortly after, she said, True. I am gorgeous. How did a woman like you produce my beloved and upright husband? Funny you mention that. Laza's father was Dash. The door slammed shut. And then it was just me and Sylphie standing outside. I turned to look at her and said, Uh, your grandmother is interesting? Sylphie let out a deep and exasperated sigh. Ignore her. Grandma is weird. Yeah. I can see that. Rostelina was definitely a lot different from both Mr. Laws and Sylphie. Though I could kind of understand how Mr. Laws grew up as an orphan if the vibe I was getting from Rostelina was correct. Then again, she seemed to know mom and dad. And dad specifically. Let's not open that can of worms. Sylphie smiled at me and said, So are we going out to play, Rudy? She laced her hands behind her back and moved to my right side. Are you finally not grounded from using magic? I laughed. No. I'm fine now, but I've been worrying everyone a lot too, so I think I'll delay that a bit longer. Hmm. If that's what you want. But it's okay to be a bit more selfish, you know? If Rudy wants to use magic, I'll come help you argue to be ungrounded. I smiled and then pulled Sylphie into a hug. Thank you, Sylphie. You're welcome. Her smile widened and she leaned into me. But then she broke away and spun, turning around to look at me. So what are we doing on this pretty day, Rudy? Tag? Treasure hunting? Um. We can. B but there's something I wanted to talk with you about today, Sylphie. Hmm? She tilted her head and looked at me. Is something wrong? She frowned and walked over, placing her hand over my forehead. Are you still sick? I felt my face heat up and stepped back. And no. Not at all. Just. Um. H how about we walk first? We can talk as we go. Sylphie frowned, staring into my eyes. But then she slowly nodded and said, Okay. But if you're pushing yourself again, I'm going to punish you. I laughed. Who do you think I am, Dad? Besides. I poked Sylphie's cheeks and said, My best friend's too nice to do anything mean to me, right? Sylphie's eyes widened and then she blushed, turning away. Rudy's the mean one. It's not fair to tease me like that. You know I can't hurt you. I laced my hands behind my neck and started walking. Right now, maybe. But in a few years, I'm pretty sure you'll give me a run for my money. Sylphie moved to my side and huffed. I was being sarcastic. It's sarcastic. And I think you're using that wrong. <laughs> Sylphie huffed again and then crossed her arms, walking beside me in silence. She looked angry with a frown on her face. But from the way she kept looking at me and the way her lips kept twitching up, she really wasn't. I smiled and then continued walking. A comfortable silence. A gentle spring breeze blew past, ruffling my scarf as well as Sylphie's light green hair. It was nice. As usual, spending time with Sylphie made me happy. Hearing her voice, seeing her smile. Just seeing her in general. And from how happy she looked, it seemed the same was true for her. But... Sylphie glanced over at me, suddenly catching my gaze. Her eyes, a beautiful crimson hue like glittering rubies. A pretty face that was sure to become a great beauty in the future. I wasn't like my dad who saw girls for their appearances first. Specifically two big appearances up top. But I couldn't deny the fact that Sylphie wasn't just pretty, but she was really pretty. Enough to where I was sure any person who saw her would look twice. That, 
paired with the fact that she always supported me and was such a big part of my life. Rudy? Sylphie tilted her head, frowning. Is something on my face? Only beauty I, I mean, no. Nothing's on your face. Damn it, Rudy. Stop it. No flirting. Bad. H huh. Sylphie's cheeks turned red and she started shifting in place. T thank you. Look. You made things awkward. I coughed and said, anyway. You um. W what do I say now? Come on, brain. Don't fail me here. You can calculate the complex integrations and transformations necessary to create three-dimensional models of 4D space, so figure out a way out of this mess. I coughed again and said, and nice weather we're having? At hashtag dollar at hashtag percent. Sylphie giggled and then nodded. It really is nice out. She covered her eyes with her hand and stared out into the distance. Phew! Crisis averted. Now to think about how to bring up that chat. Sylphie turned back to look at me, a bright and warm smile on her face. But every day with Rudy is nice. Our Rudy? You're not breathing. Did something happen again? I coughed. And no. I'm fine, Dash. You're coughing a lot, too. Did you get sick? She frowned and said, You haven't been staying up super late with Miss Roxy, have you? I know that you like magic research, but rest is important too. She lowered her gaze and said, I don't want to see Rudy sick again. But dump. Gah. Dead. Critical hit. I was not prepared for this. Is this why they emphasized EQ more recently before I died? Because no amount of studying prepared me for this direct feels attack. Holy crap. Rudy? I closed my eyes and held out my hand. H, hold on. I need a moment to gather my thoughts. Yeah. Um, okay? Sylphie sounded confused. But she stood still and waited. At least I think she stood still and waited. Couldn't see because eyes were covered in all. But that helped. Since it was dark, I could think things through. All right. Okay. So, definitely liked Sylphie. My heart's definitely pounding after all of that, and I definitely am completely scatterbrained right now because of how happy I'm feeling. No, no. That's just the burst of feel-good chemicals scattering your brain, Rudy. Serotonin, oxytocin, and dopamine. Remember, emotions are just a construct of the mind. Humans are rational machines that can overcome such feeble and fleeting phenomenon by. Gah, who am I kidding? This isn't working. I like Sylphie. I like Sylphie a lot. It was different than with Master Roxy. With Master Roxy, my heart definitely raced. And I definitely liked her too. I appreciated how kind she was in listening to me and how smart she was. I also enjoyed talking with her about magic and spending time together. But I always felt a bit uncomfortable with her. Mostly because we weren't equals. Master Roxy was Master Roxy. I liked her, maybe even loved her, but there was a distance there that I couldn't cross. But Sylphie. We started off as friends. No, I guess it was more like me swooping in to save her. But Sylphie wasn't a maiden in distress. At least, not after that. Picking up magic with ease. Chatting with me about various things and supporting me as much as I supported her. We were both alone and friendless, but we became each other's best friends. And we made each other better too. I was sure of it. If Sylphie wasn't here, I would have devolved into a person who did nothing but study magic. Who knows what kind of rabbit holes I would have delved into. But she was here. Sylphie, my supportive best friend who played games with me every day. Who invited me over a few times to read books together and just spend the day chatting. Who stood by my side when I was unconscious and then continued reassuring me even when I was terrified from being blind and the residual nightmares of whatever being W tried to do that time. Someone who I couldn't imagine life without. But someone who was still just a child. 
like me. It was still too early for this. We were both young, barely even eight years old. And while I knew my feelings for Sylphie wouldn't change, what about hers? Right now, the only person in her life around her age was me. Hell, the only guy around her age was me. She never met any other person. Not only that, but we were kids. Who was to say that she wouldn't fall in love with someone else in the future? At that time, could I let her go? Would I let her go? Or would I be clingy and try to hold onto her even when it made her unhappy? That. No. That was quitter talk. I liked Sylphie. No, like was too light of a word. I was sure. I love Sylphie. I was serious about it. I didn't know completely what love entailed, but I did know that I would regret it for the rest of my life if I didn't at least try to hold onto Sylphie. Not only that, but after all the effort and feelings she showed towards me. She probably didn't understand it yet. I didn't understand it yet. But I liked Sylphie. So. I opened my eyes, nodding. Sylphie stared at me. I turned serious and called out her name. Sylphie. She blinked and then slowly nodded. Yes, Rudy. I like you a lot. Do you like me? Yeah. Sylphie blinked. At hashtag dollar percent at. Why did you have to say it like that? Who the hell do you think you are, some being protagonist or something? Besides, does Sylphie even? Why yes. Sylphie's face lit up and she hugged me. I like Rudy too. I like Rudy a lot. More than anything in the world. Eh? Eh? Sylphie let out a bright smile and said, So. Rudy can't leave me behind for a mean girl like Eris, okay? I hugged Sylphie back and said, Of course, Sylphie. I promise. I won't ever leave you. Pinky promise. Sylphie stepped back and held out her pinky. If Rudy disappears, I won't forgive you. I'll fly to the ends of the world just to find you again. And. And I'll even become a demon lord if I need to. I laughed and wrapped my pinky around hers. That won't ever happen, Sylphie. But I promise. I won't leave you. Sylphie let out a warm smile. I smiled back. The two of us stood there for a while, just happy to be with each other. But then it started getting awkward. I coughed and said, as so. Damn it. It was that simple? No, Sylphie liked me that much already? Was I? Was I some dense shounen MC? Even Dad wasn't like this, right? No, he definitely wasn't. That guy was like a shark with blood in the water when it came to sensing women attracted to him. Definitely wasn't genetic then. Was it that? Smart people tended to overthink things and miss the little stuff, right? I didn't think I was that smart, but considering all the cues I missed. Damn. Maybe I was a genius after all. Because I sure as hell was as dumb as my dad was in other things when it came to girls. Sylphie giggled and then said, Let's hurry up, Rudy. Norn and Aisha probably missed their big brother, right? I'll fly us back. Oh. I nodded. That's probably a good idea. I held out my hand and said, Sorry to trouble you, Sil Dash. Before I could finish, a gust blew me off my feet. W O. Hold on, Dash. A pair of thin arms wrapped around me. Sylphie, holding me close. After that, she looked down at me with a bright smile and giggled. This time, it's my turn to be the hero. Just leave it to me, Rudy. I felt my face heat up and said, W wait a bit, Sylphie. See can I at least hug you properly instead of you holding me like Dash. Nope. I want to carry Rudy like a princess too. It's not fair being carried all the time. Be but Dash. We're going. Chapter 78, One of Those Days It was an embarrassing arrival back at home. Not because I was embarrassed by Sylphie carrying me. Okay, that was a lie. I was a little embarrassed at that. 
but she seemed really happy doing it and it was also nice being carried around. So I didn't mind that. No, what I was embarrassed at was my family's reaction. Apparently, since I left in a hurry that morning, Dad and Mom decided to wait a bit until I got back before heading out to work. Which meant that when we arrived, everyone was waiting outside to greet us. Which meant that everyone saw Sylphie carrying me like a princess while landing on the ground like a certain comic book character from KRYPT Asterisk Inn. Which meant that Dad teased the crap out of me, that Mom almost smothered me with a hug squealing how cute I was, and that Mama Lily teased me about secretly wanting to rely on someone else. Then there was the confusion that Norn and Aisha had about whether I was a hero or a princess. And Master Roxy trying her best to hold back her laughter. But anyway, we arrived back at my home. After that, Mom and Dad went to work and Master Roxy went on her usual patrol. That left me and Sylphie with Mama Lily and my two cute younger sisters. Since it was a beautiful day, we decided to go outside and enjoy the weather instead of cooping ourselves up inside. And like that, we made our way into the courtyard outside, with me taking the lead. Mostly to try and regain some dignity and composure. But before I could take two steps out the door, I felt a light tug on my shirt. Rue? Norn looked at me with her wide green eyes and then held out her arms. Up. I smiled and then lifted Norn into my arms. You really like being carried around, huh Norn? Norn just gave me a happy smile and then nuzzled against me. I shook my head and walked out of the house. Sylphie's giggles echoed from behind and she moved to my right side. As she did, she laced her hands around her back and smiled at me. I think Norn just likes her big brother. She looked at Norn and said, Don't you, Norn? Norn let out a bright smile and then nodded her head. Un! Love Rue! Gah! Baby sisters were dangerous weapons. Especially ones as cute as Norn and Aisha. Sylphie noticed my reaction and laughed. Poking my cheek, she said, Someone's happy. I felt my face heat up which meant that I was definitely blushing. But I kept cool and kept walking, ignoring Sylphie. But then Mama Lily laughed as well and walked over to my left side, leading Aisha along with her left hand. Looking at me, she said, it is fine for you to be more honest with your feelings, Rudy. Aisha nodded from Mama Lily's side and then leaned over to look at me. Yeah. Big bro happy, okay? I coughed and said, I it's a bit embarrassing, okay? And it is fine to be embarrassed, Rudy. Mama Lily smiled and said, you do not need to be perfect or strong all the time. I sighed and said, I know, I know. But it's hard to not want to show off for my cute sisters, you know? I smiled and then poked Norn's cheeks. She giggled and then nuzzled against me. Sylphie pouted and then leaned against me too. Seeing that, Mama Lily sighed and muttered, the future is going to be difficult. Huh? Nothing, Rudy. Mama Lily smiled and then walked over to a grassy part of the courtyard before sitting down. I walked over as well and then set Norn down. The moment I did, Aisha ran over and grabbed Norn's hand. Big sis. Play. P play? Yeah. Play. Cash me. Giggling, Aisha started running away. A.I. Two Faws. Norn tried to run after Aisha, but she stumbled and landed on the ground. Her eyes started to tear up and she started to sniff. I frowned and moved over to pick her up. But before I could, Aisha ran back and helped Norn up. Big sis hurt? Norn sniffed and rubbed her tears, nodding. Aisha patted Norn's head and nodded. K. Play paw cake. Pa cake? Norn blinked away her tears and tilted her head. Aisha nodded and then started clapping. Pa! Pa! Cake! She smiled and then held her hands out to Norn. Big sis, Pa! Norn looked confused and then hesitantly held out her hands. Pa! Pa! Aisha giggled and then clapped her hands to Norn's. Norn was still confused. 
But seeing Aisha giggling, Norn started to giggle too and then copied Aisha. Aisha looked over at Silphy and waved. Sithy! Play! Silphy smiled and walked over. What do you want me to do, Aisha? I watched Silphy playing with my younger sisters and smiled. Seeing that they were having fun together, I made my way over to Mama Lily and sat beside her. The moment I did, Mama Lily looked over and gave me a strange expression. A wistful smile that seemed almost like she didn't believe what she was seeing. I frowned and then shifted closer to her. Is something wrong, Mama Lily? No. She shook her head and then glanced over at Silphy and my sisters. I'm just grateful. Grateful? I frowned. For what? Well. Mama Lily pulled me into a one-armed hug and said, There are many reasons. But above all. She smiled at me and said, I'm happy that my Rudy is growing up alongside Aisha and Norn. I blinked and said, Well, of course. Why wouldn't I? Mama Lily paused and then shook her head, seeming confused. There's no real reason. I just felt a bit anxious. With you being unconscious for so long. Well. She smiled and said, It's in the past now. I leaned against Mama Lily and said, Don't worry. I'm not like Dad, you know? I won't cause any trouble any time soon. She laughed and then poked my cheeks. Of course. It's that adorable face of yours that's going to cause trouble in the future. H. Huh? I frowned and rubbed my face. I guess I do have a spooky appearance now. Since my hair had turned silver and my eyes were a bright green, I could be mistaken as a ghost. Or maybe even a member of the demon race, somehow. Prejudices were a thing, and since this place was fantasy-based, probably worse. Mama Lily blinked and then let out an exasperated sigh. Perhaps I should have treated you more sternly after all. Coddling you seems to have dimmed your wits quite a bit over the years. I frowned. What do you mean, coddled? Weren't you the one who made me do chores, Mama Lily? And I should have made you do more to appreciate your genius. I rolled my eyes. Mama Lily laughed and then looked over at Silphy and the girls with a fond gaze. Still, I'm glad. My Rudy seems to have found some happiness and contentment these days. I coughed and said, I don't know what you're talking about. Mama Lily simply smiled and patted my head. Since that was the case, I turned my attention back to Silphy and my sisters. At some point, Silphy had gone to performing fun magic for the girls instead of playing patty cake. Floating water bubbles, spinning leaves, and drifting blades of grass. Aisha and Norn both watched with rapt attention, carefully staring at it, which made me wonder if they could see mana. The fact that their eyes seemed to be tracking the mana bubbles seemed to imply it, but... Rue! Norn waved at me and said, Play. I smiled and walked over. All right. But remember, Big Brother can't do magic right now, so... Live. The day went by. The sun flew past its highest point and began to sink into the horizon. Morning turned to noon, and now noon was turning into evening. Which meant that Paul's patrol was over. He stretched and then let out a grin as he looked at his patrol buddies. There were two people with him. The first was Laws, his best friend and fellow father. The second was Roxy, their practically adopted magical prodigy of a daughter, who was actually older than him. Still a weird thing to wrap his head around, but Paul didn't mind it too much. Weirder things had happened in life. Like literally everything since Rudy was born. But anyway, the trio walked out of the forest, finishing their patrol. As they did, Paul turned to the others and grinned. Finally! We can all head back home and have some rest and relaxation now. Laws shook his head and said, Speak for yourself. These days, my home has been far from relaxing. Oh yeah. Paul nodded and said, Your long-lost mother came to visit, right? How is she? You would know better than I, Paul. Huh? Laws groaned and covered his face. Please don't inquire further. 
I have been doing my utmost best to not dwell much about the potential ramifications of all of these relationships and how convoluted things are going to become due to how you and my mother know each other. Paul blinked. I know your mother? He frowned, thinking. There had been a lot of women in his life before Zenith and Lilia, but he didn't really remember any that could be Laza's mother. Well, there was a line lies. But a woman like that having an upright guy like Laws? Yeah, right. Roxy sighed and said, Please refrain from reminiscing on past exploits with other women, Paul. Especially when Zenith is pregnant with your next child. Considering how adept she is with magic now, she may just decide to end any potential of future heirs with her new capabilities. Paul paled and said, Why yeah? Good point. Things were on the up and up so there was no point thinking about it too hard and ruining everything. Like what Rudy mentioned to him one time. If something wasn't broken, don't try to fix it. After all, all of Paul's mistakes had been trying to fix something that was going fine. Well, his recent mistakes. Laws blinked and said, Zenith is pregnant again? Paul winked. There's been a lot of stress built up recently, if you know what I dash. Roxy interrupted and said, do I need to remind you of what happened the last time that you talked about your bedtime exploits with your wife, Paul? Paul instantly shut up and started to sweat. And no need, Roxy. I won't dash, he paused and said, wait. How do you know about that? Roxy patted the silver blob floating over her right shoulder and said, us girls talked about quite a bit while you were gallivanting in Roa planning a crusade against the branch of an ancient noble family. Paul coughed. All right. Yeah. Zenith and Lilia probably did a lot of venting around that time. Laws shook his head and smiled. Well. In any case, congratulations, Paul. Paul smiled back and said, Thanks, best buddy. Laws nodded. Of course. Though I hope that you have considered the financial burdens that come along with another child and set aside the appropriate funds. You, um. Laws blinked. And then he let out a deep sigh. You did not think that through, did you? Paul rubbed the back of his neck and said, I had e got a decent amount saved up for us. I think. All right, Roxy? Roxy sighed and said, Considering that you've cut back on your drinking, there should be enough. But you should be more careful. Despite it all, you are still just a low-ranking knight. Well, all the more reason to go take over the Noto's family then, right? He was the rightful heir, so. A sharp thud on his head. Ow! Paul rubbed his head and glared at the person who hit him. What was that for? I am simply reciting some psalms to push out those ingrained noble beliefs, my dear friend. Laws cracked his knuckles and said, Reason seems to enter your mind only through violence, so I figured that a few more lines from my hands would help you see things straight. Paul rolled his eyes. Fine. I won't go run off on a bloody rampage. Not like I was going to in the first place. Paul turned serious and rubbed his stubble chin. I can't let Rudy think that's an okay option. That kid's too eager to jump to bloodshed. I mean, I knew that he had a hell of a natural tendency towards killing intent, but... It was dangerous. Rudy was a genius, no matter how you looked at it. But at the same time, he was a child. The two led to a weird mix where he understood things at a level that was unthinkable, but also took other things for granted. Like the fact that he was a genius. His own intelligence blinded him to the fact that there were things that just weren't true for other people. But not only that, there were things that he took as facts and didn't question at all. Like how he thought that it was perfectly fine crushing people under your feet if they stood against you. Paul would be a hypocrite if he didn't agree with that line of thinking. After all, he would be the first to jump and attack scum. But Paul was also just above average. He could fight with a sword and maybe take out a small troop at this point. But he wasn't on the level of Rudy who could and would ruin an entire kingdom if he wasn't kept in check. After all, his son was someone who could impress the second world power. Someone who might even be on the list at this point. And Rudy was still just eight. What about the future? What about when he turned twelve, 
like Paul. If Rudy inherited Paul's temper and stubbornness, which he definitely did, considering how he had acted in the past. Since that was the case, it was possible Rudy might decide to do something impulsive like Paul did when he was around that age. Rudy cared for them all too much to do anything that would hurt the family. But that was a double-edged sword. For his family, Rudy would do anything. Paul rubbed his chin and muttered, Maybe I should send Rudy to school or take him adventuring. Laws blinked. Rudy? School? Roxy laughed. Sending Rudy to school. Do you want to cause a bloodbath, Paul? It might be fine if it was a place like my alma mater, but a noble academy. Paul winced. Yeah. That wouldn't end well, would it? As smart as Rudy was, he would find a way to justify killing people who annoyed him or rubbed him the wrong way. Hell, hadn't he beaten Uncle Sorrows up to a pulp and kicked him out a window back in Roa? If Rudy was willing to go that far to the region lord of Fedoa, he wouldn't bow his head to anyone. He didn't even bow down to Orsted of all people, so. Not to mention that there was that mysterious being W involved in everything as well. And if he was as manipulative as he seemed to be, it would be easy for everything to be used to turn Rudy into a demon lord. Especially since he seemed to actually have some demon god man of sorts, according to Roxy. Roxy hummed. Adventuring though. Rudy certainly is powerful and mature enough. But I'm not sure that's a good idea. She frowned and said, We still don't know if Rudy's trigger is linked to violence, anger, or bloodlust. If his mana flow changes again like before. Well, Rudy likes you, so you could probably just stop him with a kiss, right Roxy? Roxy's eyes widened and she turned red. She smacked Paul's arm with her staff and said, W what in the world are you suggesting, you dimwit? What? Paul rubbed his arm and said, It's true, isn't it? Even if he turned to some demon lord or something, I'm sure a kiss from his beloved master would either stun him enough to knock him out or just pull him out of it entirely. Laws sighed. Your mind continues to go to the strangest places, Paul. And I still think you guys are all too uptight about these sorts of things. The trio arrived at Laza's house. The plan was to go in and say hi to Rose and Laza's mother before heading back to the Grey Rat household. An ordinary turn of events. But something was off when they arrived. Hmm. Laws frowned and stared at the carriage nearby his home. I was not expecting to receive visitors today. Paul frowned and rested his hand over his sword. He glanced over at Roxy and said, Any sign of our meddlesome white guy from on high? Roxy blinked. That is a strange way of addressing that person. But no! She looked towards the house and said, There do not appear to be any signs of that person around. And I don't sense any battle aura or mana being used, so... I guess we've just got some guests. Though. Paul stared at the carriage and frowned. That's a pretty fancy carriage. There weren't any markings on it. However, there were a few luxurious chests in the back of the carriage that Paul could see. Laws frowned and then nodded. I will leave my back to you too then. With that, he quickly walked over to the front door. Boy! Paul went after him and said, Hold on there, Laws. You can't just dash. Laws threw the door open and walked in. Paul dashed after him. And then when he saw the people inside, he froze. Yo! A familiar man with a monkey-like face and windswept dark hair. Jisun Acadia, the thief in Paul's former adventurer party. Mm -hmm. So you were out on patrol, Paul. A beauty of a warrior with a perfectly honed body, with skin the color of chocolate and a mane of wild silver hair. Guy slain Dedoldia, the vanguard swordswoman in Paul's adventurer party. My, my. Long time no see, Paul. It's good to see that the cute boy finally learned to be a man. An elven beauty with curled light blonde hair and crimson eyes. A thin but provocative body that hid immense strength isn't what Paul saw. Instead of her usual lewd attire, the woman was wearing a modest gray robe that covered her entire body. Even so, Paul recognized her. Elinalized Dragon Road, the frontline tank in their party. 
half of the fangs of the black wolf were sitting around Laza's house, relaxing. And with Paul there and Zenith at home, that meant that only one person out of their whole party was missing. But while that was curious, it wasn't what caught Paul's attention. Instead, it was the frowning young girl with crimson hair and a sword sheathed at her side sitting next to Geislane. Eris saw Paul staring and said, What? Aren't you my father-in-law or something? Why are you so surprised to see me? Jisoo laughed and said, So Red says, Paul. But you know, I'm starting to think that you gray rat males have a jinx with beautiful women. Things never seem to go well, eh? Elina Elias sighed. You and your jinxes, Jisoo. Superstitions are good, but they can trap you into doing things you don't like, you know? Jisoo looked at her and said, maybe. But considering how even you changed so much after I taught Zenith how to cook, I think that they have some weight. Elina Elias smiled and placed her hand over her chest. Changed? Me? Geisley nodded and said, Jisoo is right, Elina Elias ah, it's Rostalina now, isn't it? At that time, Rose walked out of the kitchen, brushing flour off her hands. Please stop playing coy, mother-in-law. And welcome back, dear. And you too as well, Paul and Roxy. She smiled and said, The house is a bit lively right now, so pardon the mess. Paul waved his hand. Aye, it's fine. Just. He looked at the group of people scattered around Laza's home and sighed. It's going to be one of those days, huh? Chapter 79, Black Wolf Fong Sometime past noon, a loud commotion echoed from the distance. Lots of voices, along with the sound of a horse and a carriage. Frowning, I walked out of the house and looked to see what the hubbub was about. It turned out to be a group of people. A group of people walking towards our house, with a carriage in the back. A group of people that included Mom, Dad, and Master Roxy. Mr. Laws, Miss Rose, and Sylphie's grandma, and then Eris, Geislane, and a strange monkey-faced man I didn't know in the back with the carriage. Norn walked over to me and tugged my right pants leg. Rue? Tubble? I ruffled her hair and said, No. Just. I frowned and said, It's odd. Sylphie walked over towards me and looked confused as well when she saw the group. Um. Were you expecting this many people today, Rudy? No. I frowned and then turned to look back in the house. Mama Lily? She hugged Aisha to her chest and then walked out to take a look. When she saw everyone, shook her head. No. I was not aware that we were entertaining guests either. She sighed. It appears that your father may have done something again. I don't know if that's completely true, but I guess we can blame Dad for this. Especially since that heiress girl is in the group. Sylphie narrowed her eyes. I poked Sylphie and said, Be nice, Sylphie. Sylphie blinked and gave me a bright smile. I'm not planning anything, Rudy. Uh huh. Just remember that it's best to play nice. For now. Sylphie nodded. Okay. Since Rudy isn't planning to become the demon god yet, I'll be nice. Aisha gasped, her eyes sparkling. Big bro is demon god? I'm not. I poked Sylphie's forehead and said, Look what you've got them thinking now, Sylphie. Hee <laughs> hee. I sighed and then looked at the group more carefully. Mom was there. It seemed like Dad went to pick her up. And she was happily chatting with Sylphie's grandma, Rostalina, in the front. Mr. Laws and Miss Rose were nearby as well, standing behind Mom and Dad. Mr. Laws looked exasperated, but Miss Rose looked really happy and was chiming in every now and then talking with Mom and Rostalina. But they weren't the only guests. Geislane and Eris were sitting in the back of the carriage, one driven by that man with a monkey-like face. Master Roxy took up the rear, thoughtfully playing with her silver elemental spirit thing. Though I noticed that she kept glancing at the monkey-faced man. And I couldn't blame her. The man seemed shady. His equipment, amiable smile, and his face practically screamed bandit or thief. But there wasn't anything off about him. He barely had any silver mana, 
meaning that he didn't train at all. And while he was fit, his body wasn't trained like a warrior. In fact, he didn't even have any weapons on him. So why did staring at him give me the heebie-jeebies? Like I was missing something? Before I could sort out why that was, my dad waved at me, letting out a nervous smile. Hey, Rudy! Some of dad's old friends came by to visit. You don't mind, right? I sighed. Live. So you're Paul's kid, huh? The monkey-faced man, someone called Jisu apparently, looked at me while sipping on a mud of juice. Funny. You look pretty sharp. Guess you took more after Zenith than Paul, huh? I shrugged. Maybe. I paused and then said, hopefully. I don't want to be making mistakes all over the place like my dad does. Hey! Dad chimed in, waving a mud of foaming beer at me. I'm doing better. Better is not good, Dad. But I appreciate you trying. A lively party outside in the courtyard. Since this was the first time most of Dad's adventurer party got back together, we were having a big party to celebrate. Well, to celebrate that and apparently to celebrate the fact that I was going to have another baby sibling soon. Maybe I should bring up family planning to Dad sometime. Money wasn't a problem, but at the rate things were going. I mean, I would love having a bunch of cute younger siblings running around. But I would also not rather have to yell at Dad about us being broke all the time. Which reminded me that I needed to work more on that mana to magic crystal conversion process. And alchemy. Always good to have a way to make more money. Especially since coins in this world held value mostly because of the material and not the symbol. Anyway, we were all outside except for Mama Lily, Master Roxy, and Miss Rose who were all cooking inside. I took a look around the courtyard and saw that people had grouped up to chat. Mom was hanging out with Guy Slane and Rostalina, the women happily chatting together and gushing over Norn and Aisha who were sitting with them. Me, Dad, and that Jissa guy were hanging out. Laws was with Sylphie and Eris. My red-headed cousin seemed irritated at being there. But it seemed like she had grudgingly apologized. Well, that or she was being worn down by Sylphie's kindness. Wasn't entirely sure which, but it seemed like things were going well over there. Probably helped that there were two responsible adults around this time instead of Dad and Guy Slain. Not that I had anything against Guy Slain, but she seemed to be cut from the same cloth as Dad and being good with a sword and pretty much nothing else. Hey, Paul. Does your kid always space out like this? Don't worry about him, Jisoo. My genius son's got a lot of different projects in his head. I blinked and realized that I was doing the thing again. I coughed, feeling my face heat up and said, I, I don't space out that often, Dad. Not as often as you stare at women. Dad leaned forward, taking a large swig out of his beer. After that, he said, Rudy. Have you seen your mom and Mama Lily? If we were in the Azura Kingdom, I'd be fighting people off left and right to stop people from trying to flirt with them. I narrowed my eyes. Dad quickly added, Ayo. I'm just exaggerating, kiddo. No need to get your panties in a bunch. I sighed and said, I don't wear panties, Dad. And I hope you are. I frowned and muttered, if not, Maybe I really should start plotting a social revolution. If the kingdom was really as bad as Dad kept subtly making it out to be, and if it churned out nobles like Sorrows and left people as mentally scarred as Mama Lily was when we first met, it might be good to pay a visit. Though, considering that the Azura Kingdom had the largest military force in the world, it might not be the best thing to do right now. Huh. Jisu sipped on his drink and said, You've got a pretty scary kid, Paul. Paul laughed and said, Yeah. Rudy's pretty scary. Did I tell you about the time he almost killed Guy Slain? Oi. I cut in and said, That was your fault, Dad. And I wasn't going to. Probably. Ho. Oh. Jisoo stared at me and said, Scary. Maybe I should be careful about smart kids in the future? Seems like a pretty bad jinx. I blinked. Jinx? Jisoo laughed and said, Yep. A jinx. Hmm. 
think of it like a good luck charm. If something went wrong before, it'll probably go wrong again, right? Then it's better to just avoid situations where those things can go wrong. Dad snorted and said, that's just being superstitious. Hey. Jisu shrugged and said, it's what's kept me alive all these years while not having combat skills, Paul. And I keep saying that you should have picked some up. Paul shook his head and said, isn't it a worse jinx being unable to defend yourself if something happens? Jisoo laughed. True. But that's what my buddies are for. It's a jinx going on an adventure alone, you know? I stared at Dad and Jisoo being chummy and then frowned. How do you know Dad anyway, Mr. Jisoo? Jisoo waved his hand and said, it's a long story. Dad chuckled and said, it's not that long. He reached an arm around Jisoo and pulled him close, saying, this guy was the source of half our troubles and half our funds, Rudy. Jisoo brushed Dad's arm off and said, yeah, and you were the other half of our troubles. And the funds! Only after Zenith joined and you stopped chasing Tail. Before that it was all a line lies. He paused and said, though I guess it's Rostalina now? He shrugged and sipped on his juice. Whatever the case, it's good that she finally got her memories back. Though. Jisoo looked at Rostalina and said, she's pretty different, huh? Man. Dad shrugged and said, we've all changed a bit over the years. Even you. Since when were you sentimental enough to track down Geislane of all people to say hi? Jisoo laughed and said, that's true. But it's a bit lonely by yourself, you know? Most people turn to God or go crazy. I frowned and stared harder at Jisoo. I couldn't help but feel that something was off about him. It didn't seem like his camaraderie with Dad and the others was fake, but... Jisoo noticed me staring and winked. Sorry, kiddo. No matter how hard you stare at me, I'm not giving up my tricks. You're going to have to figure out how to handle your dad on your own. I rolled my eyes. That's not what I'm bothered about. I was worried about his slippery response. He never answered my question, and he was pretty good at directing the flow of the conversation too. But it was odd. Something didn't feel right. I stared harder and then I saw it. A faint flicker of white mist floating around Jisoo's head. Dad noticed too and then instantly frowned. Eh? Jisoo blinked and said, What's wrong, Paul? Dad glanced at me and then laughed. Nothing, Jisoo. But it's pretty wild that you happened to show up in Roa. Have things been going all right for you? Hmm. Jisoo looked thoughtful and he said, I guess it was a bit weird. I got this urge to suddenly visit and dash. I focused and quietly dispersed the white mist, converting it into ambient mana with a magic circle formed out of holy mana. Huh. Jisoo blinked and rubbed the back of his neck. That's weird. Felt like some wool got pulled out of my head. Dad laughed and said, that's what you get for being a bachelor so long. He raised his beer mug to Jisoo and said, you gotta settle down with a nice gal, Jisoo. Jisoo chuckled. Maybe. But me and girls don't mix well, Paul. What? Dad tapped Jisoo's arm and said, got a jinx on that too? Something like that. He laughed. I quietly dispersed the magic circle and kept a close eye on being W's mana. It was gone. But the fact that it didn't show up until now. He was getting sneakier. Latching onto one of Dad's old friends too. If I wasn't paying attention, would he have made the guy do something ridiculous like kidnap Norn or Aisha? No, if I wasn't cautious and noticed how weird Jisoo felt, I might have missed it. Sneaky bastard. Jisoo looked at me and said, That's a scary face you've got, kiddo. He reached over and ruffled my hair, saying, You should relax more. You don't want to jinx things by being too scary, you know? Dad laughed and said, Yeah. Most of Jisoo's jinxes are ridiculous, but he does have a point. Take it easy for a bit, Rudy. Here, do you want to try some dash? Paul Grayrat. Mom's voice cut through the air and she said, If Rudy sips any alcohol, you get the floor. Dad instantly leaned back and said, I'm kidding. 
Jeez, Zenith. He looked at me though and winked. I sighed. Jisoo chuckled and said, Some things never change, huh? He looked at Dad and said, I thought you were all grown up, but you're still that childish horn dog at heart, aren't you? Dad drained his beer and set his mug on the ground. After that, he said, I'll have you know that I was a wolf. Especially after Dash. I am. I cleared my throat and gave Dad a pointed look. He laughed and rubbed the back of his neck. Um. It's the legacy of a misspent youth, Rudy. Don't be like me, okay? Considering how things seem to blow up whenever you do something, Dad, I really don't want to be like you at all. Dad nodded. That's smart. Though you really could take a few pages from my playbook on girls. With how dense you are, I'm starting to worry I won't see grandchildren until I'm in my fifties. W what? I felt my face heat up and then kick my dad's shin. What are you even trying to teach to your eight-year-old kid? Ow! You aren't eight years old yet, Rudy. I might as well be eighty with all the stress you've caused me. Heh. You know, you sound a lot like your mom when you get angry. Should I be like Mr. Laws instead and use my fists then? H. Hold on. No need to go that far. Jisoo laughed. I noticed and then paused, backing off. After that, I crossed my arms and huffed. Whatever. I looked over at Sylphie and then said, I'm going to chat with Sylphie and the others. Dad looked at me and said, Please play nice with Eris. Her dad basically kicked her out here to the Boonas, so she's feeling pretty irritated. But she's a nice girl. You keep saying that, Dad. But we'll see. I shook my head and then walked over to Sylphie, Mr. Laws, and Eris. Eris was in a bad mood. Guy Slane ditched her to talk with some other women, that elf woman Rostalina or whatever and some other woman with blonde hair. Actually, both of them had blonde hair, but whatever. Wasn't important. What was important was that she was stuck with that elf girl who tried to kill her last time and an elf man who seemed to be her father. But that was fine. The elf girl had been scary last time, but she calmed down. Not only that, but her father was polite at least. After getting some chairs for them all, the elf girl's father. Law or something left to get some snacks and drinks. That left Eris alone with Sylphie for a bit. She was worried the elf girl would flip again and try to kill her. But that didn't happen. Instead, the elf girl was calm. In fact, she was even smiling at Eris. And not a fake smile either, but a soft and confident one. Eris frowned and said, What are you so happy about? Mm -hmm. The elf girl shook her head and said, There would be too many things to list. But I guess I'm just happy that it's so lively here. And that I have a chance to see you again. Eris blinked and pointed at herself. Me? Was the elf girl crazy or something? Yep. The elf girl nodded and held out her hand. We didn't start off right last time, did we? Sorry. My name's Sylphie, by the way. She was definitely crazy. Eris would never have forgiven someone who talked to her the way Eris had to Sylphie back then. Ah. But this was the elf girl who snapped and actually tried to murder her, so. Eris suppressed the shiver of fear running down her spine at the flashback of those countless icicles and instead forced a smile on her face. Grabbing Sylphie's hand, Eris nodded and said, It's fine, Sylphie. I accept your apology. And I'm. Eris swallowed her pride and said, I'm sorry for what I did too. There. She did what Geislane asked her to. But she still didn't. Wow! Sylphie clapped her hands and said, You actually apologized? Eris felt her face heat up and crossed her arms. What's that supposed to mean, huh? Is my apology not good enough or something? Sylphie shook her head. It's great! I just didn't think that a princess like you would apologize. Eris blinked and said, Princess? Mmm, Sylphie nodded and said, You're a princess, aren't you? I heard from Papa how all the servants in your house listened to you and gave you all you want. 
It must be nice. Eris's face darkened and she looked away. You only think it's nice because you have a good dad. That law guy seemed to actually care about Sylphie. No, he was nice enough to get something for Eris as well, so he seemed to be a decent person. And he didn't seem as strong as Paul or Geislein, but he gave off a reassuring aura. Not like Grandpa Sorrows who would break everything apart, but someone who would show up no matter what. Eh? Sylphie blinked and said, Mr. Philip didn't seem that bad though? TCH. Eris shook her head and said, Who cares about a weakling like that anyway? All he does is spend his days in the office writing letters or getting smacked around by Grandpa and ignored by Mom. Sylphie blinked again and said, That doesn't seem like someone weak though? Eris paused. What do you mean? Well, Sylphie started swinging her legs back and forth on her chair and said, A weakling wouldn't be able to do all of that with a smile. And it was only a bit, but Mr. Philip was smiling even after you made that big mess, wasn't he? Eris furrowed her brow. It was true. Her father was always smiling that annoying fake smile. Even when Grandpa hit him in the face, or when Mom slapped him, he didn't respond. Instead, he put on that smile and bowed. No. When Eris hit him too, all he did was smile at her. Maybe she was wrong? Grandpa said that her father wasn't weak too, didn't he? Then. Arg. Whatever. Eris crossed her arms. It doesn't matter if he's weak or not. I still hate him for sending me all the way out here. Who cares if I got a fancy new sword or whatever? Do you know how annoying it was sitting on that bumpy carriage for so long? Sylphie shook her head. I don't. But it's not that bad, right? At least you could still see and move around a bit. Eris rolled her eyes. Of course I could. But it's still cramped. Hmm. Sylphie nodded. It must be nice, though. You don't have anybody to worry about but yourself. You've even got that strong big sister guy slain to escort you all the way here. Eris frowned. That's not true. I've got a lot to worry about. Like. Like Mom. And Grandpa. Right? She would definitely be mad if something happened to them. Would she? Eris paused to think about that. And then she stopped thinking about it and huffed. It doesn't matter. Eris took a look around and said, How are you not bored around a place like this anyway? All that Eris could see was grass, grass, and more grass. Well, there was a forest in the distance and some farmlands too. And that tiny village. But that was it. Sylphie shrugged. I've got a friend to play with so it's never really boring. Eris felt a pang of jealousy, but she did her best to not let it show. Instead, she turned up her nose at Sylphie and said, Who needs friends anyway? That just means you're weak. Sylphie nodded. Yep. I'm pretty weak. I mean, you beat me, didn't you? Eris flinched. She wasn't expecting Sylphie to acknowledge that so easily. Sylphie continued talking like nothing happened though and said, but even if that's true, I'd rather be weak and have someone to make my days happy and fun than be strong and live sad and lonely days. Eris felt a jab in her heart at those words. Sad and lonely days. Until Guy Slain showed up, wasn't that how she felt? That no one cared about her and that she was all alone? Before Eris could think too much on that, Laws returned. Here you go, Miss Eris. Laws smiled and held out a small wooden cup to Eris. Sorry it took so long. My wife had a lot to say to me when I went inside. Eris took the cup with a meek nod and said, It's fine. Laws's smile widened. Eris looked away, feeling uncomfortable at the warm expression. Sylphie smiled at that. Laws handed a cup to Sylphie as well and said, I got you some juice too, Luffy. Thanks, Papa. Sylphie took the cup and sipped on it. Laws sat down and then looked at Eris. I hope that you haven't had too rough a time, Miss Eris. I know that it may seem like a drastic change coming from Roa, but Bina Village has its charms as well. Sylphie nodded and said, Right. 
And since you're here, we have a new friend to play with. Oh, and we can introduce you to Norn and Aisha too. They're really cute, you know? And I'm sure they'd like to have a new big sister to play with. Be big sister? Me? Eris blinked. Weird. These people were all weird. They didn't know her. And Eris didn't do anything good to them. Even so, they were being nice. Welcoming. She was sure of it. Everyone here was crazy. Even so. Eris took a sip from her juice. It wasn't bad. Oh! Rudy. Sylphie spoke up and waved to someone in the back. Eris paused and turned around to look. Rudy. That boy Paul kept talking about. The one that Guy Slane called a monster with magic. The one who her dad said would become her husband in the future. Before, Eris didn't have a good chance to look at him. But she did now, so she took advantage of that. He was young. Shorter than Eris too. His face was still a bit chubby and gave off a cute look. Paired with his bright and wide green eyes, he looked like a complete pushover. But he wasn't. His silver hair showed that. From what she heard from Geislain, Rudy's hair turned that after using a crazy magic spell that almost killed even Geislain. Not only that, but his body was trained. Instead of chubby kid arms, they were clearly muscular and defined. Weird, considering how he was still a kid. But it showed that he took training seriously. Or that Paul was even worse on him than he was on her. Maybe both? Rudy let out an easygoing laugh and said, Sorry to keep you waiting, Sylphie. I wanted to talk with Mr. Jisoo for a little bit, but Dad kept bringing up the past. Laws sighed. Of course. Paul is the sort to run his mouth when he's had too much to drink. He shook his head and stood up. I will make sure he remembers to keep it in moderation. He smiled and said, Have fun, you three. With that, Laws left. And then it was just Eris, Sylphie, and Rudy. And when that was the case, Rudy turned to look at Eris. Eris felt her breath stop. Sharp eyes. The innocent and wide-eyed look vanished in an instant. Those bright green eyes suddenly turned dark and menacing, flashing with a bit of crimson light. The mocking words Eris planned to say suddenly vanished as she felt her heart race in fear. And then that sharp gaze was gone, as if it was just an illusion. Rudy let out a warm smile and said, Sorry about that. I don't think we've properly been introduced, right? I'm Rudy. He Eris. She mumbled her name and averted her gaze. Scary. Even now her heart was pounding in her chest. Guy Slane was right. Rudy was definitely a monster. Just looking at him made her body freeze up. Rudy smiled and then held out his hand. It's nice to meet you, Eris. A warm and sincere greeting. One that definitely didn't make sense considering what happened the last time she saw him. Crazy. She was sure of it now. Everyone here was crazy. Still. Eris took Rudy's hand and shook it. It's nice to meet you too, I guess. Eris suddenly felt a sharp gaze from behind Rudy and flinched. Hmm. Rudy frowned and took a look around. Did something happen? Sylphie laughed and said, Maybe Eris is just seeing things? She has been on a carriage ride all day. Isn't that right, Eris? Eris started to sweat. Why yes. That's probably it. Rudy's frown deepened and he said, That's no good. He lifted Eris's hand up and then placed his other hand over it. Eris was confused, but then she felt a sudden warmth spread from her hand to her body. When she did, fatigue she didn't even know she was feeling was swept away. There. Rudy smiled and said, That should have helped. A bright and warm expression. One that Eris barely acknowledged considering the chilling gaze she felt from Sylphie, standing just behind Rudy. Hmm? Rudy tilted her head. Did that not work? Eris quickly shook her head. It did. I'm fine. I think. Just, still a bit tired. Oh. 
Rudy nodded. Probably some mental fatigue then. It's probably your first time on a long carriage ride, right? Why yes. Thought so. Then, how about we just sit and chat for a while to get to know each other? I overheard Guy Slane mentioning that you two will be in Bina Village for a while, right? And since we are family, I guess we should get to know each other better. Family? Her and Rudy? Eris felt her face warm up. Rudy blinked. What? Sylphie let out a deep sigh. Huh? Rudy looked at Sylphie and said, Did I say something wrong? Hearing that, Eris sighed as well. For someone supposedly smart, Rudy sure seemed to be an idiot. Live. Guy Slane looked at Zenith and smiled. It's good to see you again, Zenith. Zenith hugged Norn against her chest and nodded, smiling. It's good to see you again too, Guy Slane. And you too, Elina Liza, I mean Rostalina. Rostalina smiled while braiding Aisha's hair. Just call me Lena, Zenith. She laughed and said, and it's fine. I didn't expect things to end up this way either, so I don't blame you messing it up. I'm happy that you got your memories back though. Zenith smiled and said, I know you said you started remembering things a while back, but it's good that you remembered all of them now. Rostalina let out a wry smile. It's come with its own fair share of challenges. But it's been nice, yes. Though I'll admit things have turned a bit awkward as a result. Lena? Hair pretty? Aisha looked up at Rostalina. Rostalina laughed and said, Almost done, sweetie. Wait a bit longer. K. Dyslane looked at Aisha and shook her head. I'm still surprised that Paul's whelps are so well behaved. Zenith snorted. Don't take Aisha as the standard. She's just playing nice right now because she wants to be pampered. New. Aisha pouted and said, Mama lie. No listen. AI good girl. Dyslane hummed and then looked at Norn. Considering how you seem to be pampering your child. Hmm. Zenith tilted her head while preening Norn's hair. I don't know what you're talking about. Norn struggled to get out from Zenith's grasp, looking at Geisling with pleading eyes. Or perhaps you are smothering her instead with your love. Zenith gasped and let her grip loosen. Sorry, Norny. Did Mama hug you too tight again? Geisling blinked. Again. Norn squirmed away from Zenith and then moved to Geisling, holding up her arms. H hep me? Up. Geisling let out a warm smile and then lifted Norn up to sit on her lap. Norn let out a sigh and then leaned back, relief on her face. Zenith pouted. Why does everyone keep stealing my cute Norny away from me? Rostalina laughed and said, Too much love can smother a child, you know? You've got to give just the right amount of care, love, and attention. Take it from an experienced mother. Zenith blinked and then looked at Rostalina in confusion. What do you mean experienced dash? She paused and then said, Oh. Of course. Wait. You raised your children? Rostalina huffed. Rude. I'm no heartless vixen. Even if I like. She glanced at Aisha and Norn and said, Even with my past, I made sure to raise my children up well to adulthood. The only one who I didn't was Laws, but there were complicated circumstances around that. Zenith's eyes lit up and she said, Then, do you plan on staying in Bina Village longer? Because Lily and I could use some help and pointers on how to raise children. Rostalina finished braiding Aisha's hair and set her down. There you go, sweetie. Aisha giggled and said, Thank you. I show mama. With that, she ran off back into the house. Zenith frowned and said, Be careful, Aisha. K. I careful Mama Saini. Saying that with a small wave, Aisha continued on her way. Zenith sighed. That girl has too much energy sometimes. Rostalina laughed and said, Children tend to be that way, yes. And I didn't plan to stay very long, but my man's busy with his own thing right now. She tapped her finger on her chin and said, I suppose it's better if I stay in a place where he can pick me up later. 
Geislane looked over at Rostalina and raised an eyebrow. You have another mate, Alina Lina? Rostalina giggled and placed her hands on her cheeks. He's a very manly man. But he's also very private. Maybe I'll bring him to meet everyone after the kids are grown up. Zenith blinked. You have more kids already? Rostalina paused and then puffed her cheeks. No. Though not for lack of trying. I meant your kids. Zenith blinked again. Huh? Rostalina waved her hand. It's complicated. Magic and a bunch of other things are involved, so we'll have that conversation later. But anyway, she leaned forward and said, So I heard that you're pregnant again, Zenith? Zenith blushed. Chapter 80 Reborn It was a long and lively evening. With mom and dad's old friends over, a lot of stories were exchanged and a lot of laughter had. Most of that over dad's overly affectionate PDAs with mom and mama Lily after having one too many drinks. While the adults chatted, us kids hung out and did our own thing. Mostly just getting to know each other and playing some board games that I helped Sylphie make. I'd been meaning to do some before to play with Aisha and Norn, but even with healing magic, I didn't want to risk them swallowing something. My baby sisters were big girls now though, their words, so I made a few simple board games to play. One with chutes and ladders, another with a bunch of colored discs to line up four in a row. Like that, we managed to preoccupy ourselves and my baby sisters. Master Roxy even joined in later, eager to try out con asterisk tfo asterisk r. Or so she said. But it looked more like she was feeling out of place with the adults and joined us instead. It was great though. And while I thought that Eris would be trouble, she seemed to be playing nice. Still wasn't sure if that was because we caught her in a bad mood at Roa, if she was trying to change, or if she was actually a good person like Dad said. I was, tentatively giving her the benefit of the doubt on that. Still didn't forgive her for beating up Sylphie for no apparent reason, but since Sylphie wasn't showing any bad feelings towards Eris, I decided to not judge her too harshly. Besides, Norn and Aisha seemed to have like her. And Eris technically was family, like I mentioned to her. But anyway, time passed and night fell. Which meant we had to find a place for everyone to crash for the night. Mostly the adults. Which also meant that Sylphie's little remark about building a house came true since our house was definitely too small to fit everyone. And so a conspicuous stone mansion suddenly appeared next to the humble gray rat household. Not. Sylphie was all for making a fancy house and even carving things out with ice. And Master Roxy wanted to make it mobile, able to transform and fly on a whim with a bunch of magic circles and the help with her new now confirmed metal spirit. Apparently, the little guy was like Mercury and could amalgamate all sorts of materials together along with mana, or something. Master Roxy rattled on a bit too much in her excitement and started talking in the magic god language halfway through her explanation so I didn't catch everything. I did suddenly realize that people actually spoke different languages not though. The more you know, right? Anyway, I put my foot down and talked them out of it, creating a simple one-story ranch-style house instead. Well, I helped them create it. Mostly by doing floor plans and sketching things out. Fortunately, all those hours watching me asterisk ECR asterisk FT builds on yo asterisk T asterisk be paid off, so we ended up with something fairly practical. Which was good, since it turned out that Guy Slane and Eris were going to be more like live-in guests rather than short-term visitors. Apparently, my dear Uncle Philip said it would be unacceptable for my betrothed to live apart from me for so long since it would show that it was a sham marriage, or something. I called BS on that. And it also pissed me off at how aggressive that guy seemed to be throwing his daughter away, but considering that he drew a line in the sand, and since Eris really didn't have anywhere else to go if we turned her away too, she stayed. And of course, that meant Guy Slain stayed as well, since she was both Eris's sword tutor and personal bodyguard. And that meant that the second and separate house was definitely needed since there was some history between Guy Slain and Dad. I still remembered the look Dad gave her when he was trying to tick me off back then. It was acting, sure. But there was also something to it, so separate house it was. 
Like that, we did a bit of reshuffling in living arrangements. Going forward, me, Geislane, Eris, and Master Roxy would sleep in the new house while Mom, Dad, Mama Lily, and my baby sisters would sleep in our old house. Well, technically I didn't have to stay in the new house. But I knew what shenanigans my parents planned after mentioning all of that, so it was better for my mental health to not think about it too much and just move out a bit. That aside, the morning after the reunion slash celebration party for my new baby sibling, things were pretty normal. Jisoo left, saying he had some quests he had to complete if he wanted to maintain his S-rank adventurer status. He promised he would come visit every now and then to catch up though, and that he would send letters. Still thought the guy was shady, but since it turned out his actual written and accepted job as an adventurer was a thief, that made sense. This world's common sense was weird. Anyway, after that things settled down to a new normal. It was a bit awkward at first with the addition of Guy Slain and Eris to the Greyrat household, but things settled down soon enough. Especially when Master Roxy impressed Eris by making a bunch of golems for her to fight and occupy herself while we did our thing with Sylphie and my sisters. Mom and Dad went to work as usual, though Mom came back early since she was pregnant. Mama Lily still did chores, but since Guy Slain was around and Eris was having fun fighting the golems Master Roxy created, Mama Lily and Guy Slain trained together when Mama Lily finished the chores. Well, it was more like Guy Slain was training Mama Lily and accidentally becoming the victim to all the protections I had placed inside of Mama Lily's protective bracelet. Fortunately, Guy Slain took it like a champ. I think. It was really hard to read her. Like that, time passed. Spring turned to summer. I turned eight to little fanfare, mostly because we were all too busy having fun. And then, a few weeks before midsummer. And that's why I want to head out with Philip and Uncle Soros to the Milbots region. Dad mentioned something ridiculous again. Live. A family meeting in the afternoon. Aisha and Norn were fast asleep, tired out from running around all day and playing around with Mana. Even so, Sylphie was keeping an eye on them with Eris and Geislane. That left me, Mom, Mama Lily, Master Roxy, and Dad sitting around the dining room table in our old house. Dad shook his head and said, It's dangerous, but if things go well, we can settle this without resorting to bloodshed. I tapped my fingers on the table, frowning. So you say. But are you sure this will work out right, Dad? I mean, you're strong right now, but... Since Dad had kept up with his training, and since he kept being pummeled by me and Laws to get Zenka to get stronger after healing up, he was strong. Stupid strong. But not Orsted strong. If we kicked him out right with proper equipment and magical artifacts, I was sure Dad could handle pretty much anybody that popped out of the woodwork. Even so. How do we know this isn't a plot by being W? That was the key question. Uncle Philip got intel from a mysterious magician about a potential kidnapping occurring at a well-known noble gathering in a foreign land. And it just so happened that the orchestrators would be the Nodo's family. It was fishy. Too convenient. Mama Lily nodded. It is too dangerous, Paul. Mom nodded as well. I really don't want you to go. And I'm pregnant. You aren't just going to leave your helpless wife like this, are you? A guilt trip. The leverage that mom always used to make dad do things for her. It definitely had an effect. Dad's face twisted into a grimace and he looked hesitant. But even so, he shook his head and said, I know it's bad timing. But it's something we have to do. I frowned. Is it though? The Azurian Kingdom or whatever never followed up, and we never got any assassins or troublemakers from the Nodos family. The worry that we would get branded as traitors or hunted down never came to fruition. It still could. But considering how much time had passed, it really didn't seem likely. Which was unfortunate since I was itching to test out a few defense measures I had installed, but it was probably for the best. Master Roxy nodded. Rudy has a point. She looked at my dad and said, even if your brother may prove trouble in the future, or if the Azura Kingdom sends forces this far out, we have nothing to fear. 
she glanced over to her floating silver spirit and smiled. Isn't that right, Mercy? Shing. Dad pursed his lips and said, even so. We can't just let this happen. If I'm not there, something terrible will happen to an innocent young girl. So what? I shrugged and said, it doesn't involve us. And it will involve us if you go. Terrible things happen in the world all the time. Who cares if another gets added to the list? Silence. I blinked and looked around. What? Did I say something weird? Mom and Dad shared a look. Master Roxy covered her face and sighed. Only Mama Lily looked at me. She frowned and said, That is true, Rudy. But... But what? I frowned and said, It's just a random girl. Dad glared at me and said, What if that girl was Silphy? Or Norn? Aisha? I shook my head. I see what you're getting at, Dad. But she's not. And this isn't a world where we have the luxury to go around saving everyone in sight, right? I mean, that's why you ran all the way here to Bina Village, isn't it? Mom pursed her lips and said, Rudy. I looked at her. Yes, Mom? She stared at me and then carefully said, Do you not care about other people? Of course I do. I nodded and said, Everyone's lives are important. But it's not our business to get involved when it means putting our own lives at risk. Especially for a random stranger. Besides, I looked at Dad and said, Why do you have to go? Can't Uncle Philip or your uncle find some other strong people to help out? Dad hesitated. They could, but dash. I pressed on. And if it's that important, why don't I just come along? I'm completely healed and stronger than before. Not only that, but if this is as much of a trap as it appears, it'll be better if I'm there to help out. You can't dash. And if not me, since Orsted wants to team up with me, why don't we just ask him to help out? If this mission or whatever means saving a member of a noble house, that means he could get a favor for helping out, right? And since it seems to involve being W, he would probably be happy to help. Dad was quiet. True. Even so. Even so what, Dad? I frowned and said, this doesn't make any sense. You know the risks. We shouldn't get involved, but even if we have to, there are better alternatives than you going in alone. I stood up and said, what if an army of sword kings show up? Or a group of emperor-ranked magicians? Dad laughed and said, I think your sense of scale is off, Rudy. There's less than a dozen king-ranked swordsmen in both the sword god and water god style. But not for the north god, right? That's just basically whoever can fight. I shook my head and said, you're good, but you don't scale in combat. In the worst case scenario, you'll be going up against an entire hostile house in a hostile land without any backup. This is a terrible idea. I crossed my arms and said, either you let me come, you let Master Roxy tag along, or you don't go at all. Dad smirked and said, wow. Talking for Roxy now, are you? My genius son works fast. I slammed my hand on the table and said, this isn't the place for jokes, Dad. He stared at me and smiled. It seems you're forgetting about someone, Rudy. Who? Dad stretched and said, well, there's a certain swordswoman who's pretty free right now. And she also has ties to the Boreas family, so she's going to come along anyway. I shook my head and said, even with Geislane, it's still too dangerous. We don't know what tricks being W is pulling or what pieces he has in store. Going out like this is Dash. Necessary. Dad gave me a stern look. I bit my tongue and stared back. Rudy. Dad stared at me and said, I know it's dangerous. I know it's risky. And I know that it could be a trap. But it's something that I, we have to do. Why? I frowned and said, why do you have to go out of your way for something like this? We're fine if we just stay here at Bina Village and Dash. Son. I flinched and stared at my dad. He stood up too and looked down at me. Crossing his arms, 
he said, do you want to live your entire life in a cage like this? Chapter 81 With Great Power A. Cage? Dad looked at me and said, you're scared. We're all scared. We don't know how strong this being W guy is or what he has in store. But we have to check. It's fine training here in safety, but that won't last forever. You saw Jisoo, right? Being W tried to pull a fast one on us. We caught it, but what if we don't next time? And what does that have to do with you running off by yourself? I glared at him and said, it's stupid. You're stupid. Why are you stupid? Mom narrowed her eyes and said, don't talk like that to your father, Rudy. What? It's true. Dad laughed and waved his hand at my mom. It's fine, Zenith. He looked at me and nodded. It's true. I'm stupid. But Rudy, didn't you know? He grinned and said, even masters have to be careful in front of absolute fools. Not to mention that an idiot who doesn't know or fear the enemy's plans is the best one to ruin them. Master Roxy tapped her fingers on the table and slowly nodded. That is a fair point. It being W has been quiet because he is working plans behind the scene to spring them when we least expect it, then it would be wise to throw some chaos into the works to disrupt them. Right? Dad pointed at Roxy and then looked at me. See? Your beloved master Roxy gets it. But that is assuming that is not his intention. Roxy continued and frowned. The problem we face is that we do not know the extent of being W's abilities. If he is a god, is he omniscient? It appears that he is not, but how far below that bar is his gaze? Can he perceive the future? The past? And what are his capabilities? What if he directly manifests? I pointed at Roxy too and said, Do you see? It's too risky for you to go alone. But if I come, we won't have that risk. I was confident. If being W tried anything, I would be able to thwart it. And even if we were surrounded by enemy forces, I could mow them all down and get us out of there. In the worst case scenario. Well, no matter how strong a person was or how good the magic was in this world, that was only to the level of what they knew about the world around them. I had an entire repository of knowledge from a separate world because of my past life. And while I didn't recall much, if any, of that past life anymore, I still remembered what I had learned. And if push came to shove, I had enough mana to brute force phenomenon like Sylphie did. Unraveling the molecular bonds of the person in front of me and turning them into a puddle of goo. Modifying healing magic to override the body's homeostasis and cause rapid cell division to induce either aging or cancerous tumors. Barring that, I could also create a plague or virus. Something that spread rapidly and mutated quickly. Non-lethal at first, but then quickly adapting. And one that spread through the air. Or maybe one that latched onto mana and self-empowered through that? I had countless ways to end things it being W flipped the table or crossed the line. So it didn't have to be like this. Dad didn't have to risk his life by going alone. And if I was there, we didn't have to worry. Dad stared at me and then let out a deep sigh. It seems like I messed up, huh? I blinked and stared at my dad. What do you mean? Dad shook his head and walked around the table towards me. After that, he placed his hands on my shoulder. Rudy, listen to me very carefully. I looked up at him and slowly nodded. I'm listening. You're still young. But these are the years that will determine the man who you're going to become the rest of your life. I gave him a blank look and said, Dad, I'm eight years old. The fact that you can say that means it's even more true. Dad gave me a serious look and said, Rudy, you're young, but you aren't a kid. Hell, you're more mature than I was when I ran away from home. I couldn't really argue with that. It was true. I was young, but I wasn't a child. I knew better than most and I had the capacity to understand the world around me since I was born. And I technically had lived a life already, even if it was cut short and I couldn't recall it. Dad patted my head with his left hand and said, 
I know how much you love all of us. I know how much you worry about seeing us get hurt. But you can't focus on just your family. Why not? I brushed his hand off and said, who cares about everyone else? I'm fine as long as everyone here is safe. Dad sighed. Rudy. He shook his head and said, if someone like you doesn't care, who will? I froze. That. Dad looked at me and said, all it takes for the bad guys to win is for the good guys to stand back and do nothing. Now, Dad isn't a good guy. I'm doing better, but I grew up in a place where doing bad things was normal. Expected. He glanced at Lilia and looked away in shame. I noticed and frowned. But you changed, Dad. You're a good person now. He laughed and said, well, if my genius son says it, maybe it's true. But then, if it's true, I have to show it. And if I've become a good person, if I'm a good guy now, then I can't let the bad guys run free. I stared at my dad and said, but that's stupid. You can't stop all of them. Saving just this one girl isn't worth it. Maybe. Dad nodded and said, but it's who I'm trying to be. And it's probably a bit too late for me to change. He laughed and said, hell, your dad has a lot of bad habits that he keeps falling back to. I've kicked a bunch of them, but a few still come back every now and then. But you're different. He stared at me and said, you can be good or evil, Rudy. Hero or villain. You're this young, but you already have more power than almost everyone else in the world. I would bet my life on that dash. Please don't. Dad laughed and said, right, right. But it's true. You have power, Rudy. Enough power to change the world for better or for worse. But with that great power, there must also come great responsibility. I was quiet. I knew those words. I didn't know if Dad was just subconsciously drawing on them or what, but I remembered those words. Right. With great power comes great responsibility. It was famous. A quote that pretty much everyone knew. And something that I knew too. But I hadn't thought about it at all. After all, I didn't have great power before I died. But I did now. Dad was right. For once, he made a good point. The only thing that was required for evil to prevail was for good men to do nothing. And people didn't wake up one day deciding to become evil. It was a gradual acceptance. Letting one small act go because it was convenient. A cascade of compromises until there was nowhere left to fall and you relished where you stood. Dad made good points. Even so, that still doesn't explain why you have to go, Dad. It was just a distraction. Dad laughed and said, fine. If that didn't convince you, I guess I can't. He sighed and stepped back. You're young, Rudy. But I guess you grew up before I realized it. And it seems I set the wrong example. So I won't stop you from coming along. But. I'm asking you. He looked at me and said, let me do this. I've messed up twice already, but third time's the charm, right? I clenched my fists. He was stupid. His reasoning was complete garbage and he was being reckless again. I didn't want to let him do this. At least, not outside of my sight. But before I could say anything else, Mama Lily spoke up. It's fine, Rudy. Huh? I looked over at Mama Lily. What do you mean? Mama Lily looked at my dad and said, your father is reckless when he runs off on his own. So we can't let him do that. But you're the same. So that won't do. I blinked and then pouted. What do you mean? I'm nothing like Dad. Dad clutched his chest as said, Ah. My poor heart. My beloved son is rejecting me out of hand. So this is how my father felt. They were serious words, but the light-hearted smile on Dad's face showed that he was joking. I glared at him, but then looked at Mama Lily. Setting aside me being like Dad. What do you propose then? Master Roxy going with Dad? I looked over at Master Roxy. 
Master Roxy hesitated. I would, but... Dad laughed and said, I'm afraid your beloved master's reputation would make that difficult. Especially considering how much she stands out. I blinked and looked at Master Roxy. What reputation? She coughed and said, I it is complicated. And involves quite a few misunderstandings. After saying that, she pursed her lips and looked away, making it clear she wasn't going to say anything else. I sighed and then looked at Mama Lily. That's what Master Roxy says. Miss Geislain is going, but I still think it's not enough. Mom hummed, twirling her blonde hair. After a while, she nodded and said, Geislain's always been good at picking the right outcome, but you're right. She and your father have always been a magnet for trouble. Dad pouted and said, That's not Dash he paused and then frowned, eyes moving as if counting something in his head. See? Mom sighed and then looked at Mama Lily. We really do need someone to buffer them in this. From what I've heard about Philip and Sorrows, they don't seem much better than Paul. She frowned and said, We really need someone with a cool head about all this. Mama Lily nodded. Yes. Which is why I will be going along with Paul. Silence. And then everyone started talking at the same time. No way. Dad crossed his arms. You can't, Lily. Mom protested. It is far too dangerous, Lily. Master Roxy frowned and shook her head. I don't want you to go and get hurt, Mama Lily. And I tried talking her down too. Mama Lily smiled and then shook her head. I appreciate the sentiments from everyone. But Paul was right in part. She frowned and said, We must probe being W's actions. If too many of us go, he will be cautious. But if we present a tempting opportunity, Master Roxy placed her right hand on her chin and said, He will take the bait. Mama Lily nodded. That is so. And in doing so, we will buy more time through delaying whatever plots he has set afoot. I shook my head. No. No way. Absolutely not. You're going to get hurt. Or worse. I will not. I stared at her and said, And what makes you so confident, Mama Lily? You might have healed from your old wounds and trained a bit more, but you're not a fighter. She nodded. This is true. But I am confident that I will be fine. How? I frowned. Do you know something we don't? Mama Lily smiled. No. But I have faith. She looked at Paul and said, My beloved husband is a person who fights the hardest when there is someone he must protect within his sights. And. She turned to look at me. My beloved Rudy is a genius who can defy even the heavens above and perform miracles. So. Why don't we try it once? Or, is my faith mistaken? I felt my heart tremble. It was there. The same as my past life. Towering expectations that I couldn't hope to meet. Not only that, but they were from the one person who I thought would never have them of me. The one who supported me unconditionally this entire time. Mama Lily was quiet, just staring at me with that soft smile. Dad clenched his fists, but he turned to look at me, not saying a word either. I glanced at him and looked at Mama Lily. And then. Fine. I decided. It would be different. I would make sure that this time would be different. With great power came great responsibility. And with that quote, there always came a death in the family. Always. But I wouldn't allow that. Not this time. So. Master Roxy. I looked at her and said, you. Me. Your bedroom tonight. Pee pee pardon. Master Roxy turned a deep red and her voice cracked. I paused, realizing how that phrasing sounded. But I ignored it and said, we're going to create an absolute defense field. And we're going to make a sword that can cut through anything. Oh. Master Roxy cleared her throat and said, of course. I stared at Dad and said, you're forbidden from dying or letting Mama Lily die. Got it? If anything happens, I'm ending this world. 
I'll become the demon god, murder everything in sight and then recreate everything. Dad laughed and said, well, I guess I'll have to work hard to prevent that, then. A light-hearted reply. But Dad's eyes were firm. Determined. Seeing that, I gave a curt nod and walked off. There were preparations to make. Live. The Depths of the Forest by Bina Village. There, Technique God Laplace knelt down beneath a tall tree and dug through the soil with his bare hands. And after scraping away a few handfuls of dirt, he pulled something out from the ground. Laplace stared at the item he dug out and muttered, Your life wasn't in vain, Rudy. As to what that item was. A small urn made with magic. And also one that had flickers of powerful mana coursing through it. Mana that seemed to not belong in that world, distorting the space and gravity around it. Holding the urn in his hands, Laplace gave it a solemn look and said, You lost everything you had, but you set things up for us to win everything back. Well, I guess you could never have predicted this would result after your trip to warn your past self, but that's what happens when mortals attempt time travel. He shook his head and then looked up at the clear blue sky. You can rest easy now. Your past self couldn't finish the job, but I will. Well, we will. Silence. There wasn't a response. But of course there wasn't. It was just a strange urn, filled with the ashes of someone long dead. At least, that should have been the case. But then a deep and bone-weary sigh echoed. When it did, the urn shattered and the ashes inside dissolved into ambient mana. Laplace watched it fade and then nodded. After that, footsteps echoed from the distance, shortly followed by a mature female voice. So you're here after all, master. Laplace looked over to see Rostalina walking towards him, wearing a gray robe. I thought I sensed you. She looked over towards the tree and then frowned. But what are you doing here? Weren't you making preparations? I am. Laplace nodded and said, There was an item here that was slowly turning the area into a dungeon, so I wanted to make sure that was settled first. Hmm? Rostalina tilted her head and said, That phenomenon wasn't from Roxy or Rudy's magic circles? It wasn't. He glanced at the tree and looked at the surrounding area. Chapter 82 Great Stress it was stupid. I still didn't see the point of why Dad and Mama Lily needed to go along to save just one girl in basically an entire different country. Family was the most important thing. Who cared about the rest of the world or innocence? Sure, it was good to help out every now and then, but to risk your neck for a complete stranger. I didn't get Dad. But I wasn't going to try and change him. The only way that someone would change would be if they decided to change for themselves. And Dad seemed to be trying at least. Wish he actually would change instead of just try, but this was the situation I had to deal with. No point complaining about it. Anyway, there were a lot of preparations to make, so I got busy with Master Roxy. I had to work really closely with her in order to make sure everything was in order. Fortunately, I had stupid amounts of mana to work with and my mana also seemed to be extremely malleable. Kind of like Master Roxy's summon. The Metal Blob. Mercy? I think that was what Master Roxy called it. Mercy could pick up random minerals, objects, and mana and amalgamate with it. Essentially take in the properties of whatever it combined with. Only for a short while though. It would be pretty broken otherwise. Ah but it didn't like my mana. When we tried giving it a bit, the spirit ran away like my mana was the plague. Maybe it had to do something with the whole potentially being the reincarnation of a demon god thing. Or just having traces of said demon god in my body? Or maybe my mana was stronger and it would assimilate mercy instead? I didn't know, but whatever the case, mercy stayed far away from me while we experimented. And as for experiments, there were two objectives. The first was a defense for Dad. I knew Dad. While he was a genius in sword fighting. Well, in just fighting in general, he also fought recklessly. He was fast and basically had the first stage of Ultra Instinct, but we couldn't rely on that. After all, he wasn't Orsted fast. I could still remember it. 
in what was essentially frozen time, that guy could move at normal speed. He was an anomaly. Orsted was basically an unbeatable boss fight. But who was to say that being W didn't have people like that in stock? This world was big. Dad was a genius, but geniuses were a dime a dozen when there were billions of people in the world. Especially when there were races other than humans and even mixed-race hybrids. Like the Sword God and Water God. Even though they weren't Orsted, I was sure of it. People on those levels. Taking each style to the extreme, the Sword God could probably move at light speed and do crazy stuff like split space. And the Water God probably had the real Ultra Instinct thing. Or maybe an absolute domain where they could control and sense every incoming attack? No, since it was water, we had to assume it was based on that. Water could flow or it could crash. It was also formless and shapeless, and it took on the form of whatever you put it in. In that case, there was probably an absolute counter where it took the incoming attack and revolved it with added force. Then there was the North God that was basically the mixed martial arts of sword fighting. But that was a rabbit hole that wouldn't end. Focus preparations. That was what we needed. Dad and Mama Lily would leave within the week, so there were seven days to work with. And during those seven days, like I thought, we needed a defense for Dad. And we also needed a strong sword for him and Mama Lily. Mostly Mama Lily. If she was going. Well, the bracelet I made for her had been upgraded with a bunch of features, but a trump card was best. And she was trained to be more of an assassin type of fighter anyway. So again, two tasks. And we had to factor in crazy BS wildcards. First, we started with the swords. Mama Lily wasn't very strong and didn't use much mana to reinforce her body, so the sword had to be light. At the same time, it was probably better for her to have it concealed. After all, no one would expect someone as beautiful as Mama Lily to be able to fight, right? And even if they did, with all the magic that would trigger from the bracelet, they would assume she was a magician and rush into attack instead of run away. Which would be the perfect time to counter. So a proper blade wouldn't do. It should be innocuous. Mundane. After a bunch of brainstorming, I remembered the story about a water nymph giving her pin to a hero to create a magic sword, so we went with that. Kind of. We still used a pin, but it didn't turn into a sword. Instead, it turned into a sword hilt. One etched with millions of magic circles that would make a composite mana slash plasma blade when activated. Also tons of magic circles with all sorts of traps for people who tried to take it away from her. We could have made the same thing for Dad, but considering his style it wouldn't work. Instead, the focus was on making a blade that could handle his mana and ridiculous improvisation. Also one that wouldn't break under high stress, like when I fought against Orsted. Which reminded me that I never did recover the pieces of my sword. But anyway, there was a simple solution for Dad's sword. Since I figured out how to compress my mana into a magic stone to use as ammo against Orsted, I just applied the same logic to make a hyper-compressed mana sword out of ambient mana. The result was an ominous-looking crimson sword that seemed like something Mira Mesa would make, but it was definitely sturdy enough. It also really didn't like other mana and repelled it like a magnet. Which reminded me again that I needed to do more research into the fundamental nature of mana still. But those were finished. Now came the hard part. How do you make an absolute defense? Live. Sylphie stared through the window at Rudy pulling his hair and scribbling into a notebook. Rudy's still at it? A bratty female voice echoed from behind. Eris walked over, her arms crossed. Her crimson hair trailed behind her as she did, along with the coattails of the haphazard fur coat she made to copy Guy Slane. Sylphie resisted the urge to scold Eris for talking about Rudy so casually. Instead, she just nodded and looked back at Rudy. That's right. It seems like he's stuck on a hard problem. They were outside the other house. The new one that Sylphie helped Rudy and Miss Roxy build a while back. It was late in the afternoon. The day had mostly come and gone, and most of that was spent indoors for Rudy. Like always, it seemed as if Sylphie's best friend. No. 
not just best friend. Rudy was the one she liked the most and made her happy, just like she made him happy. But right now, he seemed really frustrated. Through the window, Sylphie saw Roxy walk over to Rudy and then peer over his shoulder, staring at the diagrams. She ruffled Rudy's white hair with a gentle smile and then started tapping certain parts of the diagram, making some suggestions Sylphie couldn't hear. Ugh. Eris shook her head and said, I still don't get how he can sit down for so long. My eyes would be spinning just looking at that stuff. Sylphie looked away from Rudy and stared at Eris. That's because all you can think about is sword fighting. Eris puffed her chest out and nodded. That's right. And I'm the best at it. Only because all you do is train. Sylphie frowned and said, Have you even played with Norn or Aisha recently? Eris huffed. I try. But those two brats keep making fun of me. Sylphie blinked. How? Norn and Aisha were still toddlers. They were smart and Eris did have a lot of flaws to poke fun at, but... Actually, Aisha was smart enough to notice those sorts of things. And she definitely had a little mean streak to her. And Norn, as the responsible big sister, would go along with Aisha and protect her. Eris pouted and said, Aisha keeps calling me a muscle head. What even is that? My head isn't made of muscles. Isn't it stupid? Sylphie's mouth twitched, but she did her best to not let it show. I it is a bit ridiculous. Right? Eris looked proud and said, I knew you'd get it, Sylphie. Now come on. She grabbed Sylphie's hand and said, Let's go fight some monsters in the forest. Sylphie glanced at Rudy and hummed. I guess some magic stones would be useful for Rudy. Oh, yeah. I guess we could remember to get some for him too. But let's go. Eris jumped up and down and said, If you fly us there, we can go and be back before dark. Sylphie blinked and tilted her head, staring at Eris. Eris stared back. What? Nothing, Eris. Sylphie let out a warm smile and said, Hold on tight, okay? Rudy would be sad if you got hurt. Oh. Okay then. Eris hugged Sylphie tighter. And with that, the two flew into the air. Eris screamed and hugged Sylphie a bit tighter still. For a split second, Sylphie considered causing an accident. It would be so easy to just say she didn't know what happened. And since Eris liked Sylphie now after all Sylphie did for her, Sylphie would never get blamed for it. And if Rudy got sad, Sylphie could cheer him up about it too. But that would be mean. And besides, even if Eris was annoying, bratty, and took everything for granted, she really liked Sylphie for some reason. And Sylphie didn't want to hurt someone who really liked her. Even still. Maybe Eris was just stupid? It seemed like she had completely forgot about the past between them just because Sylphie said some nice things and showed her some magic. Oh well. It just meant that if Eris liked Sylphie more, Sylphie didn't have to worry about Eris stealing Rudy's time with Sylphie. Now, her Rudy was working hard so Sylphie should work hard to bring him something nice, right? Maybe they should go hunt down some terminate boars so they could grill some meat and have fun with a campfire. Chapter 83 Conversations Rue! Bubble? Norn stared at me with wide green eyes, giving me a shy smile. Aisha nodded her head next to Norn and grinned. Big bro! Magic! Magic! I blinked and then looked over at the person who brought them over. What? Dad crossed his arms, leaning against the door frame. Too good to play with your baby sisters? Of course not. I held out my hand and made a small water ball before handing it over to Norn. She giggled and held it in her hands, easily manipulating the mana in it. Pwede! Aisha clapped her hands and said, Big sis, cool. Hee hee. I still had many questions about why Norn could handle mana so easily. But that was a later problem. I glanced out the window. It was dark now, no, not completely. There was a small fire glowing outside on the plains. Master Roxy with Sylphie and Eris. Guyslane was there too, and chopping up a giant pig? 
That much time passed, huh? You're doing the thing again, Rudy. I blinked and looked at Dad. That's because I have to use a lot of brain power to try and figure out your problems, Dad. Norn handed the water ball off to Aisha and then looked at me. Rui Pobim? I ruffled her hair and said, Don't worry, Norn. Big Brother's just thinking. Norn furrowed her brow, as if she was trying hard to figure out what I said. But then she slowly nodded and said, K. She definitely didn't understand. But it was cute, so it didn't really matter. I looked back at Dad and said, What are you guys doing here anyway? Was Mom and Mama Lily worried about me or something? Yes, and yes. Also Norn and Aisha missed their big brother so we came by to say hi. I winced. Yeah. I had been kind of holing up in my room for a while now. I sighed and then looked at Norn and Aisha playing catch. Maybe I do need a break. Dad nodded. Even geniuses like us need time off, you know? I rolled my eyes and said, You take too much time off, Dad. Better that than not enough and missing out on my lovely kids growing up, right? I gave Dad a blank stare and then sighed. You are raising so many death flags. Death Dash Dad blinked and said, What are those? Don't worry about it. I stood up and did some stretching. After that, I looked outside and said, I'm guessing they're doing a little barbecue or something? Mmm, Dad nodded and said, Looks like Eris and Sylphie worked hard to get some meat to grill for our hard-working genius. I watched Sylphie accidentally turn a slab of meat into charcoal with a blast of fire and sighed. Well, I guess I've been working hard enough for the day. And I was still stuck on trying to make some defense equipment for Dad. It couldn't be too heavy since his main style was Sword God which relied on fast speeds. But if it was too light then it'd be pointless. Unless it was made out of some mana mesh that would protect that? Ooh, that was an idea. Maybe. Before I could finish my thought, my world suddenly turned on its end. Dad, lifting me up and tossing me over his shoulder. Hey! I squirmed and said, let me down. No can do. Dad turned back and said, right, girls? Your big brother's been working too hard, so we need to have some fun. Rue. Strong. No scare, okay? Big bro play. I want to see more magic. It seemed like Norn got a misunderstanding and Aisha was way too focused on magic. But whatever. I could use a rest. Though. Man. Dad started walking out of the room with me and said, You're pretty heavy though, Rudy. What have you been eating? Don't tell me you've been skipping meals? I eat lunch with the others every now and then. And I get some snacks too. I think. Sylphie popped in every now and then with random treats when she was over. And Eris rambled on about random stuff before leaving bowls of food for me too when Sylphie didn't. So I was fed properly. Was it a bad thing that I didn't remember what I ate though? Dad sighed. Live. Rudy! Sylphie ran up and hugged my arm. Smiling, she said, Did you come to eat with us? I scratched the back of my head and let out a wry smile. I couldn't just leave you guys alone when you're doing such a good job cooking. Eris walked over and crossed her arms, huffing. About time you showed up. For someone who's supposed to be smart and good at fighting, you really don't know what's good for you. We were outside. Or rather, my dad tossed me on the ground after we left the house and I booked it before he did anything more embarrassing. Sylphie looked at Eris and giggled. Rudy can be kind of dumb sometimes, right? Eris nodded. Right. Aren't boys supposed to help girls out? I shrugged and said, I believe in gender equality. It's not like you're any better than me. Eris instantly glowered and pointed at me. You're only better because you're faster. Your sword techniques suck. I won't deny that. But who needs technique when you have raw ability? If I could see attacks coming and block them before they hit, it didn't really matter if I knew how to do it properly or not, right? It wasn't like I was trying to be a magic swordsman anyway. That was Dad's thing. 
I hate you. Eris glared at me. I waved my hand and said, You're not very endearing yourself, princess. Fix that attitude of yours and we might get along. Eris's eyes widened and she started tearing up. Sylphie tugged my arm and said, Be nice. Eris is trying hard too. I sighed and ran my hand through my hair. Right. I looked at Eris, put on my best puppy dog look, and said, Sorry, Eris. Aw. Eris blinked a lot and then frowned. Aye aye. This time. She averted her gaze and said, Only because Sylphie asked you. Huh. Needed to keep that tidbit in mind. Maybe my puppy dog face leveled up. Master Roxy cleared her throat and said, Are you three going to just keep talking over there? She looked up from the fire nearby. Guy Slane was sitting nearby too. That's right. If we want to eat, we should all help in cooking this before it spoils. Eris walked over and said, How am I supposed to help anyway? I don't know how to cook. Guy Slane pointed to the boar carcass behind her and a giant ice platter with cuts of meat. Practice your cutting technique. But Guy Slane can do it really fast. Which is why you should practice. Eris sighed and walked over. In the meantime, I walked over to Master Roxy and stared at her grilling the meat. Mostly at the slightly burnt and overcooked kebabs next to her. She noticed me staring and her ears turned red. W what? It's edible. Sylphie nodded. It's better than what I did. Master Roxy patted Sylphie's head and said, It's fine, Sylphie. You didn't know that cooking takes time. Sylphie pouted and said, It doesn't make sense. Why can't it cook faster if we use hotter fire? I plopped down beside Sylphie and said, Because cooking isn't about the fire or heat, but about the thing changing with the heat. And the change can only go so fast. Cooking was just a complicated series of chemical reactions, after all. And those required certain parameters and time, along with certain energy levels. Adding too much energy would just trigger a different chemical reaction, a la charcoal. Sylphie picked up a skewer of raw meat and looked thoughtful. I got a sudden bad feeling and said, Sylphie no. She flinched and looked away, feigning innocence. I wasn't going to try anything, Rudy. Trying to speed up cooking with magic is no good. You might create something the world isn't prepared to fight. Master Roxy nodded and looked at Sylphie. Rudy's right. There are instances where scraps of meat or bones left in dungeons have turned into monsters. If you make a mistake, you could create a terrifying monster, Sylphie. Mph, fine. Sylphie held her skewer out to the fire. This is annoying though. At that time, Dad jogged onto the scene with Aisha clinging onto his head and Norn held in his arms. Aisha let out a happy giggle, clearly excited by the speed while Norn was wide equals eyed in terror. I sighed. Live. After sorting out a bunch of things and scolding Dad for being reckless with my baby sisters again, we all huddled around the campfire and relaxed. A few makeshift stone chairs, some soft-woven grass mats for Aisha and Norn to play on, and we were good. Eris sat next to Guy Slane, both happily chewing on some kebabs. Dad sat with a few kebabs of his own while Norn and Aisha sat on the mats beside him, blearily staring into the fire. And then there was me, sitting next to Master Roxy and Sylphie. I nibbled on my kebab and frowned. I still didn't get why we couldn't just stay like this. Or why Dad had to go out of his way to another country for some plan. The pros just kept getting outweighed in my head the more I thought about it. Guy Slane glanced at Dad and said, Paul. It seems like your kid's not enjoying the food. Are his taste buds messed up or something? Dad laughed and said, Nah. He's still just thinking about the trip. I frowned and took a bite out of my kebab. It was a bit dry, more like jerky than anything else. But it tasted pretty good. I just couldn't really enjoy it because of what Dad said. Eris finished her kebab and grabbed another. As she did though, she looked at Guy Slane and said, Why do you have to go, Guy Slane? Did Grandpa and Dad really need you to go along too? Paul is just as strong as you, isn't he? 
Dad puffed out his chest and said, I'm stronger. Guy Slane chuckled and said, For now. But we'll see later. She rolled her shoulders and said, I've been considering revisiting North God techniques, so we'll see how you fare after I do a bit more training. Dad's eyes lit up and he grinned, seeming eager. And then a groggy Aisha smacked his leg. Duh. No play wolf lady. Dad flinched and he let out a nervous laugh. I, I wasn't thinking anything like that, Aisha. Tell him mommy. Big sis tell too. Norn blinked and looked over, confused. Tell mommy? Un. K. Dad groaned. Eris laughed and stuck her thumb up towards Norn and Aisha. That's right. Go tell on your creepy dad. Aisha nodded and said, K auntie. Eris froze. PFT. I bit back my laugh. Sylphie didn't though. She giggled and then said, I, I see what you mean, Eris. Eris's face turned as red as her hair and she looked away, going back to eating. Guy Slane shook her head and spoke up again. Anyway. She looked at Eris and said, I have to go to make sure this guy doesn't get wrapped up in anything too dangerous. It turns out that he's more of a muscle brain than I am. Hey! Dad spoke up and said, I'm not a muscle brain. I just don't like thinking. I groaned and said, even as a joke, you shouldn't say that, Dad. Oh. Right. He rubbed the back of his head and said, I'll be more careful, Rudy. Asterisk, please star. Especially if you're going to be dealing with nobles. I paused. Unless you changed your mind about me helping with Dash. No means no, Rudy. Dad turned serious and he said, Killing is no good. Aisha blearily waved her hand in the air and said, Yeah. Big bro no kill. Norn tilted her head and looked at Aisha. Kill bad? Aisha's head bobbed up and down. Yeah. Kill bad. Hurt better. I glared at Dad. Sylphie did the same. Alone with Eris and Master Roxy. Guy Slane laughed. Dad held up his hands. T that wasn't me. I didn't teach them that. Aisha nodded. Umechim. Mommy say. What in the world is Mama Lily teaching Aisha? Or has she been overhearing Mom talk to Mama Lily? Since it was getting tense, I decided to change the subject. Anyway. I still think this is a terrible idea, but we've gotten most of the equipment finished for you and Mama Lily. I paused and then looked at Guy Slane. I didn't really think about it until now, but did you need some too, Guy Slane? Being W seemed to be targeting mostly my family, but considering how much time Guy Slane had been spending here. She waved her hand and said, It's fine. She patted the sword at her side and said, This will be more than enough. She glanced at Dad and said, Unlike Paul, I have a keen sense for danger. I can't deny that. Dad sighed and then shook his head. Turning towards me, he said, I'm counting on you to keep everyone safe, Rudy. And you too, Roxy. Make sure Rudy doesn't go overboard. Master Roxy nodded her head and said, Leave it to me, Paul. I will ensure my disciple doesn't erase the Fedoa region by the time you return. I frowned and said, I wouldn't do that. I like this place. Master Roxy placed her hand on my head and said, Then behave and don't go overboard. Or rely on your superhuman transformation. I felt my face heat up and said, W who told you about that? I could have sworn I didn't tell anyone about me calling that demon god form superhuman. Sylphie giggled. I stared at her in shock. Sylphie shrugged. It was cute. And you still talk in your sleep. I groaned. Laughter filled the air. Well, I guess it was better than worrying all the time. Time passed again. Since I was so busy researching how to keep Dad and Mama Lily safe, the days went by in a blur. Miss Rose and Miss Rostalina practically moved into play with Norn and Aisha and helped Mom watch them. Also to keep an eye on Mom in case something happened with her pregnancy. 
Apparently, she was already past the first trimester and well into the second, so Mama Lily was worried about that since she would be gone. Miss Rostalina had a lot of experience though, and Miss Rose would be there to help out. Sylphie and Eris were getting along well. It seemed like Sylphie's kindness won over even that bratty and arrogant girl. Well, it seemed like my first impression of Eris might have been a bit wrong too since she did seem to be nice and caring since Norn and Aisha liked her. That and she also barged in to check on me. Still didn't really like her though. Though I guess I didn't really spend much time with her either, so I couldn't say that I knew her enough to judge her. Not really important though. All that did was that she was getting along with Sylphie. Well enough that Sylphie even started teaching Eris a bit of magic, although Eris didn't seem to have any talent at all except for a bit of fire magic. Anyway, time passed and the preparations were finished. And then it was time to see everyone off. Early in the morning, me, Mom, and Master Roxy stood outside of the first house and faced the carriage waiting there. Dad helped Mama Lily into the carriage where Guy Slain was already waiting. After that, he hopped on the horse leading the carriage and turned back to wave at me. You be good now, Rudy. Mama Lily turned to look at me as well and let out a reassuring smile. Worry not, Rudy. I will make sure that your father does nothing idiotic. Beside me, my mom sighed and said, Just come back safe, okay? She looked up at everyone and said, If things get even the slightest bit dangerous. She looked at Guy Slain and said, I want you to get them out of there. Okay, Laney? Guy Slain smiled and said, Don't worry, Zenith. I'll bring them both back safe. I nodded and said, You better. Master Roxy bobbed my head. Ow! I frowned. What was that for? Threats are bad. It wasn't a threat. It was a promise. Ha! Huh. Master Roxy sighed and looked at my dad. You know how to utilize the magic tools? Dad patted the dark red sword at his side and then showed off the silver ring on his left hand. I got it, Roxy. She looked to Mama Lily. And you? Mama Lily nodded as well and said, I have practiced. There will be no issues. Silence. And then Dad nodded. All right. Then, we'll be off. At the latest, we'll get back by the start of fall. Mom let out a joking smile and said, You'd better hurry. It'd be embarrassing if our new child got here before you returned. Dad smiled back. That would be embarrassing. Guess I need to hurry then, huh? Be safe, Paul. And you too, Lily. After that and another round of farewells, they were off. And then it was just me, Mom, and Master Roxy. Watching them shrink into the distance, I muttered, I still think this is stupid. Mom sighed and patted my head. I know, Rudy. But there's no talking your dad out of something he's decided. And he's decided to do this. Which I think is the dumbest thing in the world. Like, why? Master Roxy hummed. I don't agree with it, but I suppose I can see why. Huh? I looked at Master Roxy and said, Is there something I'm missing? Master Roxy nodded. There is. And the answer to that question is you. Me? I blinked. What does this have to do with me? I mean, I get Dad's moral point and concerns about us being trapped in Bina Village out of fear, but we were going to do that anyway, right? And if there really are bad guys, why not just go murder them all and purge the corrupt nobles? I didn't get it. It was such an obvious solution. And if not that, then go team up with Orsted to do it. There were just so many more options. Besides, bad guys didn't respond to respect or kind words. Fear was the only language they understood, so we might as well make an example to set them straight. Master Roxy and Mom shared a look. I blinked and then frowned. Hey! I thought we agreed to no silent conversations. Mom smiled and patted my head. Sorry, Rudy. It's just, both your master and I think you might be missing something important. And what's that? How all lives matter. 
that it's important to be a good person? To set an example for other people? I frowned and said, why should I care about people I don't know? Mom let out an exasperated sigh. This is what I get for not teaching me Lisa's words. What? Mom gave me a stern look and grabbed my hand. Come on, Rudy. It's about time your mother taught you some proper manners. I know manners. Not enough if you're talking back to me, young man. TCH Chapter 84, Know You A wooden sword blurred, trying to smack my head. I stepped back and parried it with one of my own before stepping in with a stab. My attack was parried as well, and then my attacker leaped back, clearing the space. Eris clicked her tongue and scowled at me. It's not fair. She stomped on the ground and pointed her sword at me. You're only beating me because you're faster. I shrugged and said, the whole point of the sword god style is speed, so it doesn't really master if my form's sloppy, right? Eris stopped to think about that. Wait. Before I could react properly, there was a flash of silver by Eris's feet and she crossed the distance, her sword flying up at an awkward angle. My eyes widened and I leaned back, barely dodging the strike. And then she spun around to kick me, whipping her leg around just as fast as the sword. Oi! I threw myself back with a gust of wind and then pointed my sword at Eris. What the heck has my dad been teaching you? That's not sword fighting. Eris spun around a few times, her momentum leaving her dizzy. But then she shook her head and gave me a smug look. Ha! I made you use magic. I win! Sure. You win. I sighed and rubbed my nose. After that, I took a look around. Everyone was busy today, is what I would like to say. But the truth was that I had snuck off by myself. Of course, it was just my luck that I got caught by Eris and forced into sparring practice. She dragged me all the way to the fields by the forest and tossed me a wooden sword before starting a fight. Even so, that was better than the alternative. Ever since Dad left, Mom had been ranting various scripture to me from the Melee's religion or whatever. The usual thou shalt treat thy neighbor with kindness stuff like in the Bible. Except, unlike in the Bible where the words came from God and had a theme of self-sacrifice, the Melee's religion was just based off a master swordsman who killed some demon lord or whatever. Apparently, since they were words that came from some strong guy who saved a bunch of people, they were supposed to mean something. Seriously. All it meant was that strength was power. And going by that logic, if I went to kill a giant monster or something, I could say whatever I wanted and it would be treated as gospel truth. I mean, they were good moral guidelines. But morality was overrated anyway. They were just shackles that made the strong act according to what the weak thought. There was no good and evil, only power and those who were too weak to seek it. Social constructs created as a check to those whose society deemed as threats to the social order. What mattered was what you did with that power. Are you ignoring me again? A sudden shout broke me out of my thoughts. Eris growled and crossed her arms. I don't get it. Am I really that boring? Or do you just hate me or something? What did I ever do to you? I blinked and said, hate is a very strong word. But yes, I don't really like you. She was technically family but she was also someone who just got plopped into the happy family life we had already. And if not for her, we would all still be doing just fine. Or at least, life would be less complicated. Eris flinched and her lower lip started trembling. But she stepped forward anyway and said, W.L. I don't like you either. Sylphie's much nicer to me. I nodded. I agree. She's really patient and kind. I just don't have the capacity to deal with someone like you. Kappa what? Eris furrowed her brow and said, Stop using complicated words to make fun of me. I blinked. Aren't you older than me? And a proper noble? How do you not know what capacity means? Eris huffed and said, Why are you pretending to be an adult? Isn't it boring sitting and reading all day? Is this how a kid usually acts? I frowned and placed my hand on my chin. Maybe I was mistaken on something. 
Could it be that dad's genes just gave birth to geniuses or something? Norn and Aisha were much smarter than the average two-year-olds and I was, well, me. I didn't think I was a genius since Norn and Aisha seemed to be following on similar tracks as me while not being reincarnated, but seeing Eris now. Sylphie was smart, so I thought that most people around my age were like that. But maybe we were special? No way. I was a hundred percent sure that anyone else from Earth in my situation would be able to do what I did. Right? Then again, I had always been pretty smart. I think. The exact details were blurry, but I remembered being able to easily pass exams and everything with just attending class. And it was only after I stopped showing up to class that grades started to slip. H.M. Still not sure if I was a genius, but I guess I was definitely gifted. Stop that. Eris's voice broke me out of my thoughts again. I blinked and said, Stop what? She pointed at me and said, That. You stopped talking and ignored me again. Ah. I shrugged and said, It's a bad habit. I'm not trying to ignore you. Considering her personality, I couldn't even if I wanted to. Eris pouted and then crossed her arms together. I still don't get it. Why does Dad want me to marry someone like you anyway? My ears perked up at that and I quickly crossed the space to grab her hand. You don't want it either, right? Great. Let's dissolve the contract then. Since you don't like me, it's a win-win, right? Eris's face suddenly turned red and she quickly backed up, wrenching her hand back. W.W. What are you doing? Don't grab me so suddenly like that. Oh. Right. I laughed and rubbed the back of my head. Sorry. I got a little excited. Damn it. Wasn't going to be that easy, huh? Eris frowned and then said, Do you not want to marry me that bad? Hmm? I blinked and said, What do you mean? Eris's frown deepened and she said, I apologize to Sylphie. I play with Norn and Aisha. And I get along with everyone. But, why don't you like me? I blinked again and said, I mean, it's not that I don't like you, but dash. But you said it. Eris stepped forward and glared at me. You said you don't like me earlier. I said I don't really like you. Not that I don't like you. I stared at Eris and said, I mean, I think our personality types just don't match. I hadn't spent much time just chatting with Eris. In fact, this was pretty much the first time I got alone with her since she got here. From what I could see, though, she was impatient, stubborn, and quick to anger. She also had a habit of acting first and thinking later. Not only that, but I could see that she was physically resisting against lashing out when she was angry. Like she had to visibly hold herself back. Granted, she wasn't all bad. She was definitely hardworking considering how she spent as much time swinging her sword around as I did studying. And she got along with Sylphie and my younger sisters, like she said. That, plus considering how even Mom seemed to be warming up to Eris meant that there were parts of her I didn't know. Like Dad said, she was probably a good girl if you got to know her. I just, didn't really want to know her? Eris flinched and bit her lips. We don't match. I nodded and said, I mean, take right now. You're the one who dragged me out here, weren't you? I frowned and said, I just wanted some peace and quiet for myself, but you grabbed me and made me spar with you. T that's. My frown deepened and I said, do you want to show that you're better than me that much? Because you are, you know? H huh? Eris blinked, confusion in her red eyes. I sighed and ran my hand through my hair. Honestly, what's with all the geniuses around me? Are people stealing my talents or something? Or am I radiating experience buffs? Everyone that I had met seemed to either be a genius or suddenly improve. Just a bit of advice and help from me and boom, instantly stronger, smarter, or faster. Eris glared at me. I blinked. What? Don't do that. Don't do what? I frowned, confused. Thinking out loud? No! You keep saying that you're not a genius. 
Do you think the rest of us are that stupid? No. I'm saying that everyone else seems to be a natural genius except for me. Like you. I pointed at Eris and said, just earlier, I said something and then you suddenly got better. It just clicked for you and then you could do it. That's a natural genius, you know? I have to actually think about each and everything thing I do. Eris stomped on the ground and said, that's what a genius does. I nodded. I know. And I agree. A genius just gets it. Eris gave me a blank stare and then got really angry. Gnashing her teeth, she said, You, you're making fun of me. But I'm not. She grabbed her wooden sword and jabbed me with it. You are. You think it's fun pretending to be dumb like that? I blinked and said, I really don't know what you're talking about. What do you mean, pretend to be dumb? Eris glared at me, staring into my eyes. But then she blinked and lowered her sword, looking confused. Huh? Don't huh me. I frowned and said, What do you mean I'm pretending to be dumb? I mean, I was kind of doing that a bit with Master Roxy since it would make things awkward, but I didn't think I was doing it with anything or anyone else. Eris blinked and then said, You. Do you not know what a genius is? Of course I do. I rolled my eyes and said, It's someone who's naturally good at something. A genius. Like how you're naturally good at the sword. Eris's face turned a bit red, but then she shook her head and said, You're doing it again. Doing what? I frowned, starting to feel a bit frustrated. Eris pointed at me and said, You're a genius. No. You're a genius. I'm just smart. That's a genius. I frowned and said, Being smart doesn't make you a genius. But you're not just smart. Eris kept pointing at me and said, Rudy can look at something and figure out how it works. Fighting, magic, even the big things the adults talk about. Well, yeah. I nodded and said, But that doesn't make me a genius. Anyone can do it. I can't. Hmm, true. But Sylphie can. Because you've been friends with her for a long time. I paused. Now that Eris mentioned it, I did talk about a bunch of random things with Sylphie when we first met. And I did make sure to keep her curious and question a bunch of things, but she was already pretty mature. Plus, she doesn't count. She's a half-elf. Right. I bet there was some magical DNA thing going on that helped with that maturity of hers. Eris growled and said, Why are you like this? Stupid. Idiot. Dummy. I rolled my eyes. What? Since I don't think I'm a genius, I'm suddenly dumb? Eris spun around and ran off. Why do I even think you're cool anyway? Wait, what? I'm telling your mom you ran away. W wait. I ran after Eris. We can talk about this. No! You're stupid. I don't want to talk to you anymore. Fine, I'm a genius. Please don't tell Dash. Miss Zenith. Rudy's over here. Arg! I ran my hand through my hair and said, See. This is why we can't get along. Freaking bipolar tsundras. Definitely needed to spread mental health awareness and train some therapists in the future to fix this. Chapter 85 Concerned Mother Zenith absently hung up some sheets to dry. It was another peaceful day. But even so, Zenith couldn't enjoy it. Not after yesterday when Rudy ran away in the middle of Zenith telling the story of St. Melee's and then had to be dragged back by Eris. She was sure of it now. Something was wrong with Rudy. At first, Zenith thought that it was just the shock from everything that happened since Paul's dumb mistake. Then she thought it was just because her baby boy was growing up. And then she thought it might be due to the supposed demon god influence Roxy mentioned, but it wasn't that. Zenith knew. Her mother's intuition told her that something was wrong with her son and that it wasn't natural. It wasn't anything bad. At most, he was acting like a rebellious child should in running away from her lectures and spending the day doing what he liked. But even then, 
he made sure to take care of his baby sisters, play with Sylphie, and even start to get along with Eris. And he was studious as well, continuing to study magic with Roxy in the evening. On the surface, nothing was wrong. But Zenith could see it in the way he talked and responded to Melis's teachings that she recited. When Zenith told the story of St. Melis and the teachings he passed down, Rudy brushed it off and said there was no need to follow the words of someone who was just strong and good with a sword. A complete rejection. Not only that, but Rudy said that St. Melis only had the right to say those words because he was strong. Instead of being enthralled with the story like he used to be, Rudy had completely ignored Zenith. And not only that, these days he was spending a lot of time out of the house and away from Zenith. He came back during meal times and acted normally then. But if Zenith brought up even a suggestion about discussing Melis's teaching, Rudy blocked her out. She could see it. The way his usually bright face turned stony and his emerald eyes turned sharp. Was it the way she brought up the teachings? Zenith thought that might be the case, but she told Melis's teachings through story and his heroic feats, similar to how she told him Perugius's tale in the past. So it wasn't anything on her part. Zenith thought that he might simply be upset at Paul's actions. But that wasn't it either. Her genius son wasn't someone who would just throw away another person's opinion like that. He was caring and compassionate. Someone who carefully thought about the others around him and did his best to make sure everyone was happy and got along. So then why had he changed so much? Zenith knew. The Rudy who set the plan to keep their family together would never have said it was fine to abandon a girl who would suffer a terrible fate. And considering how he risked his life to save Sylphie, he was being a hypocrite as well in saying that. And it was bad enough that even Paul had sensed it. Before they left with Geislain, Paul and Lily had a talk with Zenith about the reasoning behind the departure. Paul thought that Rudy was taking life too lightly. That being in Bina Village all this time without seeing the broader world had resulted in him seeing everyone outside of his family as worthless. Because of that, Paul wanted to set an example of how one person could make a big difference. Zenith and Lily didn't agree. After all, if it was just that, then all it would take would be a reminder about how Rudy had saved Sylphie for no reason as well. And that conversation went nowhere. Still, Lily felt that Rudy was being crippled by fear that they would be hurt. That he had changed because of anxiety, so she wanted to go with Paul and return safely to prove that there was nothing to fear. And also to trust in his abilities to keep them safe. That reasoning was one that the three parents could agree on. If Rudy was acting that way and being so callous because he was driven by wanting to protect his family, then having concrete proof that they would be fine should be enough. But now that Paul and Lily had left, and now that Zenith spent time watching Rudy interact with the others, she was sure that it wasn't just that. Rudy was worried. From how hard he was studying and the number of magic experiments he ran, it was clear that he was worried he would fall short. And to prevent that, he was scrambling to become as strong as he could get. If it was just that, Zenith could accept it. But Rudy was still off. He was super protective of Norn and did his best to carefully teach her whatever he could. Reading, writing, magic, even swordsmanship. When Rudy was with Norn, he was patient and doting. The perfect and kind older brother. With Aisha, though, Rudy was a bit more distant. He still doted on her, but Rudy seemed to be subconsciously favoring Norn. And while he taught her just like Norn, he didn't go into as much detail. As if he expected Aisha to understand with just a brief explanation. Which she did, considering how smart Aisha was, but even then it came off as negligent. Like Rudy was purposefully trying to not get too attached. At the same time, Rudy talked up Paul. Zenith knew that Rudy was close to his father. That much could be seen from how Rudy forgave Paul even after all his blunders. But even then, when Aisha asked questions about Paul, Rudy would go out of his way to paint him in the best light possible. Which would lead to Aisha asking Zenith questions about Paul to confirm what Rudy said. It was odd. Rudy's actions didn't match what they should be. With how close Rudy was to Lily. As much as Zenith didn't want to admit it, Rudy should be doting on Aisha over Norn. After all, 
Lily was the one who believed in Rudy and first noticed he was different. She was also the one who gave him the freedom to live as he wanted without any expectations. And yet Rudy was treating Aisha the exact opposite, expecting Aisha to be a genius and trying to make her believe her father was the best. It didn't match up. Rudy wasn't like that. Not her Rudy. If anything, Rudy would have treated both of his sisters the same, showering them both with love and affection. And while he was definitely doing that, he was doing that more with Norn. Was it because he felt guilty about making Zenith worry so much in the past by spending time with Lily? Zenith thought it might be that, but instead, it seemed more like he was worried that Norn might not like him and was acting to make sure that didn't happen. To be the best brother and one Norn could always rely on. It didn't make sense. Even if he was worried about that, Rudy was the one who helped during Norn's delivery. And according to Lily, he was the first person who got the chance to hold Norn, casting healing magic to make sure she was healthy. And Norn seemed to be subconsciously aware of that considering how the first person she turned to was always Rudy. So Rudy should know. Norn adored her big brother already and would never hate him. But he kept acting like he expected that to change at any moment. Not only that, Rudy didn't smile anymore. He had always been a serious child, but these days he seemed much older. Almost like a dour old man who believed the entire world was against him. The only times he relaxed was when he was with his sisters, Sylphie, and half the time with Eris. At least, when he wasn't bickering with her about inane topics. But even then, the bright and cheerful smile he used to have was gone. Coin for your thoughts, Zinni? Zenith flinched and spun around. As she did, she lost her balance, starting to tip. Careful there. Thin but firm arms held Zenith close and steady her. Elina lies no, Rostalina. The beautiful elf woman smiled and said, Being active is good and all, but you should be careful about the little one in your belly, you know? Leave the chores to me and Rose. Zenith sighed and said, I know. But... Doing chores helps calm my mind. Saying that, Zenith started to squat to pick up another sheet from a basket full of wet laundry. Bad Zenny. Rostalina grabbed Zenith before she could grab any sheets and pulled her back up. After that, she gently patted Zenith's belly and said, Squatting is dangerous when you're this far along. Trust me. Zenith frowned. But then she sighed and said, Fine. After that, she brushed off Rostalina's arm and looked around. The sun was high in the sky and in the distant Zenith could see Rudy sparring with Sylphie and Eris. And from inside the house, Zenith could hear the sounds of cooking. No doubt Rose, preparing lunch for everyone. Zenith turned to look at Rostalina and said, Are Norn and Aisha napping? Mmechim. Rostalina nodded and said, those cute babies got tired out after I told them some stories and went straight to sleep. Zenith smiled and said, Thank you again for helping to take care of them, Lena. She sighed and looked back at Rudy and the others. I'm not sure how I would handle things without your help. She looked back at Rostalina and said, Roxy and Rose are nice, but it's really reassuring to have someone as you around to help. Rostalina smiled back and said, It's the least I could do for one of my closest friends, Zenny. She pulled Zenith into a one-armed hug and said, Don't mention it, all right? Just relax and make sure to stay healthy so you can deliver another cute baby for me to dote on, all right? Zenith laughed and said, I'll do my best. Rostalina nodded and then waved her hand. As she did, the ground stirred before grass grew and lays together, forming a comfy chair. Then have a seat and relax. I'll take care of the laundry. Zenith did so. But as she sat down, she frowned and said, Since when can you use magic so well? Rostalina pulled a sheet out of the basket and hung it up on the laundry line. As she did, she shrugged and said, It came naturally to me after I reunited with my master. Zenith rested her hands over her belly and said, You never did mention who this mysterious master of yours is, Lena. Or why you call him that? Rostalina giggled and said, It's a long story, Zenny. She pulled out some shirts from the basket and started hanging those. I'll tell you. 
Hmm, let's say after Paul gets back. But forget about me for now. She glanced back at Zenith from over her shoulder and said, What's got you so upset to get up and do laundry to calm down, Zinny? Didn't you hate doing it in the past? Zenith smiled and said, Like I said, doing chores helps me to calm down. And I'm a mother now. It would be a bad example for my kids if I hated them, wouldn't it? Hmm. Rostalina hung up some pants and said, I don't think liking chores has anything to do with being a good parent, but sure. Now, what's troubling you, Zenny? She turned around and said, Is it Paul? Lily? Zenith shook her head. It's neither of those. She looked off in the distance and said, I'm worried about Rudy. Rudy? Rostalina turned to look at him and hummed. I suppose he does seem extra serious for a kid. Should I try to get him to loosen up? Zenith's eyes turned sharp and she said, No, Lena. Rostalina held up her hands and said, Relax. I'm a taken woman now. And even if I wasn't, I like real men, not boys. But I do know how to calm children down. Zenith looked skeptical, but she slowly nodded. If you say so. It's the truth. Besides, the only man who can satisfy me these days is Ah. Rostalina cleared her throat and said, Sorry about that. We can talk about the dirty stuff later. Anyway, if you're worried about Rudy, I think I know how to cheer him up. Zenith shook her head. It's not a matter of being cheered up, Lena. She looked back at Rudy and furrowed her brows. Something's wrong with him. I just know it. But I don't know what's wrong or how to help him. She sighed. But maybe I'm just imagining things. Rostalina turned to look back at Rudy before her crimson eyes turned sharp. No. You should always trust your mother's intuition. And. H.M. He didn't mention this, but I guess he thought I could fix it. Lena? Rostalina smiled and then patted her chest. Leave it to me, Zenny. I'll have Rudy back to normal in no time. But for now. She lifted a pair of lacy black panties from the basket and said, Do you really want to hang these out to dry, or... Zenith blushed. Chapter 86 Poison Pill Tactic I stared at the magic circles written out on the paper in front of me and then let out a deep sigh. After that, I flicked my hand, sending them to join the rest of the failed diagrams in the corner of the room. It was, probably noon, considering the sunlight. Mom had stopped bothering me about her religion and today I managed to have time devoted to just me. While it was nice teaching Norn and playing with Aisha, I needed some me time too. Sylphie understood that and had tactfully taken Eris off to play. And Master Roxy was out on patrol as usual. Which meant I had time to gather my thoughts and focus on research. I could feel it. And after seeing my mana shift into the demon god's mana, at least, seemingly shift. I still wasn't entirely sure if it was Laplace's mana, but that seemed to fit considering what Orsted mentioned about me inheriting a lot of that person's traits. But anyway, recent events were confirming hypotheses I had and coalescing into a cohesive theory. The reason why mana spontaneously shifted into magic circles. Why emotions and tense situations amplified mana. How it was possible that multiple casting systems coexisted and how different people had different color mana, as well as how that mana could have different traits based on the person's experiences. Mana was an information carrier, no. Mana was the bridge between mind and matter. The link between thought, energy, and reality. Probably. I didn't have a good way to test that theory just quite yet. But it explained a lot of things. The reason why Sylphie could control the elements and will events so easily was because she had a vivid imagination and belief that it would work. And I was fairly certain that it was more the belief part of it that was making it work. Master Roxy's magic arrays was essentially a constantly running magic program kept up with mana. Not only that, but it was one that could adapt and react to the surroundings without her thinking about it. Something that couldn't be possible if mana was just pure energy. Well, it would be harder at least. 
Anyway, if mana was the bridge, then it explained why the different casting systems could coexist. If mana stored information, then it was likely that the collective consciousness played a role in how magic worked. The reason why chance enacted certain phenomena and logic was because it had been repeated enough that it was impressed into the world's mana, which was basically like the internet. Various bits of information, stored forever in the cloud, except, here it was mana instead of a web of cables or waves of electrical signals. The reason why magic circles worked were explained by that theory too. If the originator of the circles thought it was an easier way to represent and think about spells, a logic could slowly build up over time and become cemented in the collective consciousness as another means of casting. Mental Shortcuts Heuristics that had become accepted with constant use and refined over time so that people could easily utilize magic just by casting. But those heuristics weren't necessary. They were useful, but in the end they were tools someone else developed. And while they represented the way mana worked properly, it was also missing things. I had a feeling. Magic wasn't that complicated, but it also wasn't that simple. It should be possible to do whatever you wanted with mana and create whatever magic you could envision. But what wasn't enough? It was possible by pumping enough mana, but the conversion rate wasn't good. Kind of like solving a multiplication problem with repeated addition instead of just multiplying. If you had enough MP, you could pump it all to try and answer the question. Diverting valuable resources to brute force a solution, like those old supercomputers. But some things couldn't be solved like that. At least, not within a feasible time period. I was fairly sure that no amount of mana in the world could bring someone back to life, for example. Or turn back time. Wait. But that was possible. I placed my hand on my chin and leaned back in my chair to think. I was sure of it. I definitely experienced a time leap of some sort after Dad knocked me out. I hadn't thought about it for a while since it seemed to be a fever dream. But, right, there had been an old man. He mentioned something about the multiverse. And that I had three more times? I leaned my chair back, rocking it on its legs and hummed. That didn't seem to be just a dream, but I haven't sensed anything off. My mana was completely restored, and I had spent a long time combing it over for anything wrong. After all, being W definitely did something to me during that fight with Dad. Well, mostly with Guy Slane. But I didn't sense anything. I didn't see anything off either. There was the weird fact that my mana could change into Laplace's, but I was pretty sure that it was always like that. Maybe. Needed to note that down to make sure, but I had a feeling that guy wouldn't have purposefully made me able to tap into Laplace's mana since I felt even more motivated to take that guy out when I was using it. Not to mention the fact that I almost tore open a dimensional gateway to God knows where before Master Roxy snapped me out of it. Also something to note. I was. 99% sure that I wasn't the reincarnation of the demon god since I was reincarnated from a different world. But considering that I seemed to have been a vengeful or at least earthbound spirit before my soul got sucked away. Well, if that memory I had of the future slash not future was accurate. Time travel was weird. Especially if multiverse theory was involved. Anyway, nothing seemed to be wrong with my mana. But being W. Knock knock. A cheerful and mature female voice echoed. Am I interrupting anything private? I looked over to see Miss Rostellino walk in the room. She was dressed like she usually did. A gray robe that hugged her body. Something modest that covered her body, and something a bit lewd with how closely it covered her body. Pretty sure that Dad would be eyeing her up if he was around. The guy tried, but he was very much a creature of instincts. Like how you're a creature of thoughts. At hashtag dollar at dollar. I fell out of my chair and rolled on the ground before staring at Rostelina. Then I stared harder, trying to see if there was a spell being cast or something. But there wasn't. So how the hell? Rostelina laughed and shook her head. She walked over and picked up the chair before ruffling my hair. My cute granddaughter was right. You really do wear your thoughts on your face. I frowned. 
she bopped my nose with her index finger and smiled. Don't worry about it too much, Rudy. I'm sure there's only one other person in the world who can read your thoughts as well as me. I rolled my eyes and then leaned against the wall, crossing my arm. What are you doing here, Miss Rostalina? Shouldn't you be helping my mom with something? I am. She nodded and said, I'm taking care of you. Me? I tilted my head. Did I miss a meal again? Rostalina's smile faded and she frowned. After that, she stared at me, muttering, taking after him, too. Or is he taking after him? I sighed and said, I hope Dad's taking after me more than I'm taking after my dad. After all, he could do with a bit more responsibility and insight, and I could do with a lot less of dropping the ball. Rostalina laughed and said, Yes. Paul could take after his smart and mature son a bit more. But you could learn a bit from your father's playfulness, you know? She looked around the room, eyeing the pile of magic circle diagrams in the corner. All work and no play isn't good for a cute kid like you, Rudy. I walked over to clean up the stack of papers and said, I'll play when there's time for it. Right now, there's too many things to do. Especially with being W in the picture. I didn't know what could happen. How he might manipulate things. What if he arranged things so Sylphie died? What if Dad got killed because of a plot being W did? What if Norn hated me because being W made me not get along with Dad? What if Dash? Rudy? I broke out of my train of thoughts and looked at Rostalina. Yes? She stared at me, humming. Tapping her finger on her chin, she said, Master wouldn't want me to spill his secrets, but it's not good to leave you like this either. I blinked. Master? You have a master too, Miss Rostalina? Rostalina laughed. Of course. It's nothing like you and Miss Roxy, though. After all, she winked and said, My master and I are completely lovey-dovey, you know? I felt my face heat up and looked away. Rostalina laughed again. But after that, she looked at me thoughtfully and said, But anyway. H.M. Since it's making everyone worry, I guess I can point you towards it. And it's probably better to make sure you don't go crazy like that one guy Master mentioned. Wait. I frowned and said, Asterisk is asterisk there's something wrong with me? But Master Roxy and Mom didn't see anything. And I didn't either. Rostalina nodded. Right. Because it's not something you can see from the outside unless you know what you're looking for. Plus you have to be familiar with how mana flows and collects in the body. Or at least that's what Master said. Something felt off. Something about the situation wasn't right. But there was nothing wrong? I felt a headache start, along with a small pulse in my heart. A familiar sensation, like another heartbeat beneath my own. Yep. Looks like it's that. Rostalina nodded, but her face started to blur. She's dangerous. She knows too much. My left hand moved. At the same time, I felt a chilling and biting sensation in my heart, just like when I got mad at Guy Slane. Wait. My eyes widened and I grabbed my left arm with my right hand, yanking it away. At the same time, I felt my mana royal, wildly fluctuating. My heart ached, feeling like it was getting shredding in my chest. At the same time, I felt a headache like my head was being split in half. And then it calmed down. A soft finger, tapping the middle of my forehead. With that, the turmoil stopped. And at the same time, I felt a wave of drowsiness hit me. Miss Rostalina smiled at me and said, Sleep for a bit, okay Rudy? When you wake up, those nightmares clinging to you will be all gone. Night, Maris? I blinked, suddenly feeling drained. Wait. How? I blinked again, darkness slowly creeping around the edges of my vision. In my fading vision, Miss Rostalina waved and said, Remember. Those are all nightmares, okay? They haven't happened and won't happen. So when you wake up, Rudy, remember who you really are. Easier said then. Chapter 87 The Future Past 
a familiar-looking young man with brown hair and green eyes. Someone who looked a bit like Dad. Except, with an expression that I had never seen on him. Despair. Complete and utter despair. I didn't know why. All I could see was his face twisted in agony. And then I saw it. Corpse tied up in the corner of a lavish city. Her arm missing with a large cut on her face. There was a crowd. People throwing stones at her along with other corpses. Why? I'm tired of it all. Why did this have to happen? I heard a voice echo. A familiar voice that I didn't recognize. The young man who looked a bit like Dad stood up and slowly walked forward. As he did, flames gathered, wreathing around him like they came straight from hell. The crowd screamed. Knights ran forward to stop him. And then the flames lashed out, turning everything into ash. Live. A flurry of scenes. The young man gradually grew older, engrossing himself in research. Unfamiliar faces and people walked in and out of his life. I saw snippets of scenes. Him standing in front of an automaton that looked like. Standing in front of a mass-produced army of sentient automatons. Him furiously doing research and training. How can I get stronger? Should I train my magic? Dash, damn it. If I had been serious when I was younger, it wouldn't have ended like this. Live. The blur of scene stopped. A burnt-down mansion. Black scorch marks in front of the door to a cellar. And inside, three corpses chopped to pieces. I didn't recognize two of them. But the third. A young woman who looked a lot like Mama Lily. By the time I killed them, there was already no point. For what reason have I gained all this power? I'm powerless. It's because of Haidagami. I have to at least kill Haidagami. My heart throbbed. Yeah. If it turned out like that, I'd do the same. Live. An old man stared out at a devastated wasteland. A tattered gray robe billowed behind him while his mismatched green eyes swept across the land. His eyes sharpened. There were still survivors. Some feeble figures picking themselves out from the rubble. The old man raised his left hand. When he did, a distortion emerged over the wasteland. A dark void of light, bending space. And then it erupted, leaving a dust cloud. After that, the old man turned on his heel and walked away. It's still not enough. There was no questioning the power of the spell. But it wasn't enough for what he wanted. In order to accomplish his goal, he needed to do more than just bend space. But it was impossible. He didn't have enough time left. So then. The scene blurred. A vaguely familiar sight. The old man sat in front of a worn-out desk, scribbling down various magic circles. Teleportation circles with notes and various differential equations jotted along the edges with arrows. There's only one way. I can't reach that bastard, so this is the only hope. If it fails. The old man laughed. I'm a dead man anyway. So. He shook his head and focused, causing countless magic circles to flare to life around him. Let's stop thinking about the difficult things. I don't have anything left anyway. Even if I fail and it become the cause for some other incident, I don't care. I'm already fine with whatever. But if I manage to succeed, then... Live. Nothing. After that last scene, I didn't see anything else. But I understood now. It was a black void. A dark expanse where the only thing that existed was me. The only source of light here was myself. I stared out into the void, the scenes that I just saw flickering through my mind. It was terrible. A miserable life that was completely spent in vain. Gaining everything and losing it all in a single moment. The scenes. No, the memories blurred together. But I got the gist of it. That was me no. That was another Rudeus Grey Rat. He was similar to me. Met the same people, walked roughly the same path. No. For a little while, we were the same. But we were different people. I didn't see everything, but
but I got the vague sense of it. That Rudy was someone different from me. Someone who suffered because of that difference. He had talent and intelligence, but he was too lax about things at the critical moment. Because he subconsciously looked for someone to rely on, he was fooled by being W and lost everything. I remembered it now. Dad's death, dismembered by the attack of a magic-resistant Hydra. Norm completely disengaging. Aisha barely acknowledging Dad's death. Mom becoming an invalid and losing her mind. Then there was Master Roxy's death. Falling into a depression and losing Sylphie. Eris coming back to save me again and again before dying at my feet after taking a blow meant to end my life. No. That was wrong. It wasn't me those memories belonged to. But rather. I turned around. There was someone standing there. An old man that I had seen once before. One whose identity I didn't realize at the time. He was tall and had a well-honed body. A man who spent his entire life training both his body and magic. His back was turned and his gray robes were tattered, revealing countless scars littering his skin. Rudius Gray Rat One from a future that ended in a dead end. A man who struggled to the bitter end seeking vengeance on being W but failed at the last step and tried a desperation tactic to change fate by going back in time. And also one who being W tried to use to pull one over on me. Heh. The old man chuckled and said, even after I'm dead, I'm causing troubles for my younger self, huh? I didn't say anything and simply watched him. It was different. I remembered the last time I met him, he was missing parts of his body. This time though, while his body was battle-scarred, it was whole. Altogether. He kind of gave off the impression of an older Soros. A man with a tyrannical presence that could crush everything in his way. Sharp eyes that wouldn't yield to anything, but eyes that were also weary. He raised his left hand, causing a crimson orb to form. Fragments of a broken magic circle flickered around it as well, containing strange characters. Glyphs. Different from the usual geometric figures I knew and understood. You're lucky. The old man. The older Rudius stared at me with a look that contained equal parts envy and respect. It was just one change. The difference between you and me is one event in our past life. Because of that, you have everything now. You lost everything before, but right now you have everything that I did and more. He gazed into the orb with a bitter smile and said, Lucky bastard. I knew the multiverse allowed countless parallel dimensions, but to think that me going back would let this happen. You're the reason, aren't you? Why everything changed so much. I glared at him and held out my hand towards the orb. No, towards my mana. It resisted for a moment. The older Rydius clenched his hand around the orb, as if reluctant to let it go. But then he released it. My mana came back to me. And when it did, I felt a clear change. Something that I didn't realize was off fixed itself. And as I stared at the man's left hand, I realized what that was. He was still holding an orb. It was a lot smaller now, barely the size of a pebble. But it was dense. A clump of mana that was crimson, but slowly changed colors, turning into separate hues. The blue of water mana. The red of fire mana. Light brown from earth mana. And then a hazy dark violet color that I could only guess had to do with how this entire phenomenon was possible. Rudius sighed and then clenched his hand, dissolving the mana. The colors flew out like ribbons before wrapping around him and fading away. You should know why. I wasn't the only one who died with regrets, right? But I guess that's why we're different. He stared at me, his left eye flashing a bright green to reveal a spiral pattern. My eyes widened and I instinctively wrapped my body with mana, blocking whatever he was doing. Rudius chuckled and said, Yeah. Since you're that cautious, I don't need to worry. Like that guy said, you'll definitely be able to finish the job. When he said that, his body started fading away. Starting from his feet, he started dissolving into golden particles. Hey! I pointed at him and said, You don't get to be all mysterious and vanish like that. 
After all the bull crap you pulled and tampering with my head, you think you can leave just like that? I was not about to let this bastard run off like in some shounen anime after dropping some mysterious hints and monologuing. So, glaring at him, I focused and forcibly dragged those particles back into place. Ho! Oh. Rudia stopped dissolving and then laughed. Staring at me, he shook his head and said, Fine, fine. It looks like I have more time than I did with the other me. He waved his hand and formed a pair of stone chairs. Here! Let's have a chat then. I stared at him and then walked over, sitting down on the chair opposite of him. He sat down as well and smirked. Well, kiddo, what do you want to know? First of all, why the hell are you an edgelord? And why are you trying to make me an edgelord? Don't you have any shame as an old man? Rudius's face distorted. Chapter 88 Supporting Protagonist Paul stifled a yawn and looked around the fancy wooden carriage. Guy slain on his left. Lilia on his right. And then across from him, Philip and his wife, Hilda. It had been a couple days on the road now. After meeting at Roa, they immediately set off in a luxury carriage with silk cushions, a giant window at the back to look at the scenery, and a fast horse. As to the driver of that carriage. You guys still not talking to each other? Jisu glanced back from the front of the carriage and said, Silence might be golden, but gold draws danger, you know? Am I going to have to keep track of another jinx? Paul snorted and said, You're the jinx here, Jisu. Paul furrowed his brow and said, Why were you still around anyway? Philip spoke up and said, I called for him. Paul blinked. You? Philip smiled. In a situation like this, an S-ranked adventurer skilled at scouting and avoiding danger is invaluable, is it not? Hilda rolled her eyes and said, And I told you that you're worrying too much. Philip looked at her and said, Since you insist on coming along, I have to be certain. When we arrive, father will likely run wild. He shifted his gaze to Lilia and said, And my dear cousin will be occupied protecting someone else. Lilia smiled. Do not worry, Philip. I am no dainty noblewoman. Paul rubbed his face and muttered, That's for sure. Lilia might not be as good as fighting with a sword, but she definitely knew how to take advantage of openings and throw cheap shots. Maybe that was why she sucked at using sword god and water god style. If she had been training in the north god style from the start, she would probably be pretty scary. Paul. Lilia looked at Paul and said, Are you thinking of something rude again? Paul laughed and nervously rubbed the back of his neck. In no, Lily. I'm just worried, about Rudy. Philip looked amused, realizing Paul's intentions to change the subject. Lilia looked like she realized it as well, but she sighed and let it drop. Instead, she nodded, fiddling with her bracelet. I'm concerned as well. We need to return safely without issue. Paul nodded. This was their only chance. Paul wasn't sure, but his gut told him that. If he wanted to make sure that his son didn't turn into someone like a demon lord who valued only the people around him and threw away everyone else, Paul needed to show that Rudy had the luxury to relax. His son was too logical. No. He had become too logical recently. Paul wasn't sure what had changed. Well, it was probably his fault considering that it happened after that incident, but the end result was that Rudy was weighing everything on a scale against his friends and family. And that scale would never budge. Rudy was already starting to close his eyes to the outside world. And because he managed to fend off Orsted, Rudy believed that he was the most qualified person to make decisions. That it was his responsibility alone to take care of the family. But he was still just a kid. Barely eight years old. Paul might have been a bad father, and he still wasn't sure what a good father looked like. But he knew that he had to step in for at least this. Rudy shouldn't have to be the one to deal with everything. He might be a genius, but even a genius could be overworked and fall apart. In hindsight, maybe Paul shouldn't have made that lecture about great power having great responsibility then? Rudy was already worrying about a lot of things so that might not have been the smartest thing to do. 
Yeah. Paul should definitely just stick to showing instead of talking. Well, at least in trying to convince. But then if he just went and did things without thinking. A smack on his right arm. Paul blinked and looked to see Lilia staring at him with a blank expression. What? Lilia sighed and said, I know the saying is like father like son, but you two seem to be picking up each other's traits more frequently these days. Dyslane chuckled. Shifting the sword sheathed at her waist, she smirked and said, Right? To think the day would come when Paul would shut up and use his brain. Is the world coming to an end? Jisu's voice called out from the front. Hey! Don't jinx it, Guy Slain. Guy Slain's chuckle turned into a full laugh. Fine. But it seems that everyone is a bit different these days. She looked at the front of the carriage and said, You would never have risked your neck on something like this before, Jisu. Jisu laughed back and said, Well, I always wanted to try playing the hero. Never got the chance with Paul hogging the spotlight. Paul straightened and said, that's because you were always running away from it, Jisu. Didn't you say that taking the initiative for yourself was a jinx? Now that you mention it. Jisu made a show of hesitating, as if he would run off. But then he laughed and said, I'm just kidding. And I didn't take the initiative for this trip, so it's fine. It's more of a jinx to turn down a favor from a benefactor anyway. Paul blinked. Benefactor? Of course. Jisu glanced back at Philip and said, After all, I can't turn down the request from the guy who got my pal a job after retiring from adventuring, could I? Philip smiled and said, Yes. Paul was fairly desperate back then. He laughed and said, I definitely did not expect my cousin to show up at my doorsteps and beg for a handout. His smile faded and then he gave Jisu a serious look. But thank you for your aid in this matter, Mr. Nicadia. Jisu shrugged. It's fine. I've got a lot riding on this too. After all, if it turns out that the Nodos are really helping the Prime Minister of Azura to kidnap noble women and we stop them, the name Jisu Nicadia will suddenly get a lot more value, you know? Paul rolled his eyes. Still thinking about money, huh? Hey. Jisu looked at Paul and said, Unlike a certain someone, I'm a poor bachelor. Money's the only thing I've got. Guy Slane watched the interaction between Paul and Jisoo with a faint smile. But then she turned serious and looked at Philip. Lord Philip, are you certain that it is fine to bring Lady Hilda? I know that we've gone over it, but dash. Hilda spoke up and said, Do you think I am a dainty noblewoman, Guy Slane? Considering you are heiress's mother, I doubt it. Guy Slane shook her head and then frowned. But among all of us, you are the only one who does not know how to defend herself. Mph. Hilda tossed her hair and said, Be that as it may, my dear husband will keep me safe. Won't you? She looked at Philip and smiled. Philip looked tense. I will. But please do not start arguments with the other noble women at the festival. Of course I won't. What do you take me for, some warmongering harpy? Hilda poked Philip's head. Philip sighed. Paul looked between the two and said, Seems like you patched things up pretty well, eh, Philip? Hilda's gaze turned sharp and she glared at Paul. Pointing at his face, she said, You shut up. Husband is only doing this because it helps you. Be grateful. Lilia's gaze turned sharp and she glared at Hilda. I would watch your tongue. The only reason that this mission has a sliver of success is because of Paul. Hilda glanced at Lilia and then scoffed. I've been polite until now, but is a mistress like yourself even in a position to talk back to me? Were you not a mere milkmaid until Paul took pity on you? Paul's eyes widened and he quickly grabbed Lilia's left hand. Lily, dear. Please don't get upset at her. Lilia looked at Paul and smiled. She placed her other hand over Paul's and said, Do not worry. It would be terrible to set a poor role model for our children to follow. And besides, Eris is a good girl. I would never harm her mother and make her sad. No matter how much that mother deserves it. You dash. 
Before Hilda could get any more riled up, the horse brayed and Jisu called out. Whoa there! Calm down! The carriage came to a stop. Paul frowned and stood up, resting his hand on his sword. Dyslane stood up as well and flipped up her eye patch, staring out from the carriage. A tense silence, broken only by the horse braying. But when it calmed down, Jisu's voice echoed. You're pretty brave to be standing there in the middle of the road, friend. Especially considering that you're stopping a carriage of the Boreas family. Paul glanced at Geislane. She nodded and quietly opened the back window, slipping out. At the same time, Paul peered out the front. Plastering a smile on his face, he said, What is it, Jisu? He laughed and said, A highwayman causing you trouble? Jisu let out a strained smile. I think this friend is more than a highwayman, Paul. Paul looked towards the person that stopped them. And then he froze. Excellent. I stopped the right carriage. It would have been a pain to deal with sorrows. A vaguely familiar voice, along with a vaguely familiar face. It was a man with silver hair and a long white coat. His golden eyes flickered with a mysterious green hue. Or was it green eyes flickering with gold? Either way, he stood there in front of the carriage, hiding his hands beneath that white coat. Paul had only seen the guy once, but considering what happened afterwards, he definitely wouldn't forget the guy's face. Your dash. Pierre? Philip's voice echoed from the carriage and he peered out. Looking at the man standing there, Philip frowned and said, I thought you said you weren't coming along? Change of plans. The man, Pierre stared at Jisu for a while and then shook his head. Looking back at Philip, he said, I heard you were bringing your wife along and were short on people, so I figured that I would help out. Philip frowned. Sorry to disappoint, but the carriage is full. As much as I would appreciate your assistance, Dash. Don't worry about me. I just wanted to make sure I caught you before. Pierre's gaze shifted towards the carriage, focusing on Paul and Lilia before he shook his head. Anyway, you guys keep going. I'll follow behind you. If that is what you wish, I will not stop you. Philip looked at Jisu and said, Please continue, Mr. Nicadia. Jisu glanced back at Pierre, giving him a thoughtful look. Pierre stared back with a genial smile and waved his hand. Go on. There's no need to concern yourself with me. After a tense silence and everyone getting back in their places, the journey continued. And as it did, the people in the carriage glanced back out the window to see Pierre casually jogging behind the carriage. But even as the horse went up to speed, the distance between Pierre and the wagon didn't change, the man easily keeping pace. Paul glanced at Philip and said, You know the guy? Philip stared at Pierre, frowning. In part, and if he is here after all he said before. It seems this trip may be more trouble than it is worth. Paul frowned and glanced at Lilia. Lilia frowned as well and held Paul's hand. Well, Paul didn't know exactly what was going on. But he knew one thing. They would get over this and get back home, no matter what being W or whatever threw at them. Didn't Rudy say at one time? That Paul was like a dumb protagonist from a storybook? Well, Paul didn't know if that was true. But if Rudy thought Paul was the protagonist right now, then Paul needed to make sure to pull his weight. Pull his weight, protect Lily, and return home safe and sound to his happy kids. So that they would know that things would be fine. So that they could grow up safe and happy without worrying about always looking over their shoulders. So to make that happen, Paul closed his eyes to think. I opened my eyes. It was my room in the new house. After putting me to sleep, it seemed like Miss Rostelina left me alone. I sat up and slowly looked around, mulling over everything that I had just learned. And as I did, I sighed. Why'd you have to go and make things so complicated? Chapter 89 Introspective It didn't look like much time had passed. The sun was still pretty high in the sky from what I could see through my window. It seemed like the chat I had with Rudius. My future self? No, our timelines were definitely different. 
I would never become him, and his past was different than mine. While we had the same starting point, our lives split off in junior high school, where he was fascinated with tinkering computers and assembling them to the extent of neglecting his studies, I had been fascinated with programs and doubled down on my studies to try and recreate a bunch of things in code. There were a few more differences, but it wasn't important. Interesting, considering that he seemed to get dragged down by sloth while I get held down by my pride, but that was all. What was important was the information he gave me. The future he came from. It wouldn't come to pass. The paths we walked had diverged early on. First of all, by now he was already teaching Eris back in Roa and living in with the Boreas family as her tutor. Not only that, but the guy was literally the scum of the earth. A shameless pervert who was worse than dad and was a complete lecher. It looked like he mellowed out over time, but still. I could have turned out like that. The multiverse really was a thing where we knew frighteningly little. But in any case, there were a few things to keep out for. Key regrets that Ridius wanted to make sure didn't happen to me. First was the so-called metastasis event. A mana incident that caused the entire Fedoa region to get teleported across the world. Rudius didn't know exactly why it happened, but he suspected that Haidagami had a hand to play in it. Haidagami meaning being W. Interestingly enough, that guy never showed up to talk to me. Apparently, in Rudius's timeline though, he did. That begged the question of why being W was ignoring me. And why he tried to directly intervene with me instead of taking the subtle approach like he did with Rudius. Was it because he knew that I wouldn't buy it? that I would figure out his intentions and so it wasn't worth the time? Something to note and bring up with everyone else. Anyway, long story short, being W was bad news. I knew that already, but he was really bad news. On the upside, he seemed to be limited. After all, he was never able to directly intervene in Rydius's time. Not only that, but he wasn't omniscient. If he was, then Rydius would never have been able to develop his time travel magic. But he was strong and had a lot of players on the board. Rydius didn't know exact details, but he had suspicions. And he also said that Orsted was the key to reaching that guy. Normally, at least, I was pretty sure I knew how to get to that bastard. If this was a game, it was basically like chr asterisk no tr asterisk gear. I could jump to the final boss and beat him up at any time really, but the problem was the fallout and stat check. No one knew how strong being W really was. So we couldn't just plan this willy-nilly. But that was a goal for the far future. For now, it was better to play the long game. Bide my time and slowly gather things. Definitely was going to be a doozy explaining this to Master Roxy, Mom, and the others though. I stretched and then headed outside. As I did, I sorted out my thoughts some more. Definitely needed to apologize to Mom. I definitely hurt her feelings a lot by brushing off what she was saying. Especially since she was probably just worried about me. Didn't blame her at all. Rudius had been super edgy, with good reason. But that had started to bleed over to my thoughts and actions too. The worry and anxiety about lacking strength. The rush to pursue power. The callous disregard for life. I basically had a Horcrux deal going on, so things were definitely messed up. And this was a giant mess too. And from the timing, that metastasis incident was due any day now. I ran my hand through my hair and muttered, always so much to do, huh? It was already going to be a lot because I caught being W's attention that day, but after Rydia started messing around things definitely got worse. The question was what I would do about it now. Well, there was one thing that I knew I should do. That guy suffered a lot because he kept things close to his chest. Well, that and he wasn't serious about training until it was too late. Since he had been depending on others so much and thought they were infallible, he ended up getting blindsided. I could learn from him. He wasn't wrong. At least, in the beginning. It was important to trust other people to depend on them. And he also wasn't wrong in wanting to make himself strong too. In wanting to be strong enough to stop whatever threats emerged. 
But that wasn't enough. No matter how strong you were, if the people you cared about weren't able to protect themselves, you would always be in trouble. Rudius experienced that firsthand. Because he sought more power for himself, the people he cared suffered the price. I couldn't have that happen. But it seemed like I subconsciously started to act to avoid that already. Like he said, we were different. It was a fundamental change that stemmed from our past. I trusted and valued my family from the beginning. I didn't want to see them hurt and so took active steps to make sure nothing happened. That guy didn't realize how much he cared until it was too late. Though that probably resulted from him thinking he was better than everyone else since he was technically older. And that guy had memories of his past life still. Maybe that helped too. Rudius was still more his past life than his current one whereas I had definitely become Rudy more than anyone else. Well, until that guy came in and started changing me. But anyway. I scratched the back of my head and looked around. The fields were empty. I thought that Eris and Sylphie might be playing outside, but it looked like they might have headed off together somewhere. Maybe helping to play with Norn and Aisha? I didn't know, but whatever the case, it seemed like I was alone right now. Alone with nothing but my thoughts and worries. Even so. You know, you worry too much, Rudius. That old guy wasn't around anymore. After our chat, it seemed like his lingering regrets faded away and he vanished. Even so, I still had some things to say to him. I looked up at the clear blue sky and said, I'm not like you. And this world isn't the same as the one you lived either. It was different. We were different. Some tough things might still come in the future. And being W could still be a bastard and ruin things. But I was sure of it. I'm doing my best, and everyone is stronger. No matter what, this won't be a bad end. Everyone could see mana, so if that teleport incident happened they would be prepared. Dad was stronger now than he was in that timeline. And I had countermeasures for my countermeasures prepared, so a situation like the one Rydius had where his powers were ineffective should never occur. Not to mention the trump card that I somehow snagged due to the shenanigans Rydius pulled and the shenanigans I did in expanding my mana. Mom had that protective bracelet I made for her. Not only that, but she was also better at magic from Master Roxy teaching her. Then there was Mama Lily getting stronger too. It was just different. Not to mention the fact that I was on Orsted's good side. Though there was also the weird bit about me having Laplace's traits. Whatever the case, we would be fine. I was still worried, but I trusted in everyone. Just like before with how I let Dad handle the knights. And speaking of that, being W is probably operating under the assumption I'm like Rydius, isn't he? Since that guy tried to force the override with Rydius and probably knew all about Rydius, he would be moving with the premise that I would act like that guy did. Micromanaging, striving to obtain power at all costs and holding up to keep my family safe. That was definitely what he was planning. Because of that, I had to be careful, but I also shouldn't be someone who was too worried. Like Dad said, this would become a cage. And if I wasn't careful, it would be easy to devolve into a sort of demon lord who locked everyone he cared about up inside some castle and then glare and declare the world my enemy while working to fight some unseen god. Then there would be lots of wars, people that I would massacre without worry or concern because they were aiming towards me and my family. And in the end, I'd probably get backstabbed by someone I cared about because I had changed, or they thought that it would be a mercy instead of a betrayal. Yeah. Lots of bad ends that way. I didn't want to end up like Rydius, after all. While that guy had good intentions, he was the embodiment of the phrase the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Well, that and the whole live long enough to see yourself become the villain shtick. But enough of that. I had been living in a funk for too long now. Made a bunch of people worried too. And also definitely probably resulted in Sylphie developing some unfortunate yander tendencies. Ha! Huh. I ran my hand through my hair and muttered, so many things that I need to fix and prep for. I really need to start that journal. Note to self, start recording thoughts and daily events in a journal. 
Considering how much of a JRPG my life had become, it might actually help save me in the future by seeing where things went wrong. But for now, let's check in with Master Roxy and get her thoughts on this first. And do my best to not think about how one version of me married her in the future. And Sylphie. And that complicated relationship history with Eris. Damn it, Rudius. There's something called TMI, you know? Sheesh. Chapter 90, Slice of Life Roxy stared at her summoned spirit companion and hummed. What in the world are you? Mercy floated over, hovering in front of Roxy. The shimmering silver blob shaped itself into a humanoid form and then tilted its head, as if it was confused. Roxy patted its head and said, You clearly have a mind of your own. But you were also summoned, meaning you came from somewhere but there are no records of a metallic spirit ever being summoned. Were you created? Formed by my magic circles and granted life? Or were you pulled from a separate space? Mercy shook its little head. Roxy sighed and said, Well, whatever the case, I'm grateful for your aid. Mercy shaped itself into a smiley face and then turned back into a silver blob hovering over Roxy's right shoulder. Roxy smiled as well, but then she took a look around her surroundings. As always, she was patrolling around Bina Village. Specifically, she was patrolling in the forest, leaving the other areas for laws to cover. H.M. Roxy checked the trees, underbrush, and canopy around her. Colorful lights floated about, the threads of ambient elemental mana. But there wasn't a sign of anything amiss. No strange white mana that would be a sign of being W or any other mana disturbance. Even so, Roxy didn't lower her guard. As usual, she made her way through the forest to check on the magic circles she placed. Barrier magic, holy mana, converting external mana into ambient mana. It was a modification from Rudy's initial design, but it was effective. And it was working as well. Assuming that being W could only interfere through mana and mental manipulations like before, it would be hard for him to affect anyone in Bina Village. And in the worst case, the forest could serve as a refuge as well with all the protections Roxy had placed. Mercy floated in front of Roxy. She blinked. Is something wrong? Mercy bobbed up in the air before drifting over to something hidden in the underbrush. Roxy looked over and then saw an old stone slab pulsing with a pure golden mana. Mercy bobbed up and down over the slab before moving close to it, as if trying to read it. Roxy smiled and walked over. Curious? Roxy chuckled and then crouched down to look at the slab. Let's see. This should be one of the Seven World Powers monuments. Unlike the color of the mana, the slab glowed with a soft blue-green light, emitting seven symbols that surrounded the number seven written in the fighting god language. Roxy recognized them. During her stay in the Chiron Kingdom, she spent a lot of time doing research in the library. Not only that, but as an adventurer, you inevitably ended up knowing the symbols for the big seven. A pair of jagged wings representing the technique god. The side profile of a dragon head representing the dragon god. A geometric design that looked like either a shield or a complicated box that represented the fighting god. A symbol that looked like an eye representing demon god Laplace. A strange abstract symbol with a lot of curves that represented the death god. A sword representing the sword god. And then an image that looked like a sword in front of a shield, representing the north god. Those were what were on the slab, starting just over the seven and going clockwise, representing the order of power. In short, the Technique God was first, the Dragon God Orsted was second, and so on. It was the same that Roxy had seen on all the other slabs since becoming an adventurer. At least, that was what she thought. But, hmm, the order was different. The Technique God and the Dragon God were still first and second. But Demon God Laplace had moved up to third. Not only that, but its symbol was a bit different. It was still an eye, but it looked twisted. The left half of the symbol was erased, and a symbol that looked like a bent sword covered it. Roxy frowned. That's troubling. There was a shift. Not only that, but the shift was in Demon God Laplace. 
Is this a result of Rudy? Or is it that being W? Roxy mumbled and placed a hand on her chin, thoughtfully staring at the slab. Shing! Mercy moved in front of Roxy and then turned into an arrow, pointing at something off to the side. Roxy straightened and then looked over to see a half-dozen wild boars slowly emerge from the underbrush. Shing! Mercy moved to Roxy's side and turned into a crescent blade. She lifted her staff and said, Well, I suppose the girls would appreciate some more food. And Rudy should eat more as well. The largest boar squealed and then charged at Roxy. Mercy blurred, charging to meet the boar. Make it tidy, Mercy. Rue! Norm giggled and ran over to hug me. I hugged her back and looked around. Hey, Norn. Have you been a good girl? Meechum. She giggled again and nuzzled against me. Aisha ran over as well, her eyes lighting up. Big bro! I smiled and then reached over to pat her head. Hey, Aisha. She giggled and hugged me too. I was back at our old house. And it seemed like that was where everyone else was as well. So Sleeping Beauty finally woke up? Rostalina smiled, leaning against the edge of the gate. It seemed like she was the one watching my baby sisters at the moment. I nodded and said, Yep. And I have a lot of questions for you, Miss Rostalina. Like how and why she regained her past memories. Not only that, but who she was with considering that she hadn't met that cliff person Rydius mentioned but we can talk about that later. Right now. I hugged Norn and Aisha and said, I haven't played with you two in a while, have I? How about we have some fun? Aisha gasped and then clapped her hands together. Big bro! Magic! Norn's eyes lit up and she quickly nodded. Rue! Play magic! I laughed and said, Magic, huh? Sure. I have a few fun ideas we can play with. Yay! Big bro, super cool. Pure admiration. From both Norn and Aisha. Norn was a given, but even after I treated Aisha a bit callously, she still cared for me that much. Rudy? Mom's voice called out from inside the house. Is that you? I flinched. Norn noticed and held me close. Rue! I protec. Aisha gasped and started tugging me. Run! Mama's any scary. What was that, Aisha? Mom walked out of the house, wiping her hands against her apron. Calling me scary? Aisha trembled and then let go of my hand before standing in front of Mom. She looked back at me and said, Big bro. Run! Norn tugged on my hand and said, Rue. Go, go! Mom huffed and then walked forward, scooping Aisha up into her arms. You little rascal. Aisha shrieked and then squirmed around in Mom's arms. She looked at me with a brave look and said, Big sis. Go! Rue! Norn kept tugging me, determination in her eyes. And then laughter echoed. Miss Rostalina, smiling as she watched everything unfold. I laughed as well seeing the ridiculous antics my little sisters were pulling. What are you two making mom do? She's in no condition to be chasing after you two, you know? Norn looked guilty. Eh? Mom paused and then looked at me, confused. I cleared my throat. Sorry for the trouble recently, mom. She blinked and then looked at Rostalina. Rostalina placed a finger over her lips and winked. Mom narrowed her eyes. Lena. I said no flirting with Rudy. She blinked and then rolled her eyes. What do you take me for, a shameless cradle robber? Cradle robber? Mom gave a serious nod to Rostalina and said, yes. Rostalina laughed and then said, don't worry. I have my man and I'm plenty satisfied these days. Now, is Rose inside? Mom still looked skeptical, but she nodded and said, Rose is helping with lunch dash. Wonderful. Rostalina waved and walked inside. I'll take over for you. Go rest and have fun with the kids, Zenny. The door to the house closed, 
and then it was just me with my mom and my sisters. At that time, Aisha broke free from mom's grasp and darted over towards me, grabbing my hand. Big bro! Go go go! I laughed and then poked her in the forehead. Stop being so silly, Aisha. Oi! Aisha placed her hands over her forehead and started tearing up. Big bro! Mimi! Norn walked over and patted Aisha's head. AI! It's K! Aisha hugged Norn. Big sis nice. I looked at the two and then back at mom. Are they always like this when Sylphie and Eris aren't around? Mom sighed. Yes. Your sisters are a bit of a handful. It seems like they picked up your dad's wild energy. Aisha's eyes lit up and she said, Yay. De cool. I like. It's a good thing Rudius vanished. That guy probably would have had a heart attack at how different things were right now. Mom sighed and then walked over to me. She seemed a bit hesitant, but she reached out to brush hair out of my eyes. Are you feeling better now, Rudy? There was a trace of worry there that she tried to hide, but couldn't. I smiled to reassure her and said, I'm fine now, Mom. And sorry for being a brat. Mom smiled and then put on a stern face. Well, it's about time you realized it, mister. Now for a punishment. I flinched and lowered my gaze. You have to stay here and play with us the rest of the day, all right? I blinked and then looked up to see Mom give me a warm smile. As if she didn't care about anything other than the fact that I was back to normal. I smiled back, my vision blurring a bit. Norm gasped. Rue! Why crying? Aisha gasped too and then hugged me. Big bro! No cry! I laughed and brushed away my tears. It's happy tears, okay? And it's okay to cry when you want to. Mom nodded. That's right. Although, you've always been a bit of a crybaby, haven't you, Rudy? I am not. I said have, but it seems like you still are. Arg, whatever. I grumbled, but I couldn't hide the smile on my face. Anyway, let's go sit down somewhere. You shouldn't be standing so much, Mom. I don't want my new sibling to be as hectic as Norn was when she came into this world. Norn blinked and looked confused. I ruffled her hair. Don't worry about it, Norn. Now. I focused on the corner of the courtyard. That guy said magic was omnipotent. Not only that, but it wasn't just willpower and logic. If you had a good enough mental image, then mana would move to that image. In short, a confirmation of how Sylphie used her magic. So it should work. If I envisioned it clearly enough and focused my mana, the outcome I wanted should just work. Of course, there was the prerequisite that I had enough mana, but mana wasn't a concern for me. In that case, I imagined it. A cheap and colorful plastic table slash bench combo for the kids to sit at. A comfortable beanbag chair for my mom. And then they blinked into existence, wobbling a bit as they landed on the ground. way -oh. Aisha clapped her hands and said, Big bro cool. Norn gasped and then looked at me. Rue! Awesome! I smiled. Thanks you too. After that, I looked at my mom. She stared at the new furniture and then sighed, pinching the bridge of her nose. My genius son doesn't know when to stop appending magic, does he? What am I, some light novel character? Come on, mom, it's not that serious. And don't bother us anymore, twerps. Eris glared at the bunch of rowdy kids running away from her and Sylphie. Sylphie sighed and said, Did you have to be so mean? Eris turned her head to the side and tossed her hair. Mph. They should feel lucky I just yelled at them and didn't beat them up. Calling you a demon. If Rudy was here, he would have broken their legs. Sylphie shook her head. No, he wouldn't. Eris gave Sylphie a blank look. You're kidding. Sylphie smiled. Rudy would have broken every bone in their body and then healed them to make it look like nothing happened. Sylphie. You're really scary. 
But I'm cute, right? I... I guess. Eris looked around the surroundings. They were wandering around the outskirts of the village, helping out farmers where they could and beating up any wild animals that got close. Because of that, they also got a bit of pocket change. Sylphie said it was a lot. Eris wasn't so sure, but Sylphie was smarter than her, so she trusted what Sylphie said. She was also scary when she was mad, so Eris decided to just go along with it. Sylphie looked at the sky and said, It's getting late. You want to go home, Eris? Eris carefully adjusted her coin bag and then nodded. Yeah. If we don't go back, stupid Rudy will forget to eat again. Sylphie furrowed her brow. Yes. Rudy's been doing that a lot. Right? So let's go. We need to make him stop being a boring book reader and do some more fun things too. Boring books? Sylphie gave Eris a blank look. Eris froze and said, and not that books are bad. But our Rudy is reading too much, are all right? Sylphie was quiet and then nodded. Right. Eris is thoughtful as always. H ha. Was this how the servants felt around Grandpa? Eris could never tell how Sylphie was going to react. Hold on tight, kay? Wait. Sylphie YKYAAA. A giant wind kicked up and then the two girls flew through the air, heading back to the Grey Rat household. Chapter 91 Playtime Bubble! Bubble! Aisha clapped her hands together and then giggled. Nor nodded and said, Rue! Bubbles! I smiled and said, Fine, fine. Here you go. I conjured a few small water balls and sent them over to Aisha and Norn. We were seated on the playset, with me on one side and my sisters on the other side. Mom sat on the beanbag chair, watching us with a warm smile on her face while resting one hand over her belly. Hopefully my new sibling wouldn't cause any trouble by showing up early or something. I cut that train of thought off and focused on Aisha and Norn. Aisha easily plucked the water balls I sent her out of the air and started spinning them around in the palm of her hand. And then she merged them into a bigger one, looking like a certain signature technique of a blonde ninja from a village hidden in the leaves. Yep. Even if things changed, Aisha was still a natural. And considering how Rudy has said that she managed to pick up magic easily even while learning it when she was older, since she started now. Rue! Look, look! Norn held out her hand to me and said, Piggy. Unlike Aisha, who I was sure was secretly walking on a path to become a kunoichi or something from her antics, Norn did something more normal with her water ball. The sphere had been smushed and deformed, some parts pulled out and others tucked in to form a rough four-legged creature. It really didn't look like a pig to me, but if you squinted, it probably did? I smiled at her and patted Norn's head. Good job, Norn. Aisha looked at me and pouted. After that, she stuck out her hands too and said, Big bro. Speen! I laughed and patted Aisha's head too. That's right. Spin. Be careful not to get water on you now, okay? K. Aisha nodded and then leaned back, spinning her water ball in different directions. Norn giggled and then let go of her water sculpture. And surprisingly, it didn't turn back into a sphere or collapse. Instead, it floated around her, awkwardly flailing its limbs. Yeah. These two were definitely going to do crazy stuff with magic in the future too, huh? Though, it was a bit weird. Rudius told me to keep an eye on Norn and to help her out a bit since she wasn't very talented. But from what I could see, she was just as talented as Aisha was in magic. Was that guy mistaken? Or was I just that good of a teacher? Or maybe Norn trusted me enough that she put more effort into things? That guy hadn't gotten along with Norn, so maybe that made the difference? Well, whatever the case, I was going to make sure my baby sisters grew up to be able to take care of themselves. And I was going to make sure not to make them hate me in any way. That would probably throw me for a loop. The thought of Norn and Aisha looking at me in disgust. I didn't even need to imagine it. 
that guy had experienced it firsthand and made a point to make me relive those memories with him in his long retelling of this jobless reincarnation. And I had to remember to not rely too much on that information too since the future was bound to be different due to our differences. What a mess. But something for later. I smiled and watched my baby sisters play. And then I noticed that mom was staring at me. I looked over at her and tilted my head. What is it, mom? She shook her head. Nothing. Just. She smiled and said, I'm happy that you're back to normal. I was starting to think I would never see your cute smile again. Norn blinked and looked at me. Rue? No smile? Aisha looked at me too and said, Big bro sad? I waved my hands. No, no. Mom's just saying that I've been frowning too much. Norn tilted her head. Fwam? Aisha pointed at me and said, Big bro. No frown, smile. K? I laughed. Got it, Aisha. She smiled and then went back to spinning her water ball. I looked back at my mom and said, But anyway, I've been in a bit of a funk because of things. I frowned, remembering everything that had happened along with the entire can of worms that meeting Rudius had opened up. Especially the part about Alinalize now being Rostalina and decidedly much less lewd than she was supposed to be. I shook my head and then smiled. I'm sorry to worry you though. And both Mama Lily and Dad too. Mom stood up and then moved her beanbag chair to my side. After that, she reached out to hug me and said, It's okay. Mommy forgives you. I smiled. And then there was a loud shockwave as something flew down from the air and collided against the ground. Wah! Norn flinched and started tipping back. Big sis! Aisha dropped her water ball and quickly grabbed Norn, trying to pull her up. But she wasn't strong enough. Before either of them toppled over though, I conjured a small breeze to push the back forward and then grab their arms. Careful now. Crazy things happen in the middle of nowhere. You got to always be ready, okay? Norn sniffed, but nodded. KK, Rue. Aisha looked determined. Got it, big bro. After seeing that they were okay, I turned to look at my mom. Only to see her standing up with a stern look on her face and glaring at the source of the commotion. Miss Sylphiette and Miss Eris Boreas Grey Rat. What did I tell you too about doing those sorts of reckless landings? Eh? I turned to look and saw a strange sight. First of all, it was Sylphie and Eris. That wasn't strange. The two had become close friends. Well, Sylphie had become a close friend to Eris. I wasn't sure if it was completely mutual considering how often Sylphie messed with Eris. But anyway, it wasn't strange to see them together. What was strange was that Sylphie had landed on the ground in a giant crater with Eris held in her arms, princess style. Which, considering Eris's background, was pretty fitting. But still, odd. Mostly because Eris was completely red-faced and super embarrassed instead of angry. She jumped out of Sylphie's hands and then spun around to point at her. I, I told you that I can handle myself. You didn't need to carry me like that. Sylphie laughed. Okay, Eris. I'll let Rudy carry you like a princess next time, then. Eris's face turned even more red and said, LL like I want that. Sylphie's eyes lit up and she said, Great. Then I'm being carried next time. Thanks, Eris. W wait. I didn't dash. Before Eris could finish, my mom glared at them and said, Girls. Eris flinched and lowered her head. Why yes, Miss Zenith. Sylphie's ear turned red and she lowered her head too. Sorry, Miss Zenith. Mom sighed and ran her hand through her hair. Honestly. And here I thought that Rudy and Sylphie were already trouble with their crazy magic games. Ah. It seemed like Mom never really got over that, huh? But it was just one winter where we caused an avalanche of snow. At that time, the door to our house opened. Miss Rose walked out carrying an iron skillet. Who's the one causing all that ruckus out there? 
You ruin my pie. Sylphie paled. You um. Miss Rose looked at Sylphie. And then she saw the giant crater in the ground. Sylphie at Dragon Road. What did your father and I tell you about damaging the surroundings when you use magic? I blinked. Huh. Okay. So maybe I've been a worse influence on Sylphie than I thought if even the sweet and patient Miss Rose was snapping at Sylphie. Now, now. Rostalina walked out after Miss Rose and said, Let the kids be kids, Rosie. It's no good to force them to be polite. Miss Rose glared at Rostalina. And then she let out a deep sigh and lowered her skillet. I suppose. She shook her head and then looked up at everyone. Now, how about we enjoy some dash? At that time, Blue Comet flew down from the sky. No. It wasn't a Blue Comet. That was. Boom! Another explosion just outside the house's courtyard. Norn screamed in fear and scrambled around the table to hug me. Aisha screamed too, but out of excitement. Unlike Norn, she clapped her hands and then smiled at the explosion. And as for the person who caused that explosion. Oh whoa. Master Roxy winced and then rubbed her legs. Is it because they're younger? That's not fair. Landing like this hurts a lot. Shing! Shortly after the explosion, a few more thuds echoed as frozen slabs of meat landed on the ground. Master Roxy glanced over and then let out a relieved smile. At least that worked. But why are my knees so sore? Silence. S. Shing! Mercy rippled and then flew over to Master Roxy's shoulder and tugged on her collar. Hmm? Master Roxy looked up and then froze. Mom's eyes started twitching as she looked at the devastated scenery. Rostalina covered her face, holding back a laugh. Seeing Master Roxy suddenly turn red in embarrassment, I couldn't help it. I laughed. And then everything got quiet. Not only that, but everyone turned to look at me. I felt my face heat up and looked to the side. W what? It was funny. Chapter 92 Go with the flow. After that hectic afternoon, things went back to normal peaceful times. I made sure to play more with Norn and Aisha while secretly teaching them magic disguised as games. Eris got more clingy since I wasn't super edgelord anymore and insisted that I sparred with her. It was still a bit awkward considering that she was Rydia's first lover and most definitely not mine. But she was also a lot less rough around the edges than the Eris that guy knew too probably because she hung around Sylphie so much. Instead of being a super sundered that liked beating people to a pulp, Eris was about the level of our asterisk n to asterisk Sokka from f asterisk t slash st asterisk y n asterisk ght. In short, dishonest about her feelings and a bit bratty at times, but good at heart. Still didn't mean I liked her. She was still a bit too grating on my nerves. But I could at least be friendly with her. She was my relative, after all. On Dad's side. And also part of the reason why everything hit the fan. Okay. Maybe I still hadn't gotten over that part just yet. I was doing my best to be the bigger person and not judge her too harshly though. But by God was that hard some days. Sylphie was Sylphie. Maybe because she was jealous of Eris, she was more clingy these days too. Not that I minded. It was always nice when Sylphie was around. Though I was starting to get worried about her yander tendencies. I was fine now since Rydias had left. Ah. Well, I suppose things might still get a bit hairy if I used Laplace's Demon God mana. But for the most part, I didn't have those edgelord or psychotic slash sociopathic slash yander tendencies anymore. I think. Part of the reason why I was starting up a journal was to keep track of that though, so hopefully that worked. But anyway, Sylphie. These days, she was getting really good at using a sword. A short sword too. And her favorite attacks with it were stabbing. Then there was the fact that she somehow picked up the villainous Ohoho laugh. Though that part was apparently Rostalina's fault. And speaking of Rostalina. At first, she avoided me. 
she made some excuses about having to take care of my mom and helping out around the house. Then when I had free time in the evening, she said that children should get some rest and refused to talk to me. But it was time. A couple of weeks had passed. Master Roxy, Miss Rose, and my mom were heading to Sylphie's house to go check on Miss Rose's garden. They also took Nora and Aisha so that my baby sisters could get out of the house some more and get fresh air. Sylphie and Eris were out on an adventure together in the forest and said I couldn't come with them, something about a girl's secret. Slightly concerning, but as long as they were getting along, it was fine. Which meant that it was just me and Rostalina alone. It would have been fine with just me, but I managed to pull a ploy about being tired and convincing everyone that Rostalina would be fine. I think it got some concerned looks from Mom, but awkward misunderstandings aside, it was time to make sure I wasn't misunderstanding anything. And to find out the truth. Inside our house, I was sitting at our dining room table, sipping on a cup filled with fruit juice. And seated across from me was my target. Rostalina giggled and said, My, my. Asking a woman like me out on a date. She gave me a sly smile and said, It seems you really did inherit a lot from Paul. Should I be worried that you'll eat my granddaughter up when we aren't looking? I rolled my eyes. As if. I'm not a pervert like Dad. Besides, the longer I could avoid thinking about the mess that would probably ensue when hormones kicked in, the better. Although. I stared at Rostalina and compared her to the Alinalis that Rydius knew. Her appearance was the same. A beautiful elf woman with lightly curled blonde hair and scarlet eyes. A lithe but curvy body and a naturally seductive atmosphere paired with mannerisms that were just barely proper instead of lewd. Her way of teasing was similar too. But it was different. More reserved, with a bit of distance. A proper distance instead of the way too familiar and inappropriate innuendos she made with that guy. But the biggest change was her attire. The Alinalized Rydius knew always wore a revealing outfit. Even when adventuring, she was the sort of person to actually wear bikini armor. But I had never seen Rostalina wear anything except modest clothing. A full body robe, long dresses, a gray coat. She never showed anything more than necessary, as if thoughtful and aware of how lewd her usual clothing was. Which was weird. Well, weird considering what she was supposed to be like. I already thought that Miss Rostalina was weird even before knowing that. Mostly from how she acted around Sylphie and her family. Also from how Mom and Dad acted around her too. But anyway, Elinalyz and Rostalina were the same person, but also not. And the latter seemed to know a lot more than she was letting on, so. Rostalina laughed and then leaned on the table. Laying her left arm flat against the tabletop, she supported her head with her right and tilted her head to the side, smiling at me. You two really are similar. It's funny, really. I frowned and then moved my cup of juice to the side. What's that supposed to mean? Rostalina shook her head. Nothing just that it's cute how you trail off into thought. She smiled as she looked at me, a tinge of nostalgia in her eyes. My frown deepened and I said, Dad was like that too? I didn't take him to be a thoughtful person. I mean, he did that now, but that was because he knew how important it was to avoid jumping in. But when he was younger, I imagined a younger dad. He probably looked like me. But his actions... Hey. Yep. Definitely a B cup. What's that dress hiding? Yeah. Couldn't imagine him being similar to me. Rostalina blinked and then laughed. Oh, I'm not talking about Paul. He was the same then as he was now. She paused and said, Well, he's definitely more considerate and thoughtful than he was back then. But mostly the same. I was talking about my beloved master. Beloved Master. That was new. Elinalize had always been alone. At least, in terms of actual companionship and not just her transactional flings. But the way she talked about that master, her actions, and the fact that she seemed to be knowing more than she let on. I grabbed my juice and took a long sip to gather my thoughts. And then I set it off to the side and looked up. 
Miss Rostalina. A serious tone of voice. Well, as serious as I could make with my childish voice. I looked at her and said, Who are you? She wasn't related in any way to being W. My gut told me that, and it didn't seem to fit her actions either. Well, Rudius had made a big fuss about how being W liked playing a wolf in sheep's clothing and make a bunch of helpful tips that really weren't. But assuming that being W knew the future Rudius belonged to, and he would have to, considering how being W tried to force things back on course. Anyway, assuming that, his goal should be to get me off guard and then spring a trap on us all. Which made Rostalina unlikely because she was just way too suspicious. And that wasn't being W's style. That guy liked being subtle and manipulative. But that begged the question of who Rostalina was. She looked like Elinalize. She was apparently Elinalize. And Elinalize was amnesiac according to what Rydias said. And she never recovered her memory from what he knew. So why did she now? Rostalina laughed and then reached out to flick my forehead. Ow! I flinched and covered my head. What was that for? She smiled and then said, You're thinking too hard, Rudy. Relax. Grandma Lena will always be on your side. I pouted and said, Don't pull that on me. I pointed at her and said, You're being weird. I want to know why. Like that magic thing you did. Okay. Being serious didn't work, so I'll just vent my frustration out like the kid I am. Rostalina stuck out her tongue and said, Secret, but if you really want to know. How about I tell you on your tenth birthday? She tapped her finger on her chin and said, He won't mind then, right? It should be long enough. And it really is annoying having to keep secrets from my cute grandchildren. I sighed. You're just going to keep dodging the question, aren't you? Rostalina laughed and then said, Well, it's rude to make a lady spill her secrets, Rudy. Besides, my granddaughter might get jealous. But I guess I can give you a hint. H.M.? A hint? Rostalina nodded and then winked. I'm like this because of you, you know? Shotokan. Huh? I sighed and then shook my head. Never mind. At least nothing was going wrong over here. And even if there was, Miss Rostalina seemed to be here to help us. And she was sincere in caring about all of us, so. I guess it's fine. But first. Do you know anything about time travel, Miss Rostalina? She blinked and then laughed. I might know a lot of things, Rudy, but time travel's a bit out there. She gave me a sly smile and said, Why? Are you embarrassed about the looks my cute granddaughter has been giving you? I blushed. And no, that's not why Dash. Oh my. Should I tell Zenny? Her cute son is growing up faster than expected and is already starting to pay attention to girls. W. Wait. Don't do that. Miss Rostalina Dash. Ooh, Paul would be so proud. Here! She stood up and then reached over to grab me, swinging me around in her arms. W. O. Stop that. Hey! Let me down! How is a such a slim woman so strong? Don't worry, Rudy. Grandma Lena will teach you all the right things to know about girls. I'll make sure you don't end up like your dad, okay? But first, we need to get you some sunshine. Right now, you look like a ghost. Ooh, and we can style your hair a bit to make it cool. Even Eris will be impressed. Okay. Maybe I shouldn't have tried teasing information out from a woman who experienced countless hardships and had over a century of life experience. Might have been a bit too cocky there. I sighed and let Miss Rostalina lug me around like a sack of potatoes over her left shoulder. Nothing to do but have fun, I guess. I wonder how Dad's doing. Live. The sound of clashing steel filled the air. Metallic clangs, resounding staccato notes. And then Paul flew back. Landing on the ground, he clicked his tongue and glanced at his sword. The blade that Rudy made for him was fine. The crimson edge was as pristine and honed as ever. But if it had been an ordinary sword, 
Ho! A man with blue hair and strong, wolf-like features lowered his sword. He grinned, an expression that emphasized the scar below his left eye and the scar at the tip of his right eye. The man gave Paul an approving nod and said, That's a good sword. And you're not half bad too. Paul ignored the sweat running down the back of his neck and grinned. And that's all the sword god can do? For a guy so famous, your swordsmanship is pretty plain. The sword god, Galfarion, chuckled and said, Plain, huh? Yeah, yeah. I guess it seems that way to a guy with fancy swordplay like you. He lifted his left hand and grabbed his head, cracking his neck. After that, he raised his sword and said, Let's keep going. We can't disappoint the crowd now, can we? Paul laughed and raised his sword as well. But at the same time, he took stock of the situation around him. A makeshift stage in the center of the Milbots region capital city. A crowd of people watching them, cheers filling the air. How did I end up like this again? Oh, right. Because that bastard younger brother of mine was being stubborn about letting us in. Don't you dare lose, husband. Amidst the crowd's cheers, a calm and collected voice cut through. Lilies. Hearing that, Paul straightened and focused. Gal noticed and grinned. Ho! Oh. Got an admirer watching? Paul grinned back. Yep. And you know what they say. Gal shifted his body, moving into a loose stance. I don't, actually. You can't look bad in front of your girl. Paul kicked off the ground, swinging his sword at a blinding speed. A fast strike. Faster than anything Paul had done before in the fight. An ambush. But instead of cutting flesh, steel reverberated. Gal bared his teeth, easily parrying Paul's sword with his own. Well then. Show me what you got. After saying that, he leapt back. A flicker of danger. A faint prickling on his neck. Paul's eyes widened and he turned, bringing his sword up. Steel clashed again, and Gal's blade barely missed Paul's neck. Damn. If this was the mess they were getting into right out the gate, this was going to be a long trip, wasn't it? Chapter 93, Lampshades I think it looks cute, Rudy. Rostalina giggled and said, You look like a tiny hero off for war. I frowned and resisted the urge to smooth down my spiked hair. I think it looks stupid. After that chat with Miss Rostalina, she dragged me over to her room and pulled out a bunch of makeup equipment. Powders, brushes, and all sorts of things I didn't know anything about. Apparently, I never bothered doing research into makeup products in my previous life, so it all came up blank. Fortunately, I didn't get the typical cliché dress a guy up as a girl treatment. But considering how I looked, I might have preferred it. First of all, my bangs had been messed up into a windswept style that any typical anime or JRPG protagonist would have. The sort of spiky and gravity-defying hair that somehow flowed in the wind. Second of all, Miss Rostalina had either bought or made. Probably made, since she was always around. Anyway, she handed me a tiny adventurer's outfit. Again, the sort that you'd see in a typical JRPG setting. A beige-colored tunic and pants combo. Some leather padding at the elbows and knees. A mini dagger strapped on my belt at my left side, with a satchel and my wand looped on my right side. Leather boots. And finally, there was the carved wooden pendant that she made me wear along with the talisman that Master Roxy gave me during my graduation. I gave the hand mirror back to Miss Rostalina and shook my head. Where did you even get all of this stuff anyway, Miss Rostalina? Just Grandma's fine, Rudy. She smiled and patted my head. And think of it as a late birthday gift for my cute granddaughter's best friend. Besides, it'll be useful soon, right? I gave her a blank look and then carefully said, Useful how? Was she a regressor or something? Or did she have info about events stirring in the background I didn't? Maybe that mysterious past of hers involved some secret truths about the world? Being W doing a mind wipe on her to prevent her from stirring things up, but in this timeline he somehow messed it up? Hmm? She tilted her head and said, Well, 
Sylphie's been talking about wanting to go adventuring soon with you and Eris. Shouldn't you look the part? I blinked and said, What? She has? She didn't mention anything to me. Oh. Oh, that's probably what she and Eris were doing by themselves. Probably some training to get used to each other's fighting style and working out some past frustrations or something. And that was a thought. Maybe we should become adventurers. Being W seemed to want to screw me over in particular, so if I moved around he wouldn't focus on my family but me. Especially if I was going around with Sylphie, Master Roxy, and Eris. What other way to cause an accident than on a dungeon dive, right? Though, that guy also seemed to not know just how strong we all were. Especially with the countermeasures and trump cards I laid down. There was also the fact that Orst did like me and there wouldn't be any chances of misunderstanding like Rydia's had. But I was still just eight. Heading out from home so early. Ah, that guy did too, didn't he? H.M. At that time, a knock echoed in the distance. Shortly after, my mom called out. Lena? Rudy? We're back. I froze. Rostalina laughed and then said, Come on. Let's show your mom how cute you are. I thought you said I was cool. Rostalina grabbed my hand and pulled me along. You are. But a cute hero is still cute even if he's cool, you know? I sighed. Well, I guess mom would think it's alright. I reluctantly followed after Rostalina. We walked through the house to the living room. As we did, I mentally prepared myself to explain things to Mom. And then I saw all the people around her, and I remembered that Mom didn't leave alone this morning. Miss Rose gasped and said, Rudy, you're so cute. Norn gasped as well and looked at me with sparkling eyes. Rue! Cool! Aisha clapped her hands and then nodded. Super cool. Coo. I felt my face heat up and averted my gaze. I it wasn't my idea. I instinctively reached up to smooth my hair down. But before I could, Mom was already standing in front of me, patting it all down. And Mom? She leaned back to look at me, her face grim. I blinked and said, I is something wrong? She stared back and then let out a deep sigh. Like I thought. It's too dangerous for you to be an adventurer. I might become a grandmother before I'm forty at this rate. Rostalina laughed and said, He's cute, right? Don't you think so too, Roxy? Master Roxy looked at me, her face flushing red. T that is. Rudy does appear to be suited for an adventurer's life, but... I coughed and then looked towards the bags that Miss Rose and Master Roxy were holding. Did you find what you were looking for? Mom nodded and let out a bright smile. Yep. We got a lot of herbs and spices. And now, with all the meat that Roxy brought back the other day, we can have a party. A party? I blinked and said, what for? For my son finally being normal again, obviously. Now come on, there's a lot to get ready. Sylphie hummed to herself as she looked around the frozen forest. Gently walking through the frosted undergrowth, she stopped in front of a frozen wolf before lightly tapping it. The wolf shattered into red mist before it dropped a glittering blue crystal onto the ground. Sylphie picked it up and then smiled. After that, she turned around and said, What do you think, Eris? Will this make a good gift for Rudy? Eris hugged her arms and shivered. Pee pee probably. Oh! I'm sorry. Sylphie waved her hand, causing a warm wind to blow around the surroundings. In an instant, the frozen forest turned back to normal, as if the ice was just an illusion. I forget that you aren't good with magic. Eris gave Sylphie a blank stare and then sighed, shaking her head. It's fine. Eris glanced at her side to check her sword, making sure it wasn't damaged by the cold. After that, she nodded and looked back at Sylphie. What do you want that for anyway? Sylphie tucked it into a small bag at her side and said, Well, Rudy needs a new weapon now that his sword is broken. And since he's just like a hero from a story, we should get him a magic sword, right? 
and a magic sword needs a good magic crystal. She turned around to look at Eris and smiled. Isn't it a great idea? He'll be so happy for us to give him a cool sword. Um. Sure. Sylphie frowned. You don't seem happy about that, Eris. Aw. Eris quickly held up her hands and said, It's a good idea. I think. Just. She frowned and said, Does Rudy need a sword? He can use his magic to make one whenever he wants, right? Sylphie paused. Oh. That's right. But we already spent all this time adventuring to make it. Eris started to sweat. She already kind of thought it since she arrived in Bina Village to stay with Rudy's family, but it really seemed like everyone here didn't have any common sense. Sylphie sighed. Well, since we're here, we should at least get a few more. Maybe Rudy can find a good use for them? It would be a good gift anyway, right? Maybe wait. Eris blinked and then said, You want to find more magical creatures? Of course. Now come on, Eris. Sylphie grabbed Eris's hand and said, There should be stronger monsters deeper in the forest. You can practice fighting more too. H hold on. S Sylphie, I'm exhausted. Why don't we dash? Before Eris could say anything else, she felt warmth spread throughout her body. After that, her fatigue vanished. Not only that, but she felt filled with energy. Like she had just woken up after a long night's sleep. Sylphie smiled. There! Now you're in top shape, right? Eris gave Sylphie a blank stare and then pulled out her sword. Yes. Great! Now. Adventure. Was this what Dad meant? What goes around comes around. Eris really should have treated their servants and Roa better. It was a bit awkward, but fun day. I didn't think that it was a big deal, but apparently I had been acting a lot more differently than I thought. Mom had to pretty much be physically restrained by Miss Rose and Miss Rostalina to not go overboard cooking. But in her place, Master Roxy went a bit overboard and tried using magic to cook things. It kind of worked. Minus a few piles of ash from the first few barbecue slices. Sylphie and Eris came back later in the day with a bunch of magic stones. And as a result, they promptly got scolded by the adults for doing reckless tasks and setting bad examples for Norn and Aisha. But altogether, it was fun. Lazy summer days where I relaxed with everyone. Productive nights where I kept track of my research in my diary as well as sorting out future events and potential issues. Brainstorming with Master Roxy about anti-teleportation slash summoning measures. In short, preparations and living as normal of a life as I could to stick it to being W trying to get me riled up. Like that, summer slowly passed by. It was a bit concerning because of how calm things were, but I didn't dwell on that. Too much worry was paralyzing. But not only that, things were different. I was sure of it. Unlike Ridius, being W couldn't directly see what I was doing. Neither could he see what the people around me were doing. Instead, he was probably pulling things in the distance. Setting up unforeseen dangers and foreign lands. Like where Dad was right now. That part was a bit concerning. But Dad was strong. Stronger still than in Ridius's timeline, and there he had been strong enough to be the ace in the hole against a Hydra. Still, I did wonder a bit how he was doing. He was probably fine, right? Chapter 94 A Bridge Questline Paul was not fine. There were a lot of reasons for that, but the main reason was the new friend he had made. Or rather, the person who declared himself Paul's friend after their public bout. Wahaha! Gal Farion clapped his hand onto Paul's shoulder and grinned. Did you see the look on that guy's face? It's like he was seeing a demon from hell or something. Paul laughed and did his best to ignore the white mist wreathed around Gal's body. Yeah. Pilemon was always a bit of a scaredy cat. Gal chuckled and took a long swig from a mug of mead. No wonder you bailed. Hanging around a bunch of stuck-up nobles like this. If it was me, I would have cut them all down, you know? Hmm. 
I'd be lying if I said I didn't think about it before. A private manor in the Nodos territory, set up specifically for the Boreas faction. Late at night. A lot of things had happened since Paul and his companions arrived in Milbit's region. Enough that Paul could probably pin a whole book about the events in the past week alone. But to sum things up, it was a typical cliché, like some of the trashy novels those Azure and Maidens enjoyed reading. Paul showed up at the gates with everyone else. Things went fine until it came time to check in, where Pylemon noticed Paul and demanded something happen. Then the Sword God and Water God popped up out of nowhere and a spontaneous sword tournament happened. Paul ended up in the finals with said Sword God, and then it ended with a draw and Gal Farion declaring Paul his sworn brother which promptly led to the man crashing with Paul and taking advantage of the Boreas family's hospitality. Though, considering that he was Guy Slane's teacher and that he was the sword god, there wasn't much anyone could say about it. Thankfully, the man had the sense to not hang around all the time. And overall, he seemed like a decent person who also knew a lot about sword fighting. A fact that Paul would love to take advantage of to get some tidbits back to Rudy. Except there was the problem about him definitely being controlled or observed by that being Watch McCallit from that white mist following him. A knock echoed, followed by a soft voice. May I come in? Paul did his best to not let out a sigh of relief. Instead, he looked over to the door and smiled. You don't need to be shy, Lily. The door opened, revealing Lilia standing with a tea tray. Since it was late, she was wearing a simple black nightgown instead of her usual maid outfit. Lilia walked over to sit beside Paul. After that, she started pouring a cup of tea and said, Would you like some, Lord Farion? Gal waved his mug around and said, I'm fine. And just call me Gal. Lord Farion. He rubbed his chin and said, Hearing that makes me feel itchy. Understood. Lilia nodded and then looked to Paul. Husband? Thanks, Lily. Paul smiled and took the cup from her. After that, he looked at Gal and said, But being called Lord Farion makes you feel itchy? And you don't care being called a girl? Gal laughed and said, Of course not. He let out a savage grin and said, If they can live after saying it to my face. All right. Paul had to admit, he was starting to feel like he got in over his head a bit here to just try and prove a point to Rudy. Gal Farion was dangerous. Unpredictable, too. He was fine now, but the man was a wolf in disguise. Sharp and feral. Paul had the sense that the only reason Gal was here at all and playing nice was because the sword god was practicing some self-restraint or listening to that being W. But anyway, Gal pointed at Paul and said, You've got a kid, right? Rudy? Planning on sending him to practice in the Holy Land of Swords anytime soon? If he's even half as good as you are, he'll be a god by the time he's through. He laughed and took another swig from his mug. Nina needs a good rival. Gino is all right, but the kid's a bit too dull. Lilia poured herself a cup of tea and then said, Rudy will not be going anywhere in the near future. At the moment, he is still far too young to be considering anything. Right, right. Gal nodded and said, Guess a kid does need some time to play a bit. Though Nina's play always involved her copying me instead of playing with dolls. He drained the rest of his mug and glanced out the window. After that, he stretched and said, Hmm, think I've overstayed my welcome a bit today, so I'll leave it at that. He clapped Paul's shoulder again and said, Nice chatting with you, Paul. Take care of yourself in the festival tomorrow, all right? With those words, Gal left. Silence. Both Paul and Lilia waited until his footsteps faded away. And then just in case, Lilia used one of the spells Rudy loaded onto her bracelet to block out their conversation. After that. This is troublesome. Lilia sipped on her tea and looked at Paul. The sword god is on that being's side. Paul groaned and rubbed his face. I know. Arg. What a mess. And Pierre mentioned that everything would be happening tomorrow too. But with that guy around. Not to mention the water god. Right Araya, the head of the water god style. 
a seemingly frail old woman who had showed up bickering with Gal, but vanished afterwards after mentioning something about repaying a debt. Paul didn't get a chance to spar with her in the tournament, but from what he saw before she left, it was basically what he could do, but better. All the dodging and ultra-instinct techniques that Rudy mentioned. Well, it wasn't the exact same, but Paul's gut told him that would be annoying to fight at the least, and lethal at the worst. Then there was the fact that she also had that white mist around her. Just what the heck does that being W guy want here? Is he doing all of this just to mess with us, or what? Paul couldn't understand it. Lilia frowned and said, it could be the case. However, if that person is truly concerned about Rudy, perhaps his intentions are to persuade you to send him into the lion's den? You mean sending him over to that place? Paul shook his head. Even if I didn't know that guy was pulling strings, I wouldn't do that. Mostly because Rudy might actually kill someone. True. Paul sighed and said, well, whatever. It's happening soon. Pylon's going to send some men out and try to kidnap that girl. Pierre and Philip have got the logistics sorted out, Sorrows through enough of a tantrum to quiet down those Nodos idiots. He smiled and said, after that, we get to go home and have fun with the family again. Yes. But there is still the ball to handle first, husband. Right. That. Paul groaned and said, I'm going to have to smack some heads around for staring at you, aren't I? Well. Lilia sipped on her tea and said, you could always ignore them. Of course, I will just have to tell Rudy how to generate this family of yours is. I think he's already got the picture. But either way, things are going to be messy. As usual. Damn it. Paul rubbed his face and said, Just what the hell did I do to get into this mess? I'm trying to be a good person here, but the world seems out to just screw me over. Lilia leaned on Paul's shoulder and said, It's fine. You're trying. And this time you're thinking things through. You are thinking things through, aren't you? Every second. Then it will be fine. Everything is prepared and in place. Moreover, you are strong. The bow with the sword god proved it, did it not? Paul snorted. Strong enough to not die, yeah. But mostly due to Rudy's sword. Hmm. We will have to thank him when we get back then. I'm going to have to say a lot to Rudy when we get back. Paul furrowed his brow. Like how much of a pain it is to be a hero dash, he paused and then let out a deep sigh. This is what the old man felt, huh? Ugh. Well, I have to at least not be a hypocrite. Melees knows what will happen if Rudy decides he can bend his principles whenever he wants. Lilia massaged Paul's shoulders and said, Yes. Be a good father figure instead of the worthless man in my memories. You are never going to let that go, are you? Lilia laughed and said, just ensuring that you remain a respectable man, Paul. And speaking of respectable men, have you thought about a name for your new child yet? Paul froze. Paul. Paul cleared his throat and said, I, I have a name. Right now. Well, if it's a boy dash, knowing your luck, it will be a daughter. True. In that case. Well, since Zenith is the heavens and Norn is our little goddess. How about Stella? Because right now, a shooting star and a wish would definitely be useful. Chapter 95, A Bridge Conclusion Technique God Laplace, currently known as Pierre Greyrat. A bit of an inside joke with a few different levels, but it was the name he was going by at the moment while making sure nothing went too awry. Today was the day. The day where everything would go down in the capital and fate would change. It would start with the formal ball at lunchtime where all the nobles would come in and do their thing. Trust up and posh, they do a show of power, flaunt their wealth, yadayada. After that, everyone would be released into the night to celebrate the midsummer festival among the common folk where wine, beer, and all sorts of drinks would be served. A full day of festivities and the day where Tristina Purple Horse would be kidnapped and forced to serve as the Azura Kingdom Prime Minister's personal sex slave for the next ten or so years if time flowed as it normally should. 
but that wouldn't happen here. At least, that was the plan. The city capital would be packed with people and nobles from all around, so acting would be a bit tricky. But things were set up and a lot of coordination with Philip and Soros. Mostly Philip. Anyway, there was a foolproof plan to make things work and reduce both casualties and damage. Like that, destiny would change and things would work out. And in changing destiny, Pierre would have more room to act and less restraints on his powers and fighting against being W down the line. In theory. That was the entire framework behind old Ridius's attempt to go back in time and something that Pierre had refined and tested. It was simple. Obvious. Cause and effect still existed in this world, even if it wasn't similar to Earth. So if Pierre wanted an effect far in the future, he needed to change the cause in the present to make that happen. But if he tried to break causality by doing too much, then the world would push back on him and things would fly out of hand. Mostly by making this world's Rudy either see him as the enemy or develop into a terrifying force that would result in the entire timeline being forcibly pruned by reality. In theory. It hadn't happened yet, and Pierre didn't want to see if that would actually happen. Mostly because if it did, he had a feeling that the pruning wouldn't affect this timeline's Rudy because of the stunt being W tried earlier in trying to mix an alternate Rudius with Rudy. Well, that and because Pierre was serving as the anchor in this reality while the other side figured out how to tie things up on that end so they could finish this in one go. So as long as Pierre played by the rules and didn't do anything too crazy like say rush up to the Azura Kingdom's first prince and lop his head off while instilling Princess Ariel as the rightful heir. And so long as he didn't announce himself as Laplace until a certain event came to pass, everything should be fine. In theory. Yes, in theory. But in practice, a sword cut towards Pierre's neck. As it did, space itself seemed to ripple. Blades, lashing out at him from every direction all at once. But that was an illusion. Pierre swept his own sword up to meet the approaching blade. Holding his sword with his left hand, Pierre flicked his wrist and then stomped on the ground with his right foot. A clear sound echoed through the air. A beautiful chime that shouldn't have emerged from clashing steel. Oh ho! An elderly female voice echoed, followed by the sound of rustling robes. Right Rhea, the strongest water god swordsman, and someone who should not be here. Rita smiled and said, to stop my blade and nullify deprivation sword kingdom. It seems that man was right. There truly was some interesting sights to experience during this midsummer festival. Pierre smiled back, resisting the urge to cut her down now to eliminate the problems later. Instead, he said, I'm honored to face such a splendid secret technique. Don't play the fool. Rita pulled her sword back and said, that isn't even your dominant hand. Though, for a dragon race, I suppose us humans are mere insects in your eyes. Pierre took a quick glance at his surroundings. Chaos. That was the only way to describe it. Knights and adventurers clashing in the streets. The ordinary townsfolk scrambling to get as far away as possible. Men bearing various coats of arms clashing in the streets with shouts of heretics and traitors. That old man sorrows smashing people trying to take advantage of the chaos with his fists while shouting about honor and duty. Heh. Some things didn't change in the end. But the most important people. There. Paul and Lilia were moving with Geislane to intercept a carriage heading out of the city. And fast in pursuit, there was Philip and Hilda, guarded by Galfarion. Arg, what even was this timeline? Pierre thought that being W sent those two here to stop him from rescuing Tristina, but his influence was completely gone from them and had spread to the knights instead. And then there were the hordes of monsters closing in from the distance that seemed to just coincidentally appear. Being W had lost it. There was no other explanation for it. Monsters randomly appearing in droves was inevitable. That was a fixed event in this timeline since the metastasis event was nullified. But it was far too early for that. And considering the flow of mana, it hadn't happened yet. This was a localized event. Something that being W dropped in just to stir the pot. Or did he get baited that hard by Paul and Lilia showing up here? A flash of silver. Pierre leaned back, 
narrowly dodging Rida's sword. TCH. The water god pulled her sword away and said, as I thought. Even after reaching this level, it's not enough to qualify meeting your gaze. Pierre glanced at the chaos around him and said, I'm simply concerned with the surroundings. Are you going to ignore the innocents? It's a pity. But if I let someone like you off, I won't be able to repay my debt to that man. Ryder raised her blade again and said, It isn't now, but I know. You intend to remove him in the future. The Prime Minister is in the way of the Princess, after all. Pierre narrowed his eyes. And you seem to know a lot more than you should. Ryder laughed and said, Well, I guess you can say this old woman had a divine revelation. So, she aimed her sword back at Pierre and said, Shall we dance? Pierre stared at Rida and then let out a deep sigh. After that, he raised his sword and muttered, Why was it multiverse theory? Why couldn't it just have been two divergent timelines winding back on itself? This would have been so much easier if I could have just done a time leap instead. Pardon? Pierre shook his head. Let's just get this act over with Dash. You. A cold and intimidating male voice called out from the side. But while it was cold and intimidating, a hint of confusion could be detected in it. At least by Pierre. Mostly because he knew the speaker very well. He had to, considering that he stole that guy's identity to pull off some ploys in the background. Even so, Pierre groaned. It's official. Hidegami's gone off the deep end. All of these half-baked developments are just like an amateur trashy web novel, ah, uh, crap. Immense pressure. An explosion of mana, flooding the air with crimson and sending people flying in every direction from the sheer force of it. And then Pierre suddenly had a fist rushing towards his face, courtesy of Orsted. Live. A giant explosion echoed from behind. Paul glanced back briefly before focusing his attention back in front of him. Lilia looked up at Paul from her spot in his arms and said, Do you think it's fine? Paul nodded and said, That Pierre guy's in the city. Not sure how strong he is, but unless someone like Orsted comes along, things should be fine. I think that I see Orsted's mana in that mix though. It'll be fine. Right. Paul didn't know Pierre very well, despite the guy seeming really familiar for some reason. But he knew Pierre well enough that he could take care of things. Though Paul was confused on why Orsted was there. Did Rudy send the guy? A trump card in case things went too far south? Paul continued talking and said, He's probably a contingency plan of our genius son anyway. Ah. Lilia nodded and said, Rudy would do something like that. Right? At that time, a dense poison mist flew towards them. Paul wrinkled his nose and then swung his sword through the air, aiming at the cloud. Silver light flashed along Paul's sword before it exploded, splitting the mist apart and erasing it. In the distance, a faint male voice called out. That's impossible. They said that bastard was just a sword saint. Another faint male voice echoed. Forget about his rank. That mist should have been enough to take out a sword king. How did he just blow it apart? Even a king rank healing mage wouldn't be able to detox it. What is that guy? A magic swordsman? Lilia chuckled and said, It seems like your brother underestimated you. More like my paranoid son overprepared me. Paul frowned and said, How the hell did he know that the Nodos family had a bunch of North Saints and North Kings on the payroll? I didn't even know there were that many around here. Isn't the base for them in the magic continent? The current head of the North God style was a demon lord or something, right? Well, whatever the case. Lilia adjusted her glasses and then looked at the frantically fleeing carriage. Should we end this play and rescue the fair maiden? As much as I've enjoyed spending time with you, I do believe we should hurry home. True. Paul shifted his grip on Lilia and said, Do you want me to finish it, or do you want to try out Rudy's gift? I had enough fun using it on those nobles, so I'm fine. All right. Paul nodded and then focused. As he did, his vision changed. Normally invisible lights flickered into existence. And as it did, 
a faint silver light stretched out from Paul's sword, resonating with the surrounding lights. Then I'll finish this in one blow dash. Don't forget about the girl. Two blows. Error. You can handle the aftermath, right? Lilia rolled her eyes and then reached up to adjust her bracelet. I will prepare the barrier spell, yes. Great. Then on three. One. Two. Three. Pure white light flashed as a barrier formed around the kidnapped girl lying in the carriage. Countless silver lights flashed as Paul's sword and battle aura shot out, tearing everything except for the barrier into shreds. Paul came to a stop staring blankly at the sight of the bound-up girl floating above a giant crater where a carriage had just been. A carriage that was nowhere to be seen, along with the abductors and operators that had just been there a second ago. There wasn't even any crimson mist or dust. Just nothing. Lilia gave Paul a pointed look. Husband? Paul cleared his throat and said, In my defense, Rudy overprepared me for this. It was the sword. It was definitely the sword. Paul didn't do anything different. He was just swinging his sword like usual. Okay, maybe he was swinging it more than usual. Instead of trying to hit three times at once, he was hitting a bunch of times at once. But even then, it shouldn't have vaporized the bad guys and the carriage. Silence. The girl, Tristina Purple Horse, slowly spun around in the air and turned to look at Paul with wide eyes. At that time, horses whinnied from behind as another carriage pulled up. Philip and the rest of the rescue party. When they did, booming laughter echoed. Galfarion. I knew it! Paul, you bastard. You were holding out on me. And after that, in the name of St. Melis and all that is above, what did I tell you about keeping a low profile, cousin? Philip said his piece. Paul wanted to respond. He wanted to say that it was Rudy's fault for being so paranoid and giving him a crazy sword that seemed to be able to rip apart space itself. But then he remembered how things had been going so far whenever he said something. So instead, Paul just laughed and then shut his mouth. Chapter 96 Child's Play I stared at the bag of magic stones and coins that Sylphie handed me. After that, I looked back at her and said, so you went adventuring all by yourselves. Fought monsters, did tasks for the villagers, just to get me some gifts? Eris cleared her throat and said, it wasn't my idea. I just wanted some training. But Sylphie said that you needed some things too, so. She mumbled and said, I thought I might as well help get you something to cheer you up. It was early morning. The day after the party to celebrate my return to normalcy or whatever was considered normal for me according to mom. I personally thought it was a bit excessive, but everyone had fun so I played along with it. And now today we return to our normal routine. At least, that was the plan. I hadn't gotten the chance to spend much time with Sylphie and Eris, so I wanted to grab the two of them early in the morning and do some fun games to just enjoy the nice summer weather. Maybe shoot some hoops, knock down some bowling pins, or some other makeshift game I could think of. Except, the two showed up first thing in the morning to wake me up instead and drag me outside before handing me that bag of magic stones and coins. I looked between Sylphie and Eris before frowning, lost in thought. This was definitely different. Unexpected too. I didn't expect them to get along so well. Or so easily. I mean, Eris really didn't give a good first impression. And Sylphie seemed like she was planning to hold that grudge against Eris for a long time. But it seemed like they made up and were best friends now. Well, Eris thought that at least. Verdict was still out on what Sylphie thought about Eris, but it seemed like she wasn't mad at Eris. Anyway, magic stones and coins. It was a good amount of both. Definitely not an amount you could get by just half-heartedly playing as adventurers and helping out the villagers. No. This was the result of honest and diligent hard work, all for my sake. Thinking about it like that. I coughed and scratched my nose, trying to avoid the heat rushing to my face. T thanks. B but don't do it without me next time, alright? It's dangerous going out by yourself. 
Sylphie let out a bright smile and then rushed over to hug me. Yes. Rudy's coming adventuring with us next time, Ari. Eris walked over with her arms crossed. Glancing at me, she blushed and then looked away. Oh, of course. It's obvious he would. I mean, it's probably boring just sitting around like that all day, right wait. She rounded on Sylphie and said, since when did I let you call me Eri? I spun Sylphie around a bit after she hugged me and then set her off to my side. After that, I looked at Eris and said, what's wrong with Eri? T that. Eris stumbled over her words and then said, I, I just don't like it, okay. Call me Eris. Eris, not Eri. Sylphie pouted. But Eri is cuter. The red on Eris's face spread to her ears. After that, she huffed and said, W whatever. Anyway. She pointed at me and said, Rudy. I looked back at her and nodded. Eris. Sylphie said you played a bunch of games with her in the past. I raised an eyebrow and slowly said, I did. And? I did my best to keep a straight face and said, Did you want to play too? And me? Play a game? Eris crossed her arms and said, A as if. I just. Don't believe you. Right, I don't believe you. So you have to show it to me. Like that hoop game thing. My lip twitched. Seeing her do her best to pretend not to be interested was too funny to not react. Was this why Sylphie changed her mind about Eris? Looking at her like that, I was really tempted to bully her a bit. I really wanted to mess with her and see how she cracked under the pressure. But that would be mean. Besides, while she was having fun right now, officially she was sold out by her dad to be my fiancé and was living with us because it was supposedly a foregone conclusion. Taking her circumstances into account, that would be cruel and immature to bully her. Especially since she didn't have a say in any of how it turned out. Though I was really tempted. But now. I would be a mature and responsible young adult, child. Kid? Kid. Definitely still a kid. So instead of laughing at her antics, I gave a serious nod and said, All right. Then. How about we make a bet? Eris looked at me and frowned. A bet? Ah. Guess I can't help it after all. I flicked my wrist and changed the surrounding area. The grassy plains smoothed over before hardening into something like asphalt. A stone pillar shot up before forming the familiar shape of a basketball hoop, along with the backboard and a small net made of loose grass fibers. With that done, I held out my right hand and made a basketball from my mana. Or something close to it. Still wasn't used to that whole mana is everything axiom that Rudius discovered. I couldn't just visualize and create super detailed things just yet from raw mana, but an ordinary rubbish ball was definitely possible. And like that, one of those bouncy kickballs spun into existence in the palm of my hand. Sylphie's eyes widened after taking everything in and then she clapped her hands. Amazing, Rudy! She looked at me and said, Did you get better at magic? You must have figured out a lot of cool things studying, didn't you? Something like that. I bounced the rubber ball on the ground, testing the rebound. It was a bit less than I wanted, but it should be enough for this. I spun it around in my hand and then looked back at Eris. How about this? We play a small game trying to toss the ball into the hoop. We'll take turns trying to match each other's shot, and whoever misses three first loses. Eris scoffed. That's it? Easy. Right? I nodded. It would be. So then let's raise the stakes. The winner gets to have one wish granted by the loser. Sylphie's eyes suddenly flashed, thoughtfully eyeing the ball and the hoop. I quickly interjected before she got any strange ideas and said, You're the referee, Sylphie. Ah. Sylphie frowned and said, I wanted Rudy to grant my wish, though. But I would do that anyway. Really? Sylphie hugged me and said, Rudy's the best. That's a promise, okay? No takebacks. I feel like I just made a terrible mistake. But at the same time, 
I also felt like I dodged a bullet. Was this because of Dad? I feel like this was because of Dad. It's gotta be his influence or something. Did he tell too many tall tales about the Azura Kingdom to Sylphie before he left when he was trying to explain why I got engaged to Eris? Speaking of Eris, she stared at me and then slowly nodded. Fine. I'll play. But if I win, I want you to teach me. I blinked. Teach you what? That thing. Eris swung her sword around and said, the swoosh swoosh. Paul said that you gave him a secret technique to let him do it, so I want that. Sure. Didn't know what she was talking about, but it wouldn't matter anyway. Not like I would lose. And if I win? I thought about it for a bit and then nodded. If I win, you have to learn how to read. There. Something not too embarrassing while also being useful. That was fine, right? Sylphie blinked. Eh? Read? She looked at Eris and said, You don't know how to read, Eris? She paused and then her eyes lit up in understanding. Oh! Is that why you think reading's boring? If you didn't know how to read, you should have told me. We can read stories together and I can teach you. Eris didn't respond to Sylphie. Instead, she glared at me, her long crimson hair actually swaying in the wind from her killing intent. Or so it seemed. In reality, it was just a summer breeze idly passing by. The killing intent was real though. Eris deliberately unhooked the sword she always carried and set it off on the edge of the court. After that, she walked over to me and crossed her arms. So? Let's start already. I bounced the ball a few times and then nodded. All right. Then. Should I go first or dash? Give me that. Eris snatched the ball away from me and then bounced it a few times to get a feel for it. Then she raised it up, aimed, and completely missed the rim. Don't laugh. Definitely don't laugh. You absolute can't. PFT. Just take your turn already. Dummy! I laughed and held my hand out to summon the ball back. Well, summon by conjuring winds to push it back. You're supposed to shoot it like this, Airy. I held the ball up like a basketball and then jumped. A perfect swish. I turned to her and smiled. See? Eris gnashed her teeth and then stomped off to grab the ball. Oh yeah. This was going to be fun. A bit mean, but... I mean, she apparently beat me up all the time in another timeline, so this was just fair play, right? Chapter 97, Mother's Relief Zenith smiled as she stared at Rudy playing with Sylphie and Eris in the distance. Sitting on a chair in the courtyard and enjoying the warm sunlight, she let out a soft sigh and rested her hand over her belly. I'm relieved. It looks like everything will be going back to normal before you get here. Her son had returned back to his lively and playful self. And instead of holding himself up and constantly looking like he was carrying the weight of the world on his shoulders, he was acting like a kid again. Playing games, acting carefree with his friends. Though Zenith was a bit concerned for when he and the girls got a bit older. Rudy seemed to be taking more after Paul with every day. Not in terms of intelligence, of course. Thankfully, her son seemed to have gotten his brains from her side of the family instead of the Grey Rats. Unfortunately, he also seemed to have picked up that infamous Grey Rat charm with none of the lecherous traits. Paired with his striking looks due to his white hair as well as the inevitable trained body he would have when puberty hit. They look like they're having fun, aren't they? A calm and mature female voice. Zenith looked up to see Rostalina walk over, carrying two steaming mugs. Rostalina raised one and said, T? Zenith smiled and took the mug. Thanks, Lena. Rostalina leaned against the wall and looked out at Rudy and the girls before smiling. Looks like he's back to the cute baby boy you gushed about, isn't he? Zenith stared back at Rudy and nodded. He is, thankfully. In the distance, Rudy was playing a ball game with Eris, bouncing it against the ground before shooting it into a standing hoop. 
It was mildly concerning about how he seemed to be able to continually do ridiculous feats with magic, but Zenith took it as par for the course at this point. What was important was that her son was finally acting like an ordinary kid again. The child that he was instead of the mature adult he had been trying to act as until now. Zenith sipped on her tea, enjoying the warmth. Both from the beverage, the sun, and the peaceful side of watching Rudy play. After watching for a bit though, she glanced back at Rostalina and said, Are Norn and Aisha still sleeping, Lena? Yep. Rostalina nodded and said, Roxy is keeping an eye on them right now while Rose is preparing breakfast. Zenith sighed and said, You three are lifesavers. She couldn't even imagine how things would be if it was just herself right now. Ah, no. She could imagine. Rudy would still be acting as mature as he could and fussing over her because he would be worried about her pregnancy. And then he would also be taking care of Norn and Aisha, probably burning the midnight oil to work on his training in the meanwhile. Rostalina patted Zenith's shoulder and said, Don't worry about it. After all, we'll be family in the future, right? Zenith gave Rostalina a blank stare. I hope you mean that because of Sylphie, Lena. Rostalina rolled her eyes and said, For the last time, I'm not a cradle robber, Zenny. Or a homewrecker. Zenith kept staring at Rostalina. Rostalina coughed and added, T these days, at least. I have a proper man who is everything I always wanted, so it's fine. Zenith sipped on her tea and then nodded. Yes. The mysterious man who still has yet to make an appearance. Rostalina sipped her own tea and said, Well, he's a busy man working on great things. If you say so, Lena. I do say so. And speaking of men. Rostalina reached into her blouse and pulled out a letter. Your hubby wrote a letter for you. Hmm? Zenith set her tea on the ground and took the letter. A letter? Already? It was about a week's journey to Milbots. Even if Paul sent a letter by carrier pigeon, it should still be a few days until it arrived. Yep. Rostalina nodded and said, You can thank my beloved for that. He's a fantastic magician. When he has the energy for it. She paused and said, I hope he's still topped up from our little quickie. Then again, if he isn't. He he. Zenith decided to ignore Rostalina for the moment. Instead of paying attention to the still lewd older elf woman, Zenith flipped open the letter and started reading. Sure enough, it was Paul's handwriting. And mixed in between that, there were notes in Lilia's handwriting too. It wasn't some prank that Lena was playing on her then. Zenith still had questions on how exactly the letter got here, but she decided to worry about that later. Hey babe! Don't worry about us. A lot of crazy things happened since we got here, but everything got resolved pretty quickly. Paul is understating a lot of what occurred, but rest assured, everything is settled. Right. What Lily said. Wrote? Wrote. Anyway, we're fine and on the way back home. Pierre said that he'd magic this letter over somehow, so by the time you get this we should already be on the road back. Zenith stopped reading and looked up at Rostalina. Is Pierre the name of your man, Lena? Well. Rostalina sipped on her tea and said, It's not his name, but it's what he's calling himself these days. A bit like how I used to go by Elinalize. Like Elinalize, H.M.? Zenith was still skeptical, but she went back to reading. Mission was a complete success. Probably too successful. Rudy definitely overprepped us. Did you know that the sword he made me can tear space apart? It's crazy. And let's not get started on the bracelet he made for Lily. Asterisk it was fun. And quite amusing to see the reactions on rude nobles after they faced Rudy's wrath. Indirectly, of course, asterisk. Lily says amusing. I say a boatload of trouble, paired with a lot of scolding by Philip. Still funny though. But anyway, we saved the girl. The Purple Horse family owes Philip a debt now. My bratty younger brother also got ousted as the Noto's head because of being involved in the kidnapping. There was a bit of a scuffle about me immediately becoming the next head, 
but Uncle Soros is sorting that out. I think he's going to be the temporary leader for a while since he's technically half Nodos. Obviously, those stuffy nobles weren't happy about it. But it turns out that the girl we saved is Princess Ariel's best friend and she was there visiting, so it somehow worked out. Well, Orsted's appearance helped settle things pretty quickly too. Thank our kid for pulling that ace out his sleeve when you get the chance, alright? Though I'm wondering how he got in contact with Orsted without any of us knowing, but I'll bug him about that when we get back. Orsted? That rude and dangerous guy who showed up to attack everyone? He went to help Paul and the others with the mission? Zenith frowned and glanced back over at Rudy. It seemed like she might need to have another chat with her son about secret plotting again. Something wrong, Zenny? Rostelina glanced over and said, Is Paul being an idiot? The answer to that is yes. Zenith looked back at the letter and said, My beloved husband is always an idiot. A good intention one, but still an idiot. Though he seems to be self-aware these days, at least. And from how it seemed to go, having Lily there to rein him in was definitely the smart thing to do. Though it seemed like she went a bit wild as well. But they were probably just perverted as your nobles, so Zenith couldn't blame her. Now, what else was there? Anyway, that person looks like he tried some things, but we pulled through. Let Rudy know so he can relax, all right? And tell him that Dad's going to rub it in his face as soon as I get back. Ooh. And we're coming back with some guests. Philip and Hilda wanted to check up on Eris, so they're coming. Geislane is coming back too, of course. Jisoo slipped off somewhere during the trip to meet an old friend, so he's not coming. But we've got a few more interesting people tagging along who want to meet Rudy. That is because Paul does not know how to say no. Hey! I tried. I suppose. In any case. Be back soon. We brought souvenirs too. Love you lots. Paul. Asterisk I will make sure to keep him grounded, Zenny. Rest assured, asterisk. Lilia. P.S. For our new kid, what do you think about Stella? Knowing my luck, it's probably a girl. I was thinking about names and we really need a wish right now, so since you're the heavens, how about Stella? You know, like a shooting star? On paper, that sounds kind of weird, doesn't it? H.M. And, uh, she hasn't been born yet, right? Hopefully? Maybe? If she has, um. Either way, love you, Zenny. Zenith finished reading the letter and sighed. You're the same as always, dear. Rostelina glanced over and said, So an idiot. Mm, seems like he's getting better. Zenith folded the letter and tucked it away. Though if he was aware of the risk of our child being born before he got back, he should have put more thought into a name before he left. PFT Rostelina laughed and said, Did he just think of one in the letter? Zenith nodded. Yes. Though. She placed her hand over her belly and said, It's not too bad. Stella. Like a shooting star. Rudy was already her lucky charm. Zenith's miracle baby boy that led to her having everything she ever wanted. But at this time. We really could use a wish right now. A soft thump. The baby kicking a bit, as if responding to Zenith's feelings. She smiled and then picked up her mug from the ground, sipping on her tea as she watched Rudy play in the distance. Well, more like watched Rudy tease Eris by showing her up in whatever game they were playing. Her son's teenage years were going to be just as eventful as his father's, weren't they? Chapter 98 Stars Alliance I laughed at Eris's pouting face. It couldn't be helped. Her usually brash and standoffish expression had been turned into a watery-eyed pout that reminded me of a certain useless blue-haired goddess. Of course, it didn't start out that way. After the first game of basketball, Eris was still determined. She was still her spunky, competitive, and energetic self. And then she kept losing. Losing, but refusing to accept defeat. I also had to give her credit. Because she was so stubborn, 
I didn't have time to do anything but create more sports equipment and compete against her. And so I spent a week doing nothing but creating new sports grounds, equipment, and teaching Eris how to play various sports while she tried to beat me, doubling down on bets each time. Today was the seventh day. And the sport of the day was tennis. Something that should be right up her alley. After all, swinging a racket around wasn't much different than a sword. Or so I thought. But, Eris stared at me with her watery eyes and then pointed at me with her racket. You're terrible, Rudy. Terrible. I walked over to her side of the court and shook my head. I'm sorry, Eri. But you're just too fun to tease. I reached out to pat her head like I did with Sylphie to cheer her up. Eris flinched and moved as if she was trying to dodge my hand. But then she hopped and stood still instead, pretending to endure the humiliation. Though, considering she was blushing instead of turning red from anger or embarrassment, it seemed that she liked it. Still wasn't entirely sure why she did, but I wasn't about to complain when I had an easy way to defuse an otherwise violent Sundara. While Eris was calming down, I set my racket down on the side and took a look around. We were in the back of the second house. Specifically, we were on the tennis court that I made in the back of the second house. It was actually a bit weird now that I took a look at everything. I'd been too busy hustling Eris on bets that I didn't pay attention, but it seemed that I accidentally made our house look like something straight out of Hollywood. There was a fenced area with an Olympic-sized swimming pool, the basketball court I made the first day of our competition, this tennis court, a sand volleyball court. In short, a super luxurious place that looked like it belonged to some A-list celebrity back on Earth. Which meant that it stuck out like a sore thumb here in this fantasy world that had nothing but rolling green hills and farmland all around. Though, the second house wasn't the only one that looked a bit off now. I glanced back at our first house and stared at the new addition I made for Norn and Aisha. A tiny jungle gym set with short monkey bars and a few Olympic rings. A mini gazebo with various slides. A swing set, and then a deep bed of soft wooden chips underneath everything to break any falls. In short, a cute little playground for my energetic younger sisters to play at and not drive Mom, Master Roxy, or Miss Rose up the wall. And it looked like they were already up and at it with Aisha chasing Norn around while Miss Rostalina sat on a bench and watched them. Hmph. Eris huffed and then jabbed a finger in my chest. You're ignoring me again. I laughed and said, I'm not ignoring you. I'm just giving you a bit of space to cool down. You worked up a bit of a sweat running around like that, you know? Eris crossed her arms and said, That's because you cheated. There's no way a ball can just spin off to the sides like that when they hit the ground. They totally can. And I showed you already. I pulled out a tennis ball from my pocket and then picked up my racket. You just have to hit the ball at an angle. Like this. I tossed the ball and sliced my racket through the air, brushing the side of the ball. A yellow arc flew over the net, the ball spinning through the air. And then when it hit the ground, it curved even more, shooting off to the side. See? Eris stared at the ball. Then she looked at me and tossed her head to the side, flicking her crimson hair. Stupid show off. I smiled. At that time, the door to our house opened and Sylphie walked out with a stack of cups and an ice pitcher of water. She glanced at Eris and then giggled. Looks like you two are having a lot of fun again. Eris huffed and said, You mean Rudy keeps bullying me again. Sylphie poured a cup of water and handed it to Eris. It's all in good fun, Eri. And you're enjoying it too, aren't you? Eris took the cup and scoffed. Me? Enjoy playing with that guy? Never. So she said, but Eris couldn't hide the way her eyes lit up at the answer. Definitely a baked Sundara. Though surprisingly more dear than Sun like how she was in the other timeline. Was that because of Sylphie being here too? The fact that I was undeniably stronger than Eris? Or the fact that our relationship dynamic wasn't a student teacher, but friends hanging out together every day? After all, I wasn't forcing Eris to do any studying. 
except for when I snuck in fun games to teach her stuff like basic arithmetic to keep track of scores, or when I taught letters by disguising it as a game similar to Pig when we were shooting hoops. Sylphie giggled and then poured a cup of water out for me. Here you go, Rudy. Thanks, Sylphie. I took the cup and sipped on it. Refreshing. The water was pure, cold, and clear. Probably because Sylphie conjured it up instead of drawing it from our usual water well. Magic was definitely convenient like that. Which reminded me that I needed to experiment making food sometimes. Or at the least basic ingredients like salt and sugar. Never knew when something like that might come in handy. Sylphie formed a crystal chair and then sat down, pouring herself a cup of water. After that, she tossed the pitcher to the side, turning it into a shimmering mist. Eris noticed and frowned. You're a show-off too, Sylphie. Hmm? Sylphie tilted her head. Show-off? Nothing. Eris sighed and took another sip from her cup. After that, she looked at me and frowned. So what are you going to make me do today, Rudy? Write more numbers? Read more books? Do something even more embarrassing? I made a pair of chairs, one for myself and one across from me for Eris. She noticed and sat down, pursing her lips. I sat down too and said, I'm not that mean, Airy. Her eye twitched. Seemed like she still didn't like being called that. Tough luck though. A bet was a bet. Anyway. I took a sip from my cup and said, since you lost today. I hummed, thinking about a productive use of our time. It had been fun just relaxing for a while and messing with Eris. And it was hilarious watching our various spectators react to Eris's exaggerated facial expressions. It had also been adorable hearing Norn and Aisha cheer for either me or Eris depending on the day. Not to mention all the practice I got making things out of pure mana from having to accommodate all of Eris's stubborn challenges. But as much as I enjoyed all of that, plus how it helped me lighten up after all the stress, it was about time I got back to work prepping on things. Not completely, of course. Spending time with friends and family were just as important as preparing for the future. Didn't want to fall into the trap being W set to make me a demonic overlord holding onto everyone with an iron fist. But for now. At that time, I noticed Master Roxy walking back from the distance, finishing with her morning patrol. And then I had an idea. I looked at Eris again. She wasn't mad, but she looked super irritated no, resigned. Morale at an all-time low, despite me trying to cheer her up a bit with that head pat. In that case. You wanted to learn that swish swish move, right, Eri? Eris paused. And then her eyes widened and she jumped out of her chair. Really? She grabbed my hand and said, You're going to teach me? I did my best to not smile at the irony of her saying that and instead nodded. That's right. And I think it's about time we all had some proper magic lessons again too. Now to robe Master Roxy and to see if we could turn Eris into some kind of magic swordswoman to keep her preoccupied for a while so that I could work on other stuff again. Live. On the outskirts of the Citadel of Roa, a pair of carriages were lined up, having just stopped by for a resupply and rest stop. Sitting at the front of one of those carriages, Paul took a long drink from a pint of mead and then shook his head, glancing at their tagalongs from Milbots. And when he did, he sighed and took another long drink from his mead. So these are the lands you have come to call your home, Nanny? A beautiful and refined girl's voice echoed. Lilia let out a somewhat strained smile and nodded. Indeed. Though I am no longer your nanny, princess. The second princess of the Azura Kingdom, Ariel Animoy Azura. A beautiful young girl with light blonde hair and clear blue eyes. Sitting on Lilia's lap, she shook her head and said, Nanny is Nanny. And I still owe you a life debt for saving me. Lilia's smile grew more strained at that. Paul shifted his gaze away from them and towards the other occupant in the carriage. Specifically, the one responsible for this entire mess of having Princess Ariel come to visit the far-off Bina village. Orsted looked up at Paul, his gaze as stern and harsh as always. What? Nothing. 
Paul turned his gaze back to the front and prepared to set off. He blamed Rudy for dragging Dodd Orsted to make a public appearance and declare Princess Ariel under his protection, then to align himself with Paul and support him as the proper head of the Nodos family, and finally to personally escort Princess Ariel on a summer vacation trip to and from Vina Village. The same princess who wanted to see with her own eyes the boy who took her nanny away from her. It was a mess. But on the bright side, Paul would get to spend time with his cute baby girls again and goof off for a while and rub it in Rudy's face about how nothing terrible happened and how the entire situation with the Nodos family had been cleaned up, leaving them in the clear for things to go back to normal. Unless Princess Ariel wasn't happy about things. Though Paul did rescue the princess's best friend, so things wouldn't evolve too much. Damn it. Maybe he really should train more seriously like Gal said, if only to figure out how to get to that being watch him call it and smack him in the face for making Paul's life so complicated. Chapter 99, The Violent Girl's Maturity and the New Guests Flames wreathed Eris's body, wrapping tightly around her clothes before gathering in the sword she held. As they did, the silver blade turned a bright orange hue and emitted a searing light. It was terrifying. At least, it should have been. To see all of that fire envelop her, feel the heat on her skin, and then watch it converge in her sword. If it was any other time, Eris would have panicked. But now! A calm female voice echoed from the side. Miss Roxy's. The blue-haired mage turned towards Rudy and said, My dear disciple. At this point, I am convinced that you are causing the people around you to develop unnatural magical tendencies. Rudy's face turned red and he scratched the back of his head. I, it's not my fault, okay? I guess I'm just, a very good teacher? Roxy let out a deep sigh. Rudy shifted his gaze to Eris and frowned. It is a bit weird though. I didn't think you had a talent for magic, Eri. Eris dispersed the flames on her sword and then huffed. I'm not stupid, Rudy. You said it, not me. Eris felt her eye twitch, but she didn't give Rudy the satisfaction of knowing she was annoyed. No. That guy would just quietly laugh at her again if he knew. Stupid and weird Rudy. Eris still didn't get why he liked seeing her mad all the time and called her cute. It'd be one thing if he was just making fun of her because he wanted to annoy her, but he was serious when he said that he liked seeing her cute pouting face. Weirdo. Didn't he like Sylphie? Saying stuff like that to her. He was as bad as his dad. Eris shook her head and then checked her sword one more time. It was like Rudy said. Complicated magic stuff didn't make sense to Eris, but when it came to sword things, it was easy. And most things were sword things if you thought about it. Letters? They were just a bunch of lines cut together. Numbers? It was just counting how many times you did something. And even the weird multiplication thing Rudy mentioned was just grouping things together. Like how two times two or whatever was just Papa Papa. A group of two double hits. So magic. Eris couldn't figure out how to do the crazy things that Sylphie did like fly or make all sorts of ice stuff out of thin air. But if it was just hitting things. Eris raised her sword again and pointed it at the makeshift target Rudy made. For good measure, she took a look around her surroundings to make sure it was clear. Rudy had moved them all a bit away from the house and the sports grounds. Mostly because he was worried about Eris doing something ridiculous and blowing the house up. Stupid Rudy. Like she would ever do that. Unlike Sylphie, she was careful about these sorts of things. Eris wasn't like the scary younger elf girl who would freeze an entire forest just to kill a single wolf. It was all about control. Balance. Besides, Eris knew better. There were scary people out there who could hit back harder. Like Sylphie. So no. When it came to magic, Eris was going to be careful. Careful and controlled and focusing on a single thing. And right now. Rudy and Miss Roxy were standing off to the side, keeping an eye on Eris. Sylphie was sitting in a crystal chair, idly swinging her feet while reading a magic textbook. Still, 
A faint swirl of snow around her showed that she was prepared for any unexpected events. So it was fine. Eris didn't have to worry about them. And for her target, the dummy was facing away from both houses. Which meant that even in the impossible case that Eris missed, it would be fine. So, Rudy called out and said, Are you just going to stand there all day, Eri? I don't mind, but if you are I'm going to go practice my magic. Eris glared at him and said, I'm focusing. Focus faster then? You'd be knocked down already in a real fight, you know? Roxy gave Rudy a blank stare and said, Only if the fight was with Saint-ranked or higher opponent, Rudy. Art most? Do you even understand how few are? No, I suppose you don't. We never did cover that. Ha. Huh. More common sense that I failed to teach you. Ha. Huh. Eris ignored them. Focus. Right, she had to focus. Rudy promised that he would take notes on how she used magic and teach her how to do it better if she managed to pull off a proper hit. So she couldn't miss this chance. Especially since that guy kept winning in every stupid game they played. This was the only chance she had for him to take her seriously, so... She imagined it. The way that Paul seemed to draw in all the air around him when he moved to attack. How Sylphie did the same thing with her ice magic. It was simple. Like Rudy said, everything was like a sword. And while Eris couldn't see magic since that spell or whatever didn't work on her, she could feel it. So she just had to do it. Rudy was right. She hated how he always teased her and how he randomly looked super cool with his white hair and shining green eyes, but he hadn't been wrong. Whenever she listened to him, she always instantly got better. So he was right about this too. If Eris just imagined what she wanted, believed it would happen, and then trusted in her sword, it would work. And right now, what she wanted. Eris took a deep breath. As she did, she imagined it. The warmth from the flames, the way it wrapped around her and then went into her sword. Her vision narrowed, focusing directly on her target. As it did, she sheathed her sword and shifted her stance. Moving her left foot back, leaning forward on her right, resting her hand over the sword hilt just like Guy Slain taught her. Wait a minute. How the hell dash? Rudy. Ahem. How the heck is that possible? Mana shouldn't dash. The world turned silent. Eris's attention reached the peak and she felt her body heat up. The warmth of the flames from before growing. And then she moved. Ha! One slash. Eris kicked off the ground and swung her sword. As she did, she released the breath she was holding. And when she did, a roar. Flames surging out like a dragon's breath. No. That was what she wanted to see. But it wasn't good enough. Her sword cut into the dummy and a surge of flames erupted, turning it into ash. But it wasn't anywhere close to the amount she wanted. Still, it worked. It worked. Eris grinned and then spun around to look at Rudy. Ha! She sheathed her sword and pointed at him. See? I told you I can use magic. Um. Yeah. Rudy's eyes were shut tight and he was turned off to the side. You did great, Eri. But. I think you went a bit overboard. Huh? Eris frowned and crossed her arms. Why are you dash? Plop. Eris blinked. When she went to cross her arms, she let go of her sword. And when she did, the sword plopped to the ground. But that didn't make sense. And then Eris looked down and realized why that happened. Right. All that Eris was thinking about was wrapping flames around her and putting it into the sword before exploding it when she hit the target. The flames were hot, but since they were her flames, she was fine. No matter how many she managed to make, she wouldn't be burned. But her clothes. Silence. And then Eris screamed and crouched to the ground, covering herself. Pervert. Idiot. Stupid. Why didn't you tell me? Rudy coughed and said, I didn't think you'd actually do something as ridiculous as Sylphie. 
But, um, Master Roxy? Roxy sighed and then walked over to Eris. Taking off her coat, she draped it over Eris and said, That was impressive, Eris. But please think things through when experimenting in the future. Eris felt her face heat up and then gave Roxy a meek nod. Stupid Rudy. Should have told her that something like this could happen. Roxy patted Eris's back and then looked around. Still, you're better than Rudy, at least. When he experimented with a fire spell dash. Master. Rudy blushed and he said, I thought we went over this. What? Roxy tilted her head and said, It's important to face your past mistakes, my dear disciple. I, I know that. But could you not embarrass me in front of Sylphie and Eris? Sylphie lowered her book and giggled. But Rudy! You're cute when you're embarrassed. Rudy paused and then grumbled, Okay. Maybe I should stop teasing Eris so much. Yes. You should. Is what Eris wanted to say. But she was still too embarrassed about messing up and burning her clothes. At least she had some spares. Miss Rostelina liked making outfits, so Eris could change when they went back inside. For now, though, Eris carefully adjusted Miss Roxy's coat to cover her. Thankfully, Miss Roxy was taller than her. That meant the coat covered everything when Eris buttoned it up. Ah! But there wasn't a place to put her sword, and the sleeves were too long for Eris to hold it. Just as Eris was trying to figure out what to do, a voice called out in the distance. One that Eris wasn't expecting to hear. Yo! Kiddo! We're back! Paul! Eris froze, slowly turning around. There was no way, right? It was only like a week. So there was no way that guy left and came back so soon. But nope. Paul was right there, waiting from the front of a carriage heading right towards them. But it wasn't just him. There was another carriage. One with a familiar emblem. And also another familiar driver. Her dad. Her dad who was letting off a pleasant smile. Until he saw the scorched trail leading right to Eris. And how she was awkwardly holding her sword. Her dad, who carefully looked at Eris's current outfit before his eyes lit up in realization. And then he laughed. But that wasn't all. Peeking out from the carriage behind her dad was Eris's mom. And after that, there was Geislain. Geislain, who also noticed the mess and Eris's current outfit. Eris's mind went blank. She felt her face heat up, almost as hot as the flame she was using earlier. And then, on reflex, she ducked behind Rudy to use him as a shield. Wadash. Eri? Rudy turned around to look at Eris, confused. S. Shut up. Eris buried herself behind his back and said, T. This is your fault for tricking me. Figure it out. W. What do you mean it's my dash? Arg. Forget it. Sure. He shook his head and looked back towards the new arrivals. Now, there's Dad. Mama Lily. Geislain is there too, and both Philip and Eris's mom. Makes sense. But who the heck is that girl? And why is Orsted back here? Eris blinked and peeked out from behind Rudy. There was a sharp glare directed at Eris from the side, but she decided to ignore it. Sylphie would probably get mad at her and pull a trick again, but Eris could deal with that later. Rudy seemed serious for some reason, so Eris decided to take a look. She didn't know who that Orsted guy that Rudy mentioned was, but there was a strong-looking guy walking beside the wagon. A bit scary too, with sharp gold eyes and white hair. But that wasn't the person who caught Eris's eyes. Instead, it was the regal blonde girl sitting happily on Miss Lilia's lap. Eris hadn't met her personally, but she definitely knew the girl's face. After all, before her tutors gave up on her, they kept drilling the important people that she should know as a proper lady of the Boreas family. And the girl sitting there. Eris tapped Rudy on the back. Rudy blinked and looked at her. Yeah, Eri? Since when do you know the second princess? I thought that you and your dad were disowned from the Nodos or whatever. 
Wait, what? Rudy turned back to look at the girl and said, That's the second princess? You mean Ariel? Yes. Rudy paused, staring at the girl. She stared back at him, giving a small wave. Rudy groaned and covered his face. God damn it. I knew things were going too easily recently. Chapter 100 When You Wish Upon a Shooting Star I am very delighted to meet you, Rudy. Princess Ariel sipped on her cup of tea and smiled. Nanny spoke a great deal about you. As did Lord Paul. I smiled back and said, It's a pleasure to meet you as well, Princess. Though unexpected. I glanced at my dad standing off to the side. We were back at our house. Well, the second house. Needed to get a better naming scheme for that at some point. Anyway, we were at the house that we built from scratch, seated around the dining room and waiting for dinner to be ready. By we, that meant me, Dad, and two guests. Dad was leaning on the wall off to my right, keeping an eye on things and looking visibly uncomfortable. Didn't blame him actually, that was a lie. I did blame him. It seemed like things sorted themselves out over in Millbots, but some unexpected things happened in the aftermath. Unexpected things which involved unexpected people. And our guests were among those unexpected people. First was Princess Ariel. Apparently, Mama Lily was her maid up until shortly before she came to join our family. Because of that, and because she missed Mama Lily, the princess decided to take a trip all the way down to Bina Village. Completely made no sense, especially considering the fact that she was a strong contender for the throne. Even if Dad, Philip, and Soros pulled off some impressive feats to rescue that noble girl or whatever, it shouldn't be enough to entrust them with such a VIP. But when I took into account the second guest, it made sense. I shifted my gaze over to the aloof and intimidating man standing beside Princess Ariel and nodded. I didn't expect to see you again too, Mr. Orsted. Dragging God Orsted. The one that older Rudy has said was the key to reaching being W, someone who apparently had the power to either know the future or turn back time with how much he knew. The strongest person in the world, someone who was absolutely hostile to being W. Or rather, Hidegami, and someone who tried to kill old Aridius. Also me, but we managed to hash things out. And last time, he said he wanted to team up with me, but I didn't think he'd randomly show up to help Dad out. Orsted cracked a smile and said, yes. But an opportunity presented itself and so I decided to take advantage of it. An opportunity, huh? Yeah. Considering that the weird mana being W had stuck to Orsted was gone somehow and that Orsted's mana seemed to be flowing again, it looked like he decided to take a more active role in things instead of working in the background like old Aridius said he probably did. Which reminded me of just how much BS that guy's memory was. Like, come on man. You figured out time travel, so you should have realized that it would cause all sorts of wacky things to happen. At least think through some possibilities to warn me. Though I guess he couldn't really account for the ripple effect slash joker that was me of all people. Princess Ariel looked at Orsted and smiled. Mr. Orsted kindly offered to escort me to visit Nanny's home and to return me to the capital afterwards. She looked at me and said, I hope you do not mind us intruding. Just what the heck went on over there? Ariel was deferring to me when Dad was standing right there. And Orsted looked like he had tossed his chips in with her. So did that mean he was planning to take over the Azura Kingdom or something? Arg, my head hurt. We can think about that later. For now. I smiled at Ariel and said, of course not. But I'm not sure there's much for a princess to be entertained with all the way out here. Ariel shook her head and said, no worries. I simply wish to observe Nanny's family life and get to know you better. I paused and quickly glanced at my dad. He didn't set me up again, did he? Dad noticed my look and quickly shook his head. Ah. Seemed like he was using his head more if he picked up on that. But then what was Ariel talking about? An awkward silence. Dad was keeping his mouth shut because it seemed like he learned his lesson about running it. Orsted was comfortable with silence, content to just stand there menacingly. 
and Ariel was unashamedly staring at me, as if trying to pick my brains from just looking. Well, whatever plans I had about future events were definitely thrown off at this point. Pretty sure that I was going to be high on the list of priorities for the bigwig nobles in the future now. Especially with Ariel calling Dad Lord Paul. At that time, Sylphie walked over from the kitchen, carrying a stack of cups and a crystal water pitcher. Dinner's ready, Rudy! She set the pitcher and the cups on the table while giving a pointed stare at Ariel. After that, she took a seat on my lap. Ariel's polite smile widened at that, though her eyes seemed a bit thoughtful. Where was Eris when I needed her? At least she'd be able to break up this weird atmosphere instead of turning it cold like Sylphie was doing. Live. While Rudy was dealing with an unexpectedly tense development, Eris was handling her own problems. Namely, giving a status report to her parents on her current relationship with her fiancé. Eris's bedroom, upstairs in the second house from where the others were having dinner. Because an important discussion was occurring down there, and because her parents wanted a private one of their own, the Boreas family was currently seated around a small table having an intimate dinner. It wasn't anything too special. Just some roasted boar with potatoes and bread, paired with fruit juice. Something that Eris had gotten used to eating from her time at Bina Village. And also something that she was studying very intently to avoid looking at her parents. I must say. Eris's mom, Hilda, cut a piece of the boar and raised it, eyeing the glaze on the meat. For being out in the middle of nowhere and without many ingredients, Lilia and her friends do a fairly good job at cooking. Philip speared a potato with his fork and took a bite. After that, he nodded and said, Indeed. Though with how hopeless my cousin is at cooking, I would hope that his wives are adequate. Hilda looked at Philip and said, Did Lilia not mention that Zenith was a good cook as well? A pity. I was hoping to be able to try some of her cooking as well. Though I suppose the fact that she is moving around while with child is impressive enough. Philip looked at Hilda and raised an eyebrow. Were you not still dashing around the manor scolding the various servants when merely weeks away from Eris's birth? Hilda rolled her eyes. That is because no one else would set them in order. Both father-in-law and yourself spoil the staff too much. I would disagree with myself, but I do agree that father takes it easy on them. Eris quietly ate her food while sneaking glances at her parents. It was weird. When she left, her father and her mother were practically at each other's throats. At the least, they weren't on speaking terms anymore. But now they were playfully chatting with each other and even teasing. Was it because of her? Was the only reason that they were upset because Eris was acting up? And since they managed to get rid of her, they could be happy together again? Eris pursed her lips, trying to ignore her churning stomach. Hmm. Hilda looked over at Eris and said, Is something the matter, Eris? You do not appear very well. It's nothing. Eris mumbled and then cut a piece of the meat before eating it. At least she had good food. And who cared if her parents didn't want her? She already knew that in the first place. Mom never cared about what she wanted and always tried to make her into a proper lady. Dad was always busy with his work and only threw gifts at her instead of spending time. Besides, she had a home here now. Rudy didn't care for Eris at first, but since he stopped worrying about whatever he was worrying, he was being nice now. Annoying, but nice. Then she had Sylphie for a friend too. She was a bit scary, especially when it came to Rudy, but the younger elf girl took the time to play with Eris. And then both Norn and Aisha looked up to Eris and treated her as their big sister. Miss Zenith was nice too, and Miss Roxy took the time to answer her questions. Not to mention Miss Rose and Miss Rostalina. And Sylphie's dad too. Though that man always seemed to be busy patrolling the village. In any case, it was fine. Even if her parents didn't want her, she had a place here in Bina Village. Philip frowned and then said, have they not been treating you well? Eris resisted the urge to scoff. Instead, she sipped her juice and shook her head. They've been treating me really well. Better than either you or Mom ever did. Eris didn't say that, though. Instead, 
she said, I've been having a lot of fun, and Rudy's family all treat me like I'm part of the family. Well, Philip nodded and said, considering that you're betrothed to him, that's inevitable. Hilda glared at Philip. Philip raised an eyebrow. It's true, is it not? Hilda shook her head and then looked at Eris. Tell me something, Eris. Are you happy here? Truly? Eris paused to think about it. Happy. She didn't know. But she did know that she always had fun and felt warm spending time with everyone in Bina Village. Seeing the bright smiles of the villagers that she and Sylphie helped, playing with Norn and Aisha, listening to Miss Zenith talk about her adventuring days. Not to mention everyone else, too. It was different. She didn't have as many fancy things like in the Citadel of Roa. There were pretty dresses or shiny toys. And most days she collapsed in bed either frustrated from losing to Rudy in games or just exhausted. But even so, she didn't feel empty. She didn't feel like people were judging her or only listening to her because she was Lord Sorrows's granddaughter. So, yes. If that was being happy, then Eris was happy. She'd be happier still if Rudy would take her seriously and actually teach her things, but she could settle for spending time with him and memorizing the random treasures of information he let slip. Hilda stared at Eris. Eris stared back at her mother. And then Hilda sighed. Well, if my daughter is truly happy and not merely being sent away. Philip cut a piece of meat from his boar and took a bite. After that, he looked at Hilda and said, As I said, this is better for her. See how calm our heiress has become. Eris blinked and then frowned. Hey! What are you talking about, Dad? Philip paused and then raised an eyebrow. Dad? Eris froze. Hilda laughed and then let out a mischievous smile. Well, well. It seems that you're right, husband. She looked at Eris and said, Our Eris has calmed down a great deal to be calling you so casually again. Ugh. Eris felt her face heat up and started stuffing her face with food. Forget about it. Stupid parents. Stupid Rudy running away and leaving her to deal with this mess. Stupid Paul for bringing her parents back to visit. Why couldn't they just keep having fun and practicing magic and stuff in peace? Stupid adults coming in and ruining everything. Live. I narrowed my eyes and kicked off the ground, slashing my sword at sonic speed. A boom echoed as my sword ripped the air apart and shot towards my opponent's neck. But before it hit. Getting faster, Rudy, but still not good enough. Dad laughed and moved just out of range. The falling explosion ruffled his hair, but he wasn't phased. Instead, he charged forward to tackle me with his shoulder. I growled and spun around on my right heel, whipping my leg at him. It connected, sending my dad veering off to the side. But it wasn't a solid blow. Instead of him being shoved away, he took the force of the blow and used it to spin around faster, stealing the momentum for his own attack. I felt my eye twitch when I saw that. This guy. Since when did he start fighting like a video game character? All I did was pass him some pointers. I swear to God, there must be something in the air turning people around me into monsters. Was it my mana? Was I really emitting mana radiation or something that was causing everybody to rank up? Or was this a counterbalance because something big was coming around the corner? God, I hoped it was the first option, because the second. You're distracted. Gah! Damn it, Dad. I raised my sword to parry and was sent flying back from the force of the blow. A flash of light. My dad stepping in for a follow-up. I kicked off the ground and forced a gap, taking the time to survey my surroundings. It was late at night, under the light of the full moon. After that mess from earlier was finished, I dragged dad outside and demanded a training session to let off steam. Really, I just wanted to smack him around a bit and test out some recent hypothesis on Battle Aura. But I didn't expect him to have leveled up so much from that trip. What was this, seriously? A video game? 
Dad leaves for a trip and suddenly he has all these new tricks up his sleeves and his stats suddenly seem 10 times higher than normal with how fast he's moving. What next? Will it be the end of disc 1 or something where we all get separated so that I'll have to hard carry some weak party members on my own while Dad has his own arc? H.M. Dad looked at me for a bit and then smiled. I was worried there for a bit, but it looks like you loosened up a bit since I left. Did spending time with three cute girls finally work their magic on you? Very funny, Dad. And for your information, I just decided that it was better to not worry about what I couldn't control. Especially since a crazy guy like old Arudius who brute-forced reverse-engineered time travel magic while figuring out the axiom that magic was omnipotent still wasn't able to change his past. Trying to play chess master in a chaotic situation like this definitely didn't seem to be the play. Nope. I was just going to roll with the punches from here on out. Especially since random things like Orsted showing up with Princess Ariel kept happening. Princess Ariel, the supposed linchpin in everything that was going to take place in the future according to old Aridius, and also the one who was supposed to be protected by Sylphie. Maybe this was a hard course correct by the world or something? With how things were going, Sylphie wouldn't have any reason to want to head to Azura Kingdom or help out any nobles. Ah, getting sidetracked again. I focused my attention back on Dad and said, What happened over there anyway? I thought you just went to go rescue a noble's daughter or something to teach me a lesson. Dad coughed and said, W. Will. The best laid plans never survive contact with the enemy? Uh. -huh. I gave him a blank look and said, Third time's the charm then? Dad let out a nervous laugh and said, Yeah, yeah. Your old man's learned his lesson about meddling in things. And talking. Mostly talking. He frowned and said, The world seems to have a grudge against me or something. That's karma for your misspent youth. Dad gave a serious nod. Probably. I sighed and made a pair of chairs. Here. Let's just chat. Dad looked at me and smirked. What? Give up on fighting your old man already? Hell yeah. I glared at him and said, What kind of crazy monster are you anyway? No, correction. What kind of crazy things did you fight over there to get so much stronger so quickly? Dad pulled one of the chairs and sat down. After that, he waved his hand and said, Oh, a few thugs, this crazy guy who was way too interested in his own sword, a crazy lady who kept saying stuff about Flo, and then a bunch of cheating assassins. He paused and said, mostly cheating assassins. What are you, some shounen protagonist? Hmm? I sighed. Nothing, Dad. Water? As long as you don't spray it in my face. I conjured a pair of cups and filled them with water. After that, I handed one to my dad. He took it and nodded. Thanks, Rudy. And in. Dad laughed and took a sip. After that, we sat in silence for a while. And then Dad spoke up. Hey, Rudy. Yeah? Dad took a sip from his glass of water and then said, Trying to be a hero sucks. I'm well aware. I sipped my own water and said, People always want something from you. Dad laughed and said, Isn't that right? Going on that trip and dealing with all the nobles made me remember why I wanted to retire to a peaceful place like this with Zenny. He took a long drink from his water and then said, I just wanted my kids to grow up having fun without worrying about anything in the world. And then you had me. And then we had you. Dad nodded and looked at me, a weird expression on his face. A mix of concern and pride. My genius son, who knows too much for his own good, who's about twice as mature as me dash. Only twice? Dad laughed. Maybe three times. Though you suck at talking with the ladies, so I'm knocking it down by one. Fair. Anyway. He looked up at the moon and said, I really do wonder if the world's out against us. There's that being W guy, sure. But even before then. He sipped on his glass and said, Maybe I should have apologized to the old man. Hmm? I frowned and said, Who? Sorrows? PFT. That guy? No. I'm talking about my dad. 
Your gramps. I frowned. My gramps. So dad's dad. Right. Dad did mention that he ran away from home. And since the situation was the way it was in the Noto's family. H.M. Yeah, grandpa would have had a lot of stress. Probably regret too. And from dad's expression, it seemed like they never reconciled. And considering that the only thing a good father wanted for their child was to make sure they were safe and happy. I sighed. Yeah, this is totally your fault, dad. You've got too much bad karma going on in your life. Yeah, well. She's a bitch. And that's how you're going to have reality smacked in your face. Dad laughed. Maybe. But that's what you're for, right? The only thing going for your old man is his sword, but you're smart. I'm sure you'll figure things out. What, so you're bailing out on being the parent now that you think I'm competent enough? You do realize I'm still just eight, right? Don't get me wrong. Dad looked at me and said, I'm still going to do everything I can to clean up any messes my genius son makes. And I'm going to help the best I can if you need me. But, well, he looked up at the sky and said, let's just say dad figured something important out when he came back. Mom yelled at you, didn't she? You got me. I sighed. Well, minus the princess and Orsted hanging around and both of Eris's parents visiting, things will be back to normal now, right? Being W didn't do any crazy things to you guys over there? Other than the monster invasion, nope. Monster invasion? Oh yeah. Dad nodded and said, These weird spatial rifts popped up in the distance when we were chasing after the Tristina girl and the knights went a bit crazy pinning the blame on various parties. Orsted and Pierre managed to sort things out though. He paused and said, The prime minister and a banished prince of some small kingdom made a fuss trying to blame it on us, but it worked out in the end. Dad? Yeah, Rudy? Never mind. I sighed and looked up at the sky. As I did, I saw a shooting star pass by. Nice. In that case. Please let time just pass by normally for a while. I could really use a break. Clasping my hands together and closing my eyes, I made a small wish. That's the end of this tale for now. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in part 5.